It's Friday here at the CrossFit Games. What better way to start your weekend early? Turn off that Zoom call, mute all your notifications, and get ready for some world-class fitness. Welcome back to Day at the Games, presented by U.S. Army. Tommy Marquez alongside Annie Sakamoto. And Annie, two days of competition are already behind us. Big picture, what stands out? Well, true to the CrossFit Games, Tommy, expect the unexpected. None of the names that we are used to seeing in the white jersey are in that white jersey going into day three of competition. There's a lot of unknowns for today, so there's a lot of unknowns. Oh, yeah. Uh, almost like it's part of our ethos a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, taking a look at the overall standings after two days of competition. Remember, these are unofficial as of last night. And through four events, it is Oslo Navy Blue with a 12-point lead over CrossFit Mayhem Freedom. Invictus rounds out the top three in the race for the podium. Mayhem Independence behind them in fourth. And Reykjavik made a big move to close out day number two. But you can't ignore the new name at the top in Oslo Navy Blue. Yeah, CrossFit Oslo Navy Blue picks up their second event win in the run event. They also got fifth place in the strong event. So this means that they move 12 points ahead of CrossFit Mayhem Freedom going into today, into day three, which means they are the ones wearing that white leader jersey this morning, Tommy. Love to see a little bit of parody in the team competition, especially from the crew from Norway that got a medal last year as well. Switching gears now over to the men's competition and your unofficial results after day number two again these are unofficial as of last night and your day one leader is your day two leader in ricky garrard he expands his lead to 62 points over justin medeiros and look who is in third roman krenikov rounds out the top three pat Vellner slips a little bit down to fifth but once again ricky garrard Strong comeback tour so far, holding strong in first. Yeah, Ricky does not have one finish outside of seventh so far, whereas all the other males have at least one finish 15th or lower. And if you look at the tests that we've seen so far, Tommy, across these four slash five events, uh, five scored events, he, it, it's a very well varied test of fitness. So to say that he doesn't deserve to have that jersey on this uh, at this point would be a misstatement. He has simply been phenomenal. It seems like every other athlete at least had a slip up, but Ricky Gerard hasn't. Your unofficial standings as of last night for the women after four events. And again, your day one leader is also your day two leader with Mallory O'Brien leading the way over Emma Lawson, Ariel Lowen, Danielle Brandon holding strong inside the top five overall. But down in third, Tia Claire Toomey made up some significant ground yesterday, thanks in part to that one-two punch of events with the running and the lifting. And Annie, it's good enough for your O2 recovery of the event. Definitely, Tommy. Of 200 possible points yesterday, Toomey, Toomey picked up 197 90, excuse me, seven of them. Well, she still won't be in that white jersey coming into today's event. She moved herself a little bit closer. And when we look at today's first event, it tees up really well for her to make her final move to get back in that white jersey. An impressive showing from Tia for sure. She came out like a woman possessed. But the adaptive divisions kicked off competition yesterday, and we had a pair of perfect performances from two athletes, Casey Acri and Valerie Cohen. I mean, look at that. Just ones all over the place there. <laughs> well, actually, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, Tommy. Casey Akery won the men's upper division extremity uh, last year, and he won eight of nine events where his only other finish was a third. And the same can be said for, uh, for Co Valerie Cohen. She won eight of nine events. Her only finish outside of first was a third place. So no surprise that both of these athletes are dominating their respective divisions. Two returning champs looking like they're in a good position to go back to back moving over to the masters division and the women specifically the 45 to 49 one i know that you're familiar with you're still the reigning champ uh jen dieter had an amazing performance on day one well and i couldn't be happier for jen dieter she's 48 years old so she's kind of at the tail end of that division she is the only female to finish the skills portion of this event and that included it was very similar to the individual skills uh test where there was pegboard there was handstand push-ups there was handstand walking up the ramp there was pistols double unders so congratulations to you jen on being the only lady to finish 
And on the men's side, Shannon Aiken, he took care of business on event number one. Yeah, Shannon Aiken, you know, he actually won twice in the 55 to 59 year old division. That was in 2017 and actually, excuse me, he was second in 2018. So no surprise that in his first year in the 60 to 64 division, he picks up an event win. But what's great, Tommy, he was one of only two men to finish the event one and he won it by over two minutes. Ton of action in store for you guys on day three here at the CrossFit Games. And here's a rundown of everything that you can watch and enjoy. Individuals will start and end the day. All divisions are scheduled to compete today. The action kicks off at 9 a.m. and will run the gamut until 7 p.m. So that's a full day of fitness. Annie, your thoughts on day three of competition? Like you said, everybody is competing today. They're here at the venue, make sure you either call in sick or like you said, silence all notifications because it is all day long fitness. Well, the first event to kick off today is individual event number five. And man, it is a doozy. We're gonna start with 20 pig flips and then a 3.5 mile run to that big, beautiful Capitol building here in Madison. And then we're gonna get outside the box a little bit with some object movement, movements, excuse me, finishing up the Capitol steps and Annie, your thoughts on this event, because I am super stoked to see this one play out. Well, I love it because it's actually very reminiscent of the Friday event in 2013, mm -hmm. the Burden Run. Again, we have pig flips, we have a longer run, we have some odd object stuff. What I love, though, about this one is we finish at the Capitol Building, which is such an iconic part of Madison. So to, uh, the footage, I mean, I have goosebumps right now just thinking about that, that finish. This is bound to be a marquee event for the weekend. But Annie, looking at the entire day in totality and what's in store for these athletes, who are you looking at? Well, there's a few athletes that I'm looking at uh, as far as who to watch coming into this third day. One of them, of course, is your reigning six-time champ, uh, Tia Claire Toomey. Can she get that white leader jersey? And can she take it off the back of, you know, rookie, well, that last year's rookie of the year, Mallory O'Brien. And then, of course, will Ricky Garrard maintain this very consistent performance he's had? Roman Krennikov, first year we've seen him at the games in live competition. He's doing amazing. Danielle Brandon is another one that we haven't spoken about that's really crept her way back up the leaderboard. Can she make a move to be in a podium position coming out of Friday's events? Yeah, Danielle Brandon has been on fire all season long, but one of the athletes on that list is Mal O'Brien. Last season, she broke through as the Rookie of the Year, but she's made some changes coming into this season to set herself on the path to the podium. And as Han Solo once said, you're all clear, kid. Let's blow this thing and go home. Score one for the youngsters. Mal O'Brien will win event four. Mal O'Brien proved she belonged with the best in the world on the opening night of the 2021 Noble CrossFit Games. She would wind up finishing seventh overall and was named Rookie of the Year. That was very special, I think just because I was so young and I had like no expectations to do that. And then just to be able to go in there and like just trust everything I've done and then kind of like be rewarded with it. Like it's your first year. Despite her success in 2021, Mal O'Brien decided she needed a change. Her quest to become a champion led her to one. O'Brien moved from Iowa to Vermont to train under the guidance of the five time fittest man on earth, Matt Fraser. So Matt definitely brings like all his experience and shares it with me, shows me a lot of like what he did, what worked for him and like he's honestly like helping me become like such a smarter athlete. O'Brien is now turning her sights on her second straight trip to the CrossFit Games as an individual. In her first, she became the youngest woman to ever win an event. In her second, she's hoping to become the youngest to ever stand on the podium. I mean, it's important to get on the podium because that's like we go there to win and to do our absolute best. You know, I'm going to do everything I can right now to make it a reality. But like right now, I just want to do my best. The first generation of CrossFit stars all found the sport as adults. The kids they inspired are ready to take it to new heights. With Mal O'Brien leading the way, that is likely to happen sooner rather than later.
Expectations are sky high for the young phenom in Mal O'Brien, but with the white leader's jersey, I think it's safe to say there's a target on her back. Definitely, Tommy. And in my opinion, it's always a little easier to be the hunter than the hunted. So like you said, there is a target on her back, and I want to see how Mallory handles wearing the white jersey two days in a row. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting day three. And our coverage today for Day at the Games is brought to you by the U.S. Army. To learn more about the U.S. Army Warrior Fitness Team, let's send things over to Caleb Banfield. Kayla Banfield here. I'm in the U.S. Army zone and I'm joined by Major Fruth. Major Fruth, the U.S. Army has put together a warrior fitness team. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so the Army Warrior Fitness Team is a team comprised of active duty soldiers that goes around the country through competitions and also virtually through uh, social media, engaging the American public, allowing them to better connect with, with their service members and then dispelling myths and rumors or misconceptions about military service. And how do people get involved? The team is made up of active duty soldiers. How the American public can get involved is follow us on social media or come to events like the CrossFit Games in which we set up physical activations. Uh, we also do high school visits in which we just interact uh, and like I said, answer questions and just kind of show off uh, capabilities and passions and, and goals. You mentioned activations at the CrossFit Games. What kind of things are here for people to do if they're at the Games? So we're currently standing in the Army Physical Fitness Semi. Uh, it's a 53-foot semi that uh, goes around the country uh, doing events like this or even just high school visits uh, across from us right now. We've got a workout going on uh, that's our second one of the week. And then throughout the week also at this activation, we're doing uh, some seminars, some lifting seminars, uh, aerobic capacity and uh, mobility. And then inside Vendor Village, uh, we also have a, a booth in there which we're, we're doing a, a challenge in which you can register to win a, a barbell. Sounds like there's so much to see and do here. Thank you for your time, Major Fruits. If you want to get a workout in, guys, this is the place to be. Thanks, Kayla, and thanks to Major Fruit as well. Our coverage today is brought to you by the U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Discover the career for you and opportunities you never knew existed within the U.S. Army. Visit GoArmy.com forward slash CF. Gee, thanks again to the Army. Before we send things out to competition, quick update on day three as a whole. Individuals will kick things off first. They'll also wrap up the day with teams sliding in between. And of course, the age groups and adaptives will be throwing down all day long. That's going to do it for us here at Day at the Games, presented by the U.S. Army. For Andy Sakamoto, I'm Tommy Marquez. We'll see you guys at the midday for some more updates, but we'll leave you with individual event number five, the Capitol. There is a six word phrase that we say, uh, what is CrossFit? CrossFit is constantly varied functional movements that are executed at high intensity. It's a strength and conditioning program that mixes weightlifting, calisthenics, powerlifting, running, rowing, biking, and a whole bunch of different ways. It's family, it's community, it's a no BS approach to bettering your life, not only inside the walls of the gym, but also outside the walls of the gym. Todos não como pode, é, como devem, né? If I look at each individual person that walks in every single day here, it's like everybody's absolutely different. It could look like my 80-year-old dad. It could look like my kids. I can honestly say hand on heart that it will change their life. Not because it's just a fitness program, not because of the community, but because the greatest adaptation that occurs in CrossFit happens right here. does it take? How do I train? What do I eat? How do I recover? How much do I sleep? How do I react? What if this happens? What if that happens? Am I prepared? It all adds up. It's not about what I do. It's about what I don't do. No excuses. No shortcuts. No gimmicks. No tomorrows. Where I am, 
is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Here is where the epiphany came to me. I'm part of the most prestigious, most decorated SEAL team in the history of modern warfare. We never ever skimp on body armor. We never skimped on weapon systems, the demolitions. We never skimped on any of that. We're gonna work hard, but we need to recover. We need to repair better. We need to train better. We need to train smarter. Thorn has really become my one-stop shop look at a population of, of our military or our athletes, we have a multitude of different issues from individual to individual. The goal is to educate them. Whatever spectrum of fitness you need, Thorne has the product for you. Give us the best, give us your best. Our goal is to be the best in which we do. In Thorne products, there is no better product, and that is why we use it. My name is Annie Thorstetter two times fittest woman in the world, and this will be my 12th time competing at the CrossFit Games. Life is busy, complex, and amazing, but life is also full of choices and decisions we need to make. RP makes it easy for me to fuel for my performance at the gym and for at-home life with my family. I spend less time worrying about what to eat and when, and more time playing with my little girl. Our lives were slowing down until we made a change. As we've gotten older, it feels like we've lost a little bit of that magic between us. But now, oh, I'm ready to go anytime. That's right, anytime. And of course, we always use protection. Introducing Bikes, the number one expert recommended way to reinvigorate your life. Use Once Daily Bikes by Trek. Ask your local bike shop which bike is right for you. When I did my level one, I actually didn't want to be a coach. I was working as a young lawyer in a law firm, just starting out in my professional career, and I found CrossFit. I fell in love with it at the gym I was going to. There were some really inspiring people there that made me want to do my level one. Once I did it, I guess that just made the passion even more intense, and I was asked to start doing some coaching on the side, which I did, and I really loved that. The experience of interacting with, meeting and positively influencing people from all walks of life has been one of the best things about being a CrossFit coach. In a gym, in an affiliate, you will meet people from all walks of life. And in that, you're also going to inspire people to live healthier lives and ignite that passion for fitness that you have in other people. So that has been one of the, the greatest things about being a CrossFit coach.
The Wisconsin State Capitol, it is the third building to serve as the capital since Wisconsin was granted statehood in 1848, but is the first in the nation to ever serve as a site for a CrossFit Games event. Welcome to day three of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. Nikki Brazier and Mike Arsenault will be with us in just a little bit. And we are also joined by CrossFit's subject matter expert in aerobic capacity and just a generally good human being, Chris Hinshaw, here in the booth. Overall standings for the women after four events. It's Mal O'Brien, who has a 12-point lead over rookie Emma Lawson. But Tia Toomey is lurking. She is only 16 points out of first place. Mal O'Brien has yet to win an event, but she has only had one finish outside the top 10. Three of those being inside the top four, two thirds and a fourth. And what I love to see from Mal O'Brien is that she is taking advantage of the opportunities and the doors being opened for her by Tia Toomey. However, Tia had herself quite a day yesterday and made up a very big point gap coming into this today, so there's not a lot of room for Mal. Overall standings for the men, Ricky Garrard has been your overall leader since the opening event, and he is starting to pull away. Justin Madera sits in second place, followed by Roman Krennikov and Lazar Jukic. Pat Vellner was in third yesterday, but had a bit of a stumble in event number two and is now in fifth, but Ricky Garrard has been consistent throughout so far. Which is really checking a big box for Ricky coming in, is managing the nerves and the pressure that comes with being back at the games for the first time since 2017. But all I see for Ricky is like hella on Asgard. He's just <laughs> getting stronger event to event. The Capitol is event number five presented by Kalo, and it's a throwback to one of the most popular events in CrossFit Games history. Do you think Bird and Run 2013, where they explored the space of the StubHub Center almost 10 years ago, now we're exploring Madison. We have pig flips, a three and a half mile run to the Capitol, as well as the carries with the bags. And you mentioned 2013, and that is when we had the Bird and Run in Carson, California. It started with a 2.1 mile run. We had the first appearance of the first version of the pig there was the log carry and then finally the sled pull Kalina Ladaris was the winner for the women and it was Jason Kalipa who won for the men and if the reason why Kalipa got there is the man to my right in the booth because the work that Hinshaw did with Jason to resurge his CrossFit Games career is how he got here today living on the edge not to get that song stuck in your head but that's the line you're going to have to ride from start to finish it is going to be a long grinded out event and that's when you need to get gritty towards the end the carries both the farmer carries and the bear hug carry up the steps is going to take a lot of grit that is the recipe for success presented by trifecta let's go down to mike arsenault who is in the north park where this event will begin and this will be the first time the competition has taken over a portion of downtown Madison. Before we get there, we had the pig flips, the same implement that was used at the games last year. 510 pounds for the men, 350 pounds for the women. Once they complete the pig flips, they'll do another one-mile loop of the bike course from Wednesday before heading to the Capitol. And the Capitol has loomed large over the competition since this event was first announced because you can actually see the Capitol Dome uh, from the Alliant Energy Center. That is two and a half miles to my north, and that's where we find fellow reporter Nikki Brazier. Nikki, set the stage for us of what these athletes will face after the run. Thanks, Mike. You can already feel the anticipation in the air here at the finish line. Now, the athletes will have to pick up their Husafels at the base of the staircase. They'll have to bear hug, carry it up these 49 steps behind me, counted them myself this morning, and then they'll cross the finish line right here in the heart of the capital of Madison. Now, the spectators are already lining up, so there's proving to be an exciting finish here to kick off Friday morning. Men and women will be competing together here. The bottom 20 women in the overall standings and the bottom 20 men in lanes 1 through 10. Sayer Kaya, keep an eye on her. She did very well in the run portion of event 2 yesterday. Danny Spiegel will be starting in lane 13. She's an athlete who's really going to have to make some money on the heavier implements in this event. And, and the implements will make a big difference. Say you can get a minute to two minutes on the pig flip itself. You can also gain some of that time on the back end as well. On the men's side, in lane number 10 is Travis Mayer. He actually competed in the bird and run in 2013, finished 21st in that event. Brent Fakowski in lane 14. 
really needs to score some points here to get himself inside the top 20. It's really hard to say this on day three of a five-day event or competition, but this is do or die for Brent Fikowski. We start with the pig flip up and back, 10 flips down, 10 flips back. Let's bring in uh, Chris right, Hinshaw right, now. Chris, thanks so much for being here. And we were talking about this earlier as we were just sort of chatting about this event, but this pig flip can either help or hurt you depending on what kind of runner you are. That's absolutely correct. This pig flip is a very heavy implement, and ultimately that fatigue is going to carry you into the run. And so these strength athletes that are really going to dominate on flipping this pig Unfortunately, they're going to be at the disadvantage when it comes to this run. I actually had an opportunity to speak with Jason Kalipa last night. He was in uh, Africa talking about this event and this new format. And he said, this completely changes the game. By putting this pig first, it's completely different than what it was done before. And I asked him, I said, who do you think this event favors? A strength-based athlete? or the endurance runner-based athlete. And he said that it's gonna feature the runner. Mm. The runner really has an opportunity because it's 3.5 miles. And in 2013, it was only 2.1 miles. And he knows the difference between 2.1 and 3.5. <laughs> That's a lot of time. Danny Spiegel for the women has already made the turn on her pig flip. She's in the upper left-hand part of the screen, just left. The view there, Brent Fikowski, who's in the middle of your screen, is also towards the front for the men. The dimensions on the pig in the bottom left-hand part of your screen, 510 pounds for the men and 350 pounds for the women. You know, Brent has success out here with more long endurance events. Obviously, his performance in run, swim, run back in 2017. But for Brent, sitting in this position on the leaderboard at 28, after four events in the last two days is this is a, like we said before, Brent has to start getting top five at minimum finishes if he wants to get himself back into contention. Brent Fikowski is out there in the front along with Tudor Magda is there as well. And there goes I think that's Ellie Turner, who is running out of the stadium. Now Brent Fikowski is behind her. And it looks like Travis Mayer as well. I want you guys to take a look at their, their backs, that low back. That obviously created a lot of low back fatigue. And in the movement of running, that core stability is really important. So in these first initial steps, they've got to settle. They've got to find a way to get that core stability so the upper body actually works with the lower body. And Travis Mayer in front of Brent Fikowski in the run here is they'll do one loop in reverse around the bike course. It's only one, so they don't have to count their laps. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and Too it's Ellie Turner out front. And, and with this reverse the course, they actually are going to have a bit more of an uphill climb at the very beginning part of this. I was talking to Matt Torres, and the plan was to get through the pigs pretty consistently and to take the first 800 easy, really to let their legs kind of get used to the run and flush out the pig flips. But when you have that uphill turn right off the bat, I don't feel like there's just not a whole lot of room to recover going from pig flips to that slight incline on the run. What's nice though about that uphill is it's gonna force them to have a shorter slot, a, a step um, length. And what you'll see is after that heavy lift, there's a lot of tension in the upper body. You'll see the shoulders start rising higher up towards the head. And when they start carrying that way, unfortunately the stride length shrinks. So what they need to do during this opening portion as they're running now, is to relax that upper body so that the stride can open up. When they hit that trail, they better be ready to be ready to run because that place is where the time is going to make the difference between one athlete and another. They've got to go by that point. So as some athletes finishing up their pig flips. As Travis Mayer leads for the men, it's Ellie Turner leading for the women. Brent Fikowski was also one of the first men out onto the run. We saw Guy Mayeros. I believe Carolyn Prebo for the, the women also head out on the course. There's Adrian Bosman, competition director, who will be leading the athletes on a bike. It's Brent Fikowski just coming into the view. 
three-mile run from the North Park to the Capitol. It looks hot out there, but uh, just a few minutes ago it was 68 degrees, and in, in the running community, the ideal running temperature is really close to 60. So we're not looking at really heavy temperatures at this moment. This event, no joke, way to kick things off here on a Friday. So early on here, past the five and a half minute mark of event number five, the Capitol. We are through the pig flip. We are in the opening stages of the three and a half mile run to the state Capitol. And that's where things are going to get interesting with the Jerry bag carry and the Husafel bag carry to close things out. There's Travis Mayer, 21st overall after four events. Mentioned earlier, he did the burden run in 2013. And finish 21st. Yes, yeah, 20, 21 is the magic number for Travis at the moment, but you know he's definitely want to get above that. And, you know, Travis is one of those athletes. He's just so underrated with his consistency over the years. A lot like Terry Helgadotter, right? You don't realize how many times they have been to the CrossFit Games. Making his eighth appearance as Travis Mayer, and he's finished 12th three times, including last year. Has yet to win an event in his career. Best finish was second place in the Assault Banger back in 2017. I was speaking <clears throat> to a lot. I'm sorry. I was speaking to a lot of athletes today and yesterday about this event and what they're excited about is the fans. That fan experience is going to be big for them. That's going to take away some of the pain, some of the anguish that they experience. And one thing I, I saw this morning is a lot of fans, either at the hotel we were staying at, is they were all talking about going to the Capitol, trying to get there early. So the fans that we have out here is one thing, which is exciting through the RV park and the dog park. But what I'm anticipating awaiting them once they get to the Capitol, that, you know, that 400 meters straight away to the the finish line, I think, Chris, as you said, is there should be just a resurgence of energy when they get to the crowd. Ellie Turner is your leader for the women. Behind her, Alex Vigno and Guillaume Briand uh, have now passed Brent Fakowski. So I want you to look at Ellie Turner. I mean, she's really looking solid here. She's very relaxed. A lot of people ask me, like, what do you mean by settling? Settling, what are you talking about? And what you're really trying to do is settle the rhythm that you run at. What is your natural rhythm? And part of that rhythm is the cadence of your breath. You've got to develop a reliable, predictable, consistent breathing rhythm. And that's what you're trying to do. That's the whole objective. Once you get control of the breath, meaning it's stable, the rest of the body can lock it in. Top three for the men, Travis Mayer, Alex Vigneault, and Guillaume Briand. And for the women, it's Ellie Turner all by herself right now. So look at that nice little V in his shoulders. It drops down, right? His shoulders are relaxed. Like he's now, his upper body, and look at that, shaking it out. Like he's very aware of keeping that tension out of his upper body because as soon as you see tension in that upper body, that is a sign that athlete is suffering. And suffering, their stride length is not going to become natural. It's going to be something that they've never run at before, and their performance will continue to decline. So you've got to keep that upper body relaxed. So that nice V dropping from the neck is what we're looking for. She's going to make her way out onto the run. In the meantime, I'm going to pass it on to our award-winning broadcast team. Well, they will take this Travis Mayer is almost done with that loop around the bike course. Now he's going to make the turn to head towards the Capitol. There's a guy that's in control. He just passed. Mm -hmm. And Chase, you mentioned this a couple of times the other day. You always want to be strategic in your look back. You always want to do it on the turn because the person behind you sees you look back. And if you do it on a straight, that means you're failing, you're weak. You want to do it strategically on a turn. He's so confident, he's not even looking. Mm. 
that one, I see just a little bit of a change in just where his foot striking is from the first 800 coming off the pig flip, where I feel like he was a bit more heavy footed in the heel going up the hill, but I feel like he's, it looks like he's shifted his weight more towards that midfoot position. And, and I just see that as like someone's legs that got to recover a little bit. Now he's in a more comfortable position to open up his stride. That's a great observation. I agree with you. So that that pick flip, let's face it, it's posterior chain. You're going to create a lot of damage in your hamstrings. They're going to be fatigued. Well, when you land on that heel, the first muscle group that's going to be activated is your hamstring. Likewise, if you switch to the landing on the ball of the foot, then you're going to do more quad activation. So in this event, you've got to be aware. You've got to be aware of how you're manipulating your foot strike because of what's coming. You saw the lead that Travis Mayer has started to build here as he heads out towards the capital. A lifestyle that pushes you forward requires a ring that won't hold you back. Shop Kalo, the official ring of the 2022 nice. Noble CrossFit Games. Now this back stretch for Travis is, this is when we start getting to actual familiar territory for athletes that have been competing here in Madison over the last couple of years. This is the same path they've taken to the boat dock, which is at the lake. We've seen that for run, swim, run. We've seen the same path for Madison Triplus. So if, you know, they, they got to run the bike course, so there's some familiarity there. This trail, they've run multiple times in the past. So if you have experience here at the CrossFit Games here in Madison, Knowing where you're going is a huge advantage as far as a, a distance of three and a half miles for the athletes that really don't know the course. A little bit of a rough start for Travis Mayer through the first four events. Has yet to crack the top ten. Hoping to do that here in event number five. So I'm looking at how many steps is he taking per minute. Right now he's somewhere around 160 steps for Travis. He's a good runner. He typically will average somewhere around 170 to 180 steps in a minute. So he's still carrying some fatigue. The question is, what's gonna happen as he progresses towards the capital? Does he settle into his natural running cadence? Or maybe the damage from all the events that he's done in the past two days is actually what he's feeling now. Anything about what they went through is 10 miles of hard biking for, for five mile clips at a time. Yesterday's event that was really supposed to be on day one with the four, six and 800 meter shuttle runs, a lot of different really fatigue elements on a lot of these athletes' legs. That is a scary sight that you can <laughs> actually see the capital. And I don't know about anybody, but when you look at out in the distance, what a mile is, let alone three and a half. <laughs> it's a monumental distance. It's like, I'm never going to get there, ever. And the key is, is to don't stop, mm. move. Travis Mayer, your leader for the men. Behind him, the last time we checked in, were Guillaume Briand and Alex Vigneault, and Ellie Turner was in the lead for the women. See Travis shaking his arms out intermittently, and a lot of that fatigue is really coming from the pig. All right, we said it's a big posterior move, but really there's a, there's a lot of upper body taxing coming to that. And when you're running in that position, right, shoulders relax is one thing, but in that elbow bent position, it does add up a little bit. And so that, that shakeout just kind of helps get some of that muscle fatigue, some of that lactic acid out of the biceps, which we will need at the back half of this event with the, the jug carries and that Husafel back, Gary. Now, this is an open course. You just saw a biker pass Travis Mayer. Yeah. So you're going to have to deal with people who are out for a Friday morning stroll or jog or bike right now. And that's the benefit of being out in front by yourself is that you really have the road to yourself and not just, you know, the front and back, but that lateral way. When you start getting piled up towards the back end, it makes passing difficult and having to navigate just the, you know, it's a, like you said, it's an open trail. There's, there'll be people out here. The best part about CrossFit is that you have to worry about who's in front of you as well as who's behind you. And what he's doing is he's separating himself so far that, look, you can't even tell who's behind him. Meaning the person who is in second place right now is not even thinking about him because he's not in sight. It's not a person who I can go after and chase, which means that's going to give him a huge opportunity 
to even create a greater gap. That's an advantage. And there is no one in sight of Travis Mayer right now. Again, it was Ellie Turner who was in the lead for the women, and then behind Travis Mayer, way back there someplace, Alex Vigno and Guillaume Briant were pretty close for second place. And Chris, you're talking about advantages of just line of sight for the second athlete. In the beginning, like in the beginning portion of it, there's so many tight turns where you just can't see anything, but the, you got to hope there's a long stretch here. One thing for athletes, I think, you know, you see this a lot with triathletes before an event, like they'll go drive the bike course. So they have some like landmarks to designate distances. And this course has been available at least on a map, so to speak, of where things could could possibly be mapped out. And that's one of those things as maybe uh, an athlete or maybe a coach is like, okay, where can we, you know, can we walk this course the day before we get here? Can we see and, and plant little distant landmarks on the course to kind of help guide the intensity throughout the race. Yeah, it's like in the sport of triathlons, like Ironman in Hawaii, on the run, the aid stations are a mile apart. And so what you always think about is just get to the next one. And then once you get there, it's just get to the next one. And pretty soon after 26 of them, you're done. <laughs> the hard part here is, is that you're going to come around this corner and you're going to see that capital. And this is where a great runner is going to have an advantage because they're sitting there and going, wow, this is actually a really long run. But imagine when you see the capital for the first time, when you see that line of sight, which he's about to see, it's going to be an insurmountable amount of volume. And then panic sets in, negative thoughts set in. And once a negative thought sets in, it doesn't go away. It just turns into something worse. I, I got to hand it to Boz and this event. This event is a really creative event. I loved the Burden Run in 2013. Loved it. This, completely different, completely new and improved. What's the biggest difference between the two events, in your opinion, Chris? I actually love the order. This format, it's really incredible because if the run is first, the runners really have an advantage because they're sitting there and going, I'm going to dominate this thing and I'm going to be in front. And there's something special about being in front, aware that the entire field is behind you. It's essentially, I'm in control. I'm the boss. I'm the leader. And that gives you power. And that's what every athlete out here is trying to do. I mean, we see that with Tia. One of the great things about Tia is, is that she has presence. When she walks into a room, you look at her and you go, there's God. <laughs> Adrian Boston doing a really nice job ahead of Travis Mayer to try to clear the way for him and keep that course as interference free as possible. And this is really just an experience that you can only get at the CrossFit Games with an event like this. Starting in the North Park Stadium, using implements like the Pig. And this run course is, aside from the distance, it's a beautiful course. I mean, Madison itself is such a pretty city. It's been an amazing host city for the CrossFit Games, but you know, you have the grass fields coming out of the dog park, and then you hit the lake right before you get to that downtown portion. Travis Mayer on the right side is in the lead. Guillaume Briant and Baden Brown are now second and third behind Mayer. Mayer getting a little cheer from the uh, crowd out on the course. I'd probably say it's like, hey, can I can I hitch a ride? <laughs> Room for one more? I, I love that this is on the open road. That involving the fans, the community of Madison, so that they can see what this is all about. So this is a really good opportunity to say on your left. I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there. Dallin Pepper and Tudor Magda are there. You can see Ellie Turner is in the background, so she is still in, all by herself in the lead for the women. I, I got to say, Ellie Alexander Turner. Alexander Corona is there as well. Mm. Ellie Turner looks really good. Really good. I mean, that is a weightlifting athlete. And look how comfortable she is. I mean, we're deep into this run right now. I mean, if there was a weakness, it would be surfacing. Mm. Tim Paulson behind Ellie Turner right now, and there's Brent Fikowski behind Paulson. 
And Chris, we were talking earlier, the original burden run of 2.1, the 3.5 is like, you might be able to look good for two to two and a half miles, but you wouldn't need to tack on that extra one. That's when the distances really become significant when you add that extra mile, mile and a half. That's correct. I mean, let's face it, in 2014, when they did a three mile run, right, triple three, it was a 3,000 meter row, 300 double unders into a three mile run. I made a comment back then that any CrossFit athlete could fake a mile. Any CrossFit athlete can, but you know what? You throw in three, you're gonna see the people who put in the work. 3.5 after the pig flip. That's a lot of running. Sayer Kaya is in the box on the left side of your screen. She sits in second behind Ellie Turner and is Carolyn Prevo in third. Guy Mayeros is between the two of them. Look at the heaviness when they land. It's almost like they're running and they're mm. running in sand. They're running in mud, something heavy. That's a sign that an athlete right now feels flat. They don't have that spring, that jump, that hop. And that means that that athlete, actually their whole entire posterior chain is collapsing on them, that they can't even support the body weight. And at this point where they are, I mean, we're not even remotely close to halfway on this run. There's some challenges there. And you think about that, it's almost the complete opposite of what you think you should be doing when you're under fatigue. It feels like, okay, I'll, I'll slow my cadence down, I'll, I'll slow that pace up. But that's more, like you said, that is more power or, or load in each stride you take when it's slower and longer. And really the opposite of what you want to do is shorten it up. Yep. have less time under tension with every strike of your sh your foot. That's right. And there's always a tendency when you're fatigued. And, and unfortunately, kids learn this as they get older. Like child kids, real young kids, beautiful running form. But somewhere along the way as they age, they think that speed is associated with length. And it's not. So one of the things you could look at when I talk about like the heaviness especially some of the women where you can see the waistband. Is that waistband when their foot is directly under their body, where they're bearing all the weight, is that waistband dropping on one side, and then when they switch legs, is it dropping on the other side? That's a sign that that athlete is collapsing under their body weight, that their glutes can't support them. And that is the first sign that fatigue is beginning to build in that individual. Paige Powers on the left for the women. We haven't seen Alex Vigneault, who is up there with Guillaume Briand in the fight for second. So we're going to assume that Vigneault is still up there, uh, along with Briand fighting for second place right now, behind Travis Mayer, who's on the right side of your screen, who has led since the very beginning of this event, past the 23-minute mark, and Travis Mayer is getting closer now to the capital. Yeah, he is. So Alex Vigneault, so for the people that want to know, like how fast are they? Alex Vigneault, he could run a 5'10 mile. He's a legit runner. The, the level of which these athletes have come in the last decade, as far as the size and the speed at which they can do for mile times is unbelievable. It really is. I think that that's where I, I applaud what Glassman created. He created a sport for that recreational athlete, that athlete that sits in the middle. They weren't genetically had this predisposition for amazing endurance or amazing speed, strength, and power. They sat in the middle. And then these anomaly athletes come along like a Rich Froning. A Rich Froning could put 400 pounds over his head. But for the people that are in the running community, just so you know, Rich Froning, he's 198 pounds. And in the movement of running, his VO2 max, which is aerobic capacity, is 72 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute. And I want you to recognize that there are elite marathon runners that can run 206 that don't have that kind of aerobic capacity. And that's what this sport's about. I honestly think that the next movement that they are about to do is the core of this workout. You get through that piece, you're gonna start thinking, 
I got this. Mm. And that's when confidence is going to build. In every workout, there is what you call a sticking point, that uh-oh moment where that workout gets real. And if you're ignoring this, this jerry can carry, you're making a huge mistake because right now you are creating a substantial amount of damage on the legs and now you're going to carry a very hem heavy implement and I'm not talking about just a small distance across a football field. It's 200 meters. Mm -hmm. That is a legit distance. And so in my opinion, in this workout, you get through this run, you better be thinking about what's coming because that sits at the core, the number one sticking point. And Travis Mayer on the final stretch to the Capitol, his mile one split was six minutes, 10 seconds. Alex Vino, who is in second, is at 622. On the women's side, after one mile, Ellie Turner had a one minute, 20 lead. 22nd lead over Carolyn Brevo. The other thing too, Chris, you were talking about earlier is an athlete that's comfortable and confident in how their shoulders are being carried. Are they relaxed? Are their arms relaxed? And if they're not, this is going to be a big problem for them if they've been under tension for three and a half miles. Absolutely. I mean, that's what's going to happen here. Right now, this position is going to make it more difficult to breathe. Matter of fact, the next movement is even going to be worse. Anybody that wants to try this at home, just go down into a squat, right? All the way down, balancing on your feet, curl your shoulders and curl your back forward. And now try and take a deep breath in. You can't. <laughs> so imagine being exhausted, being hypoxic, and you're trying just to fill your lungs. Unfortunately, the implements prevent that from happening. Travis Mayer is the first man to the jerry bag carry, 100 pounds in each hand, 200 meters on the carry. He'll put those down. There's a quick transition over to the Husafel bag, and then he will carry that 200 meters, and it ends with that ascent up the Capitol steps where we saw Nikki earlier. Uh, I think those steps are going to be so under, basically appreciated of how difficult it's going to be. We actually saw Travis take two steps with the bag. It's the same total weight of a 200 pounds. It's 100 in each hand, but he could barely make it up the two steps. And the one thing these athletes are going to need to be, need to be careful of is with this position of the jug carry is that it's pulling on the traps in the top of the shoulders, but also completely decimating their grip, which are the two key things you need to stabilize that bear hug carry of the Husafel bag. Travis Mayer got his run done unofficially in 23 minutes and 26 seconds. I mean, that's incredible. Here come Baden Brown and Alex Vigno. They'll be the next two men to grab the jerry cans. It's Brown just ahead of Vigno now. This is the, about the third break for Mayer. About a minute and 50 second lead on these two athletes, but his first walk was a very, very far distance. I talked to some coaches earlier about what the plan is, and there was a mixed bag of, of plans. It's a short breaks, quick steps, or, I mean, if you have the capacity, carry it as much as you can, as far as you can. But again, this, this is going to have a compounding effect on the final piece of this event. Travis Mayer had about a two minute lead on Vino and Brown. Wow. Man, he looks wow. good. Look at Vigno. Look at Vigno. That is impressive. Travis Mayer asking for some help from the crowd. And there's a good crowd out there at the Capitol building. So that's a slight downhill where he's running, Travis Mayer. And so that's why he's got some good speed there. He's shaking out his arms. He knows what's about to come. And Chase, I agree with you. That grip is now smoked. I mean, Rock climbers, mountain climbers, when they create that pump in the arms, unfortunately, that pump prevents good blood circulation, which makes that fatigue even worse. Travis Mayer moving to the Husafel bag, and then it's 200 meters to carry that bag that weighs 200 pounds. I mean, Remember, he's got to go up those steps, too. I mean, he's respecting that bag. He knows. So... He can carry it any way he wants until he gets to the stairs. And this is, every athlete watching, you're gonna need to do something like this to save your arms because it's, it's easier. This is a moment where he can catch his breath a little bit. You can't really outrace someone on the straightaway. But when you get to the steps, 
all bets are off. And everyone we talked to about demoing it said the steps were something they were not prepared for when they had got there. Took Travis Mayer just under three minutes to get that carry done and then another 40 seconds to run from the jerry can to the Hoosville bag. Ellie Turner, meanwhile, is on to the jerry can carry. Look at her cadence compared to the boys that came through. That cadence, that Ellie Turner knows what she's doing. Look at that. Short steps, high step frequency. Ellie Turner coming in Look in 24th place overall. Her best finish was in the overhead portion of event number two. She took 16th overall in that. So I'm not sure if many know about Ellie Turner, but she has been training with Justin Madero since she's qualified for the CrossFit Games every day. So she's got some knowledge in her head. Now, Mayor in that position, that's not a resting position for the upper body. You may be able to breathe freely with it on your back instead of maybe on your shoulder, but the fingertip grip there, right? The pump that we've already gotten from the jerry can carry. And this is when it gets real because you may be ahead by 50 seconds, but these steps are going to really take a lot of energy Look at that crowd. I mean, you would think this is the Tour de France. Look at that. It's 20 people deep. Here comes Travis Mayer up the steps. And this is where, as you mentioned, Chase, he has to bear hug that thing. And this is what you were alluding to earlier, Chris. It is so hard to breathe when you're in that position with 200 pounds look, pressing up against your chest. Look at the hands. Look at the fingers. They're slowly separating and spreading apart. And one thing is having the grip, right? The other thing is really having the arm length. The, the, the longer arm athletes here are gonna be at a slight advantage because they can interlock those fingers. But if your forearms are blasted, if your grip is gone, it's gonna be much, much more difficult. Because you see him, he'll start, hands crossed. He's grabbing wrists, right? You get the side of the wrist, and this is almost like slowly cutting a rope with a knife, right? Just. One strand, one strand, one strand. You see Brown and Vino in the background there as Travis Mayer has one flight of stairs left. And Travis Mayer is going to take the opening heat for the men as he comes across, ditches the bag, and Travis Mayer in 32 minutes, 16.22 seconds. What I really like for Travis is that on his first carry, his hands were a bit smoked walking the bag to the steps, but he got a much better grip on the second one with that wrist grab as opposed to interlocking the fingers. And that was able, or that made it able for him to carry it all the way up to the final stretch. Took a little more than three minutes for Travis Mayer to complete that carry. Here comes Ellie Turner. Behind her is Brent Fakowski. Brent Fikowski finding himself yet another runoff against one of the female competitors <laughs> to the finish he of an endurance event. He just cannot <laughs> get away from it. Tim Paulson, you saw him. He has the Hussefell bag on his shoulder. <laughs> Ellie Turner, one of the rising stars out of Australia. It's clear that every one of these athletes watched the burden run from 2013 and how did Jason Kalipa carry that log. Mm -hmm. And this way is how he did it. Here comes Alex Vino ahead of Baden Brown. I mean, 200 pounds, it's like you're carrying your buddy drunk after the bars up the <laughs> stairs. I mean, this is like a lifeless body. And that is so unbelievably heavy that these athletes are making so incredibly light. Ellie Turner has the bag down. She had a pretty good lead over Sarah Kaya, who's now in second place. And here comes Vino to lock up second place for the men in heat number one. And Vino is across 33 minutes, 53.84 seconds. Baden Brown will be the next man to finish as Ellie Turner looks to set the time to beat for the women. Well, Sarah Kaya oh. is gaining on her. Yeah, Ellie actually had to take a break with the walk. She hadn't even gotten to the stairs yet. Baden Brown up the final flight of stairs as Sarah Kaya and Ellie Turner are fighting for first place for the women. Now, Brown is in 34 minutes, 27.50 seconds. So Turner still has a decent sized lead over Kaya, but she does not have a lot of time to 
take another sizable break. And, and that's exactly right, Sean, is that these breaks you're going to take here at the end is going to be the deciding factor. You could have a minute lead on the person behind you and lose that entirely on a break on this Husafel back carry. Alexander Caron lugging that Husafel bag up the stairs. Behind him is Guillaume Briant, who has his hands on his knees. Now here comes Brent Fakowski. He's going to take a break as well. So Sarah Kaya has now passed Ellie Turner. Here comes Tudor Magda. It's neck and neck for Turner and Kaya as they approach the steps. And that's when they'll have to transition to the bear hug. Alexander Caron on the right side of the screen. Looking to get across the finish line and take fourth in heat number one. Caron is in 35 minutes, 27.43 seconds. And this is what happened just a little bit ago. Sarah Kaya passing Ellie Turner while Turner was taking a break on that Husafel bag. And the one thing we're not even talking about is you're, you're taking breaks, but it's not a break because you have to pick the bag back up. 200 pound half sandbag clean, 150 pound half sandbag clean. Ooh. Wow, that was that smart. Was smart. <laughs> Sarah Kyle that was very smart. Resting it on the edge of that planter as Turner is back in front now. Not sure if it's legal, but I would try until someone tells me not to. <laughs> that was very, very clever. The Tudor Magda is hoisting that bag back up and having trouble with it. I call it, it's, it's like I, it's what I do when I drive, Sean. If there's a sign that doesn't say I can't, <laughs> it means I can. Here comes Sayer Kaya behind Ellie Turner. Turner has herself situated with that Husafel bag and up the second flight of stairs. Kaya is gaining grab, but her grip is faltering. And that's one thing is the grip. What did she do on the jerry can just to make up that ground before her and Turner? And the other thing is really just anthropometrics. The length of these athletes' arms. See, Kaya puts it again on the sidestep. And here comes the judge. It's going to say, yeah, I don't think that's going to be allowed. It's like, oh, sorry, I didn't yeah. know. <laughs> there wasn't a sign. I said, uh, I said no parking. But the big thing here is like the ability to, the ability to interlock your fingers around this bag it just cannot be stated enough how advantageous this is. And most of the women, the bags aren't really a different size than the men. They're just a little bit lighter. So if they don't have the arm length to get around, this is a much more difficult movement for the women than it is the men, just for the fact that they can't interlock their fingers around the bag. Well, Sayer Kaya has the bag up again. Ellie Turner has it resting on the stairs. Tudor Magda is in the back there. He's been laboring with that thing. Now here comes Carolyn Prevo on the left side of your screen. Austin Spencer making his way up the stairs. And just look at hand position on the back. The back is shaped that it gets wider at the top. Now that also means it's heavier at the top. But for these athletes, somehow you're going to have to find a way to get it a little bit higher in the lap and grab lower than comfortable and lean back. You're almost going to have to lean back and lay the heavier weight on your chest just to get a better grip. So there's a little give and take here, but if you can't hold on to the bag, it's your only option once the arms go. Here comes Ellie Turner just trying to finish the final few steps and has the bag Jeez. down again. And that Husafel bag is modeled to mimic the shape of the famous Husafel stone in Iceland. You often see that, that stone used in strongman competitions. And what you're looking at is, you know, they have uh, two, two strengths with the Husafel bag, half strong and full strong. If you can get it to the lap and walk, you're half strong. If you can go unbroken the whole way, you're full strong. And here comes Moritz Fiebig on the right side of your screen as Ellie Turner's wow. <laughs> so close to wow. the finish. Austin Spencer is going to come across after and there's just Ford's fee big and there's just nothing left in the arms for Ellie Turner. She Cold three sabers in. Wow. And this is where he said anything can happen on the stairs. Wow. Anything can happen. You had a huge lead on the run. And here comes Kaya and Kaya is going to put on a charge at the end and she's going to beat Ellie Turner across the finish. What a performance from Kaya late in that heat. 
to take the Heat win. Ellie Turner will take second. 39-17.62 for Kaya Turner. 39-28.34. I thought Boz was smiling after the skills event that Nick Matthew could actually do the crisscross unders. There may be a bigger one for Boz after seeing the finish here on the stairs, which is really exactly what he wanted to see. Carolyn Prevo and Danny Spiegel coming across. That is a great result for Danny Spiegel. Yes, it is. And it comes down, like we said, it is a, a run heavy event. But if you don't have your boxes checked, on the odd object strongman implements, you can lose minutes here. One more look at just how close the finish was between Kaya and Turner. Kaya was able to hang on to that thing after she got up that final flight of steps. That was the difference And Sayer Kaya wins heat number one. And that is the reaction that we expected to see after this event. That's Karen Freyova now who's across the finish line. They're destroyed. Destroyed. Five women have finished. For the men. I like what Zanoni has done with his bag, is get it vertical. Wow. To try to get his arms underneath it, but you got to get him <laughs> under to start before we can get the bag up to the waist and hopefully slide those hands under just a little bit. But I mean, look at the wreckage on these steps. Here comes Sydney Mikulishin as 13 men have come across the finish line. Mikulishin is in. Alex Gazan coming across the finish as well. Sola Segura daughter is in for the women. With Travis Mayer for the men who had the fastest time at 32, 16.22 seconds. And Sayer Kaya at the last second passing Ellie Turner for the win for the women with a time of 39 minutes, 17.62 seconds. Hey, when you see a finish like that between Turner and Kaya, a lot of times you can allude that to say a handstand walk to the finish when there's elements of unbroken distances and say you fail and you have to come back and the panic of knowing you have to rest and recover and feeling the pack start to catch you. The same thing here on the back carry. If you're at a point of failure and fatigue, you're gonna have to try to sit there and wait longer than you want to because of the race around you. You can pick up a bag too soon and it have disastrous effects for you on the back half. And that's what fatigue does. Fatigue actually messes with your mental acuity, your strategic thinking. You think you're making sound choices, but your fatigue gets in the way. And that's why athletes make bad mistakes under fatigue. They're just not in the right frame of mind. And I think they're so used to using like barbells, kettlebells, and dumbbells where it's like, if it's towards the end I'm getting tired, I can still gut it out. I can still outrace someone if I, if I have the desire to. Not with failure movements. And a back carry is one of those fa failure movements like handstand walks, handstand push-ups, even ring muscle-ups to a certain extent. That's correct. I mean, once, once the wheels fall off, you're just trying to wrap your head around and going, I, I, what am I doing wrong? How do I fix this problem? <laughs> Unfortunately, the damage has created this level of, of misjudgment. Colt Mertens is making his way across the finish line. We've seen Tudor Magda, Guy Mayeros, and Andre Uday, Jorius Karabas, and now Mertens finish for the men. And for the women, Freya Moosebrugger finished after Alex Gazan. Michelle Moran and Victoria Campos coming in as we are getting set for the start of heat number two. And here is your starting list for heat number two for the women. Again, 20 women and 20 men on the field at the same time. Kara Saunders in lane two did this event, the burden run in 2013, she finished in ninth. And Laura Horvath is in 
lane number 18 and this is an event that reminds you a little bit of that battleground event that she won her rookie year back in 2018. She can move implements really well in the strongman force portion but she's also a very underrated runner. She does it a lot and she does it often and she also does it well so Laura Horvath skill set is set up well for this event. On the men's side Overall leader Ricky Garrard will be in lane 10. Uldis Upniks, we saw him do very well in the running portion yesterday of event number two. Uh, Jeff Adler will be in lane 13. He took eighth in that running toes of our event last year. There's Roman Krennikov, who is right now in third place overall. Just six points out of second. All athletes nearly 70 points out of first from Ricky Garrard. And when you look at your top five, Garrard, Medeiros, Karenikov, Jukic, and Vellner, is that they're, all of those athletes you just listed have a great opportunity to win this event. And when you're starting with the 20 pig flips, we saw that you can actually use your strengths if that's the athlete you are based off how Danny Spiegel finished the first event. So if you're looking to win or at least be in the top five, there's really no room to pace. There's really nowhere you can take off. You don't want a red line too soon, but I think there's enough time on the run that you can push a little bit harder here, take the time to recover, right? We got those two loops really around the RV park back in until we hit the straightaways, is that you have the opportunity, but you gotta ride the line. And that's what we're talking about is living on that edge, living on that edge of right below red line before you tip the scales into the red that we see that we saw the Husafil back carry but at the end it's all about grit but we saw is intelligent grit it's not just about try hard but it's about trying hard at the right time and the right moments there is Tia Toomey making the turn on the pig we also saw, we also saw Laurel Horvath and Amanda Barnhart out towards the front but look to her left Sean Haley Adams is going flip for flip with Tia Toomey, and if Haley can get to the run at near the same time, there's no telling how that's gonna shake out. Let's go down to Mike Arsenault, who is there in the North Park. Well, the second heat of athletes were able to watch the first heat go through what, Chris, you described aptly as carnage. So my question, Chris, is, is there anything that you saw in the first heat that if you had a chance to speak to these heat two athletes before this event started, that would change your mind in terms of strategy, either pacing how they approach the pig, the run, or the final two strongman implements at the Capitol? So I spoke, I spoke with a lot of women before this event, and they had no idea how difficult that Jose felt bag would be and what you saw in watching the women is that's the real deal that portion of this workout is going to be a challenge and so they're rethinking their strategy right now and recognizing that's where this workout actually is going to be make or break Roman Krennikov and Jason Hopper the first two men out onto the run and Amanda Barnhart is first for the women oh boy Poor Jason, he thought he was in front. Next thing you know, what do you see? <laughs> Roman Krennikov, boy, making his first in-person appearance, in appearance here at the CrossFit Games. He's qualified every year since 2018. He was able to compete in stage one in 2020, but this year he finally gets to the United States to compete in person. He is not disappointed, and bonus for him, and we've mentioned this a couple times already, got to meet his newborn son for the first time this past week. That's a different kind of motivation that you can't really put into words. So if Jason can sit off of Roman's shoulder and stay there, eventually they'll start working like what we saw with Jonakowski and Justin Medeiros in pulling pace line on the bike event. There is a, strict, a significant advantage by them running as a pair versus individually. Jason's just got to stay there. And like you said so correct yesterday, or the, that bike event, cha Chase, that when they break the elastic, unfortunately, Jason Hopper's going to fall off the back. But he can't allow it to happen. Oh. What? Wow, that is a move with some authority, right? There's Jason Hopper establishing his will and saying, let's go. Well, I think Roman would be okay with that bet. And uh, you were talking about Roman being a rookie this year, four years, really do, really qualifying for this. Is I see a lot of that success we've seen, say, Brent Frakowski's first year. He was always knocking on the door, but you knew he always had the talent to succeed.
here at the game. So he may be a rookie, but it's no surprise to see his performance so far. Tia Toomey was about 40 seconds behind Amanda Barnhart and 25 seconds behind Laurel Horvath off of the pig and onto the run. Well, we know from the bike event that Haley Adams, the way she pulled away from Tia is not intimidated. And so if it's side by side, it's not going to be something where Haley is going to be intimidated. Haley is a incredible runner. The longer it is for Haley, the better she is. For most of the people watching, Haley, for fun, will go out and do a 10 mile run. And I don't know of many people in this field that voluntarily, when they can't come up with a better run workout, I'm just gonna go put in 10. <laughs> yeah, I love what you said about confidence, is that you know if I'm running side by side with someone that I know is a better runner than me, I have no confidence in trying to keep pace with them. So Lazar Jukic was back there behind the leaders. Ricky Garrard was up there as well. So it's Kretikov, Hopper, Garrard, Jukic for the women right now. It's Barnhart, Adams, Laura Horvath, there's Gabby Magawa and Brooke Wells is in front of her. Tia Toomey right back there. Which I believe that is Saxon Panchik. And I just saw Justin Medeiros. He's probably 100 meters behind Tia. Justin's a good runner. And Emma Lawson is now just leaving the stadium. She's about 90 seconds behind Toomey, and Toomey's trying to track her down for second place, only four points behind Lawson. There is Justin Medeiros, and overall leader, Mal O'Brien. Emma McQuaid there on the left as well. And Willie George is next to Justin Medeiros. Noah Olson with the hat, and Danielle Brandon. Top time for the women, 39 minutes, 17.62 seconds. That belongs to Sayer Kaya. For the men, it's Travis Mayer, 32 minutes, 16.22 seconds. So Jason Hopper leads early here over Roman Krennikov. They're going to complete that loop around the bike course, and then they will make the turn and head out towards the trail that will take them to the Capitol building. You think of Hopper and, you know, what he's known for is really machine work, that very anaerobic athlete. I mean, with his football background and just his sheer size and power. Guy's a decent runner. One of the events we had last year, we've actually referenced this a few times already, was the three and a half, three miles of run mixed with the toes to bar. And he actually ended up getting a seventh place finish in that event. So the guy can run. Ricky Garrard, your overall leader behind Lazar Jukic. They're only eight seconds back, and they are actually running faster. They're going to catch him. The question is, is what are they going to do when they catch him? And we said it, there's so much that can happen at the tail end of this. And what we saw with those back carries at the end. And as far as time that can be made up coming off the pig flip, Kaya, who won it for the women, was two minutes behind Ellie Turner off the pig flips alone. And we just see is like, you know, that carry is gonna be the make or break. If these athletes are all in a pack within 30 to 60 seconds of each other, yep. they still have a chance. I think Kaylee Adams is gonna come off of this run in front. That's my prediction. Because these guys, you know what, they look good but they don't look as comfortable. When we take a look at Haley when she comes into picture, what we're gonna find is that's what you should be looking like. Watch her, she's gonna, there she is. She's, Upper right hand part of your screen is and, Haley Adams. And just watch how light she is on mm. her feet. She's running on the balls of her foot. And what we know now after watching that first heat, those last two movements, you are going to be heel striking, heel strike, heel strike. So right now, Haley landing on the ball of her foot. She's activating her quads, preserving those hamstrings, which is going to come in handy at the tail end of this workout. Yeah, my bet. I mean, she really does look solid here. Got her first career event win in the opening event here on Wednesday. She's running with Jeff Adler. And Jeff Adler is a great runner. Jeff Adler is a, you know, 512 miler. And he puts in volume. They should, if they can, work as a team. Mm. Roman Krennikov and Jason Hopper are just 
a bit ahead of the pace from Travis Mayer. It's still early, but they're about five seconds ahead of Travis Mayer's pace at this point. Uh, Haley Adams is well ahead of Ellie Turner's time after one mile, 23 seconds ahead of Ellie Turner at this point. You know, a lot of people, they struggle with being in front. They really have a hard time. How do you know that you're not going too fast? I mean, you're pulling away, but is it your skill? Is your talent? Is the time that you put in? Or are you just going out hot and are you going to blow up? Like, where are people? And so what you see is Jason Hopper's turning around just to know. Like, are we all actually going out too hot or are we doing the right thing? A lifestyle that pushes you forward requires a ring that won't hold you back. Shop Kalo, the official ring of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Daniel Brandon ahead of Mal O'Brien, your overall leader for the women, who only has one finish outside of the top 10 but has yet to win an event. There's Justin Medeiros as these athletes are completing their one mile loop. Noah Olson in that white hat. Danielle Brandon, that's beautiful. She looks good. Nice running form, very relaxed. So what we want to look for when we have a 3.5 mile run. So in the running world, Endurance starts at 3,000 meters, 1.8 miles. So obviously here we've got 3.5 miles. This is an endurance distance run. And when we talk about endurance, we're talking about conservation of energy. What I look for is the vertical oscillation of the head, how much energy is going up and down versus forward. So what you're looking for is more to a low to the ground shuffle versus what a sprinter would do is take flight. Sprinters, if you think about it, how would you shoot a cannonball for maximum velocity? You're gonna shoot it parallel to the ground, you're gonna angle it up. So that's what sprinters do is they angle up, they take flight and they have, unfortunately because of that, a tremendous use of energy for that vertical oscillation. Ironman athletes, triathletes, marathon runners, they don't want that because it's going to deplete them of energy. So what we're looking for is a very low to the ground shuffle for conservation. Roman Krennikov has had a pretty consistent start to his CrossFit game so far. Right now sitting in third place overall, he is only six points back of Justin Medeiros for second overall. So I spoke with Roman and his interpreter uh, two days ago about this event. And Roman is, from, from a physical mental standpoint, one of the toughest athletes in this field. This man grew up in Siberia, one of the worst areas in the entire world as far as outdoor activities. He's tough. But this event caters to him because he's going to build confidence in this run. The question is, is what's going to happen when he gets to the last two pieces? And mm -hmm. much more tightly packed at the front here than it was in heat number one here in heat number two. Krenikov followed by Hopper. And... Ricky Garrard and Lazar Jukic. Jukic is the man with his shirt off there in the back. Ricky Garrard is the man in the red shorts. So this could get really interesting if this split holds as we get closer to the capital. And with the distance they have, we, we talked about bunching up earlier and, and when to push, when to break. Some of, some of it is just catching up to the pack. If I'm the, you know, Ricky Garrard and Lazar, we were behind a distance, we've caught up. Now there's a moment of, okay, we can, we've been going at a faster pace to get here. Now we can actually slow our pace down to stay here. So there, there is an element of almost being able to relax just a little bit and not have to have that chase down pace as you had just to get in this position. There's enough distance in this three and a half miles that you can actually afford to just kind of settle in for a little bit, maybe catch your breath, get your bearings, try to see how you feel for a, a couple hundred meters and then decide, do I push a pace and when? That's correct. I mean, we have all kinds of stress, right? We have that emotional stress that you feel, you have the mental anxiety, but then you also have the physical stress here. And you're right. When we look at a long run like this at 3.5 miles, 
what you eventually have to do is settle into your maximum sustainable pace, meaning just below lactate threshold. And that's all that you can do. You just stay there because that is why they call it maximum sustainable pace. By this point right here, that's all they're trying to do. And so when someone has more speed at that particular uh, maximum sustainable pace, you're going to unfortunately have to let them go. Lazar Jukic is starting to creep up on Roman Krennikov. He is right behind him. So Jukic has moved himself into second place. And Roman, as he got under that bridge, still slightly ahead of Travis Mayer's pace, about seven seconds right now. So I had a chance to run with Jukic a couple of weeks ago. And you know what he told me? I like to lead. Mm. I don't want to sit off of someone's shoulder. I want to get in front and I want to establish my dominance. I want to set the will of the pace. How common is that for a lot of athletes? So a lot of athletes like to sit off the back of the shoulder and not do any work. Let's face it, if you're in front, you're unfortunately having to do all of the work. The person behind just follows. And so they can essentially turn their mind off and just stay up. And that's important. It's about conservation here. But some athletes like to dictate the direction of where you're going. They like to go apex to apex and making sure that they're cutting and making the route as small as it short or as short as possible. And that's what he's going to want to do. That's what he told me. So I would fully expect him to take lead. Last check for the women, it was Haley Adams in first, Amanda Barnhart in second, Laura Horvath in third, Gabby Magawa, and then Tia Toomey. Top four for the men, Roman Krennikov, Lazar Jukic, Jason Hopper, now Ricky Garrard, Looks like he is passing Hopper. So Garrard moving into third. And Chris, you're talking about as those that like to lead out in the front or just hold on to the back. If you're a great runner and just a confident one, getting out in front, you can also do things like play games in a <laughs> sense. Really, it's, it's you can, okay, the next time I feel an uphill, I'm actually push the pace and make you come with me. And either I'm going to pull you out of your pace, in which that'll be a benefit for me, or, as we said before, is like, I'm going to break your pace. I'm going to make sure you don't have any desire to catch me and that you know that I'm a much better, more confident runner than you are. And that's the head game as well as the physical test. That's correct. That's correct. The one disadvantage if you're a naive runner, when someone's behind you, how do you know how well they're doing? But this is where all of these athletes that you're looking at right now are fully aware of the condition of the person behind them without even looking. What they're listening for is their breathing rate. Are they hyperventilating or are they in control? And as soon as you hear any form of, of hyperventilation, you'll see that lead person push the pace and break that elastic that you mentioned. And you just saw Lazar Jukic with his right hand waved Ricky up. So now this is this kind of the same thing that we saw with the bike portion, athletes starting to work together as they realize they've opened up a pretty significant lead here. Now behind them, here's Haley Adams, who leads for the women. Jeff Adler and Sam Quant are behind her. Let's face it, you're running men and women. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you're gonna work together if you're smart. And on the left side of your screen, that's Caroline Lambre. That is Jeff Adler's coach. Isn't this interesting? Because it's an open course. There's nothing against a coach, a family member ben, being out there. And ben Bergeron's on the left as well, counting athletes, getting split times, and dictating to that to his athletes on the course. You're 15 seconds behind. Meters don't matter. Meters are not, I can't compute distance. Tell me time. How many seconds am I behind the athlete that I know I need to get to? Yep, or what's the condition of the person in front of me? There's Will Morad behind him. Wow. Tia Look. Toomey, Gabby Magawa. Look at Spence. And, and, is Spencer that? Pancheck. On the right, that looks great, like he's making time. That is Saxon Pancheck wearing number 27. Both athletes have a seven in the numbers that they were given, and both <laughs> look alike. So let's, <laughs> let's make it even more tough. A Pancheck. <laughs> S Pancheck. <laughs> There's Christy O'Connell and Brooke Wells. O'Connell is late coming off the pig flip. And as far as Cadence is concerned, she has the lightest of the field that we've seen run by so far. Pat Vellner, Noah Olson, and there is Justin Medeiros.
Barnhart, Brandon, and O'Brien. So I'm often asked, like, if you're following somebody, like what we see with the leaders there, that is the exact perfect position to be in. What you're trying to do is tuck right up into that shoulder, and all you're doing is looking right over that shoulder, and you just follow that person in front. Everything else you're turning, just turning it off. Just allow them to lead. And there is Laura Horvath on the right side. On the left side of your screen, Ricky Garrard, Lazar Jukic, and Roman Krennikov are all bunched up. It's Garrard in the lead, but they have separated themselves now from Jason Hopper. There's Alexis Raptis. And Emma McQuaid, Cole Sager. Hey, Rob. And there is Spencer Pagic. Rob Forte. Just saw him ride by on the bike. Pretty decent endurance athlete as he was back in the day. He won triple threes that year, I believe. Lucy Campbell on the right. And there's Emma Lawson, followed by Carl Saunders. Emma Lawson coming in in second place. Overall, she only had a four point lead on Tia Toomey for second. Now that's two places in the results. So if Toomey were to finish first, she would need Lawson to finish in third in order to erase that deficit. Ariel Lowen is back there as well. See Ricky on the left side still leading the three. And, and the one thing for Ricky is that I just careful sitting in the front too long. Don't fall in the trap. Make sure the other guys are pulling their weight, so to speak, as far as the pacing is concerned. But if these three come to the carries and the bags together, someone physically suited for the task, especially that Husafal carry, I'm looking more towards Roman as he may have the physical advantage just by size and length for the bag itself. On the right, we saw Jacqueline Dahlstrom just leave view, and then there is Turi Helgadotter. This pace is fast. Those leaders are moving. They're moving. Ricky Gerard is, is actually setting such a high tempo that the other two just, you know what, unfortunately, they're just having to take a step back. They're trying to hang on. They're trying to prove to him that you're not hurting me. But he's actually breaking them. He surges a little bit ahead and tests them, softens them up a little bit. If he keeps doing that, he's going to take their power away in the next events. This is how an endurance athlete actually breaks a sprinter. You soften them before they get to that sprint, so there's no sprint remaining. Chris, we're talking about the triple threes, and, and you, when you're specific, specifically speaking to crossfitters in mile times versus crossfitters in a three mile time, and, and where they were at back in 2014 in that event, the games athletes that we have now, they're not distance specialists for as like 5K, 10K runner that like you see at the, at the Olympic distance, but where do you see that they have come since? that time in 2014 and where do you see the future of training or where these athletes can go going forward back in 2013 there was no doubt that Garrett Fisher was the most dominant runner in the field without question this this man can run 505 mile and when he had a chance to run 2.1 miles in the burden run that was I mean he was beyond himself he loved that concept and we saw that in his performance today 505 mile there's so many athletes that are between 505 and 515. It's without question over 50% of the men's field. Haley Adams in here, she's sub 520 miler, which is incredible. But Haley Adams also can run sub 19 minutes for a 5K. That's the difference. Can you take that speed in a mile and carry it into longer time domains? And that's where we see a dramatic fall off in their performance. That's why this is a true test. This workout actually created some fear in those 505, 515 milers because they know they didn't put in the time. It's clear these three put in the time. 
And they are still slightly ahead of Travis Mayer's pace, about five seconds ahead of Mayer at this point of the three and a half mile run to the Capitol. Ricky Garrard, Lazar Jukic, and Roman Krennikov, your top three. I think Mayer's disadvantage was that he was all by himself. And the fact that his time is still holding up when you have three guys battling it out in heat number two. Yeah, and they're not going to do what they did in the bike where it's going to come down to a certain point and then be a free for all. They're going to carry this and work. Let's work together until we get to those heavy elements. And look at Haley Adams in the back. Yeah, she's coming way right? out front for the women. The question is, will that strength hurt her? Now, Haley's tall. She's got long arms. Maybe, like you said, Chase, that she's going to be able to actually lock her hands together and not be in the position that we saw in the last heat. And, and you think of just odd object work that they traditionally do at Mayhem is they, you know, if I think of the perfect event that Rich would program is GHD sit-ups and sandbag cleans. I mean, how often do you see that get thrown on Instagram? Now Lazar Jukic is starting to pull away. So this is a solid hill. This is a solid hill. And so it just goes to show that he cracked Roman and, and Ricky behind him. Lazar Jukic pulling ahead of Ricky Garrard and Roman Krennikov. But the good news for Ricky, he is ahead of the two men behind him in the overall standings, Justin Medeiros and Roman Krennikov. And Ricky looking to widen his lead and tighten his grip on the top spot in the overall standings after this event. And here goes Lazar Jukic right to work on those 100 pound jerry cans. And I personally think there's gonna be more strategy needed on the jerry can carry to set them up for the Husafel back carry because we saw what happened in heat one, that grip failure was the deciding factor for all of these athletes. Haley Adams on the left now getting to the jerry cans and she is right to work. 100 pounds for the men, 70 pounds for the women. Haley Adams already has one event win here. Did that on Wednesday morning in the opening event, looking for her second and the second of her career. Top time for the women, 39 minutes, 17.62 seconds. For the men, it's Travis Mayer at 32 minutes, 16.22 seconds. And Haley Adams looking good so far on these jerry can bags. And what's good here is that on the run differently, can I look behind me? Is that going to throw my myself off? But on these carries, you can put them down and have the rest to, to look back. Wow. What was that break that Haley just took? I think it was what? a regrip break. I don't even consider right. that a break. I mean, what is happening right there? Wow. Very impressive. Very impressive. I think that honestly, she wants to beat the boys. She is reeling in Roman Krennikov right now. We've had six men pick up the jerry cans. Lazar Jukic, Ricky Garrard, Roman Krennikov, Jeff Adler, Jason Hopper, and Sam Quant. Yeah, Haley. And Haley Adams is the only woman on this right now. The only concern here is she's going fast. You can see it's starting to take its toll towards the end. And you just it, got to be a, a bit cautious, as we said before, the grip strength that they're going to need for the back carry. Here come Gabby Magawa and Tia Toomey, and they are right to work. The Toomey right now third place in this heat behind Magawa and Adams, but ahead of both Emma Lawson and Mal O'Brien. And Toomey's taking an early break as Christy O'Connell has now passed her. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. If, if Toomey's, Toomey's plan is, hey, I'm going to take 10 to 15 steps, put it down, shake my hands up, pick it up, and go again. Toomey quick break again as Haley Adams is making the transition over to the Husafel bag. Roman Krennikov and Lazar Jukic as well as Krennikov back in front of Jukic. Look at Roman shaking out his arms. He knows he's got that pump, and he's got to get rid of that before he picks up this bag. This is really incredible. A well-written event. Look at this group involving everyone. Here comes Ricky Garrard. Right behind Jukic and Krennikov. And in the background, Haley Adams. Getting to the Husafel bags first will be Lazar Jukic and Roman Krennikov. 200 pounds. They can carry it however they want until they get to the steps. And that's when they have to bear hug it. Ricky Garrard now joining Jukic and Krennikov. So this is where you're going to want to be in front because when you reach those steps and you have someone directly following you and you stop or you stutter step or you pause, that person behind you is going to have to react or swing wide. Meanwhile, the leaders have fallen slightly behind Travis Mayer's pace right now as Haley Adams has that Husafel bag hoisted up to her shoulder. 
and looking to lock up her second event win here at the CrossFit Games. These three athletes are five seconds behind the pace from Travis Mayer in heat number one. They said getting to the stairs is one thing, getting up to the stairs is almost an entirely different event altogether. They were able to make up some time on that transition though, as here comes Gabby Magawa on the left side, making her way towards the bag, and the stairs are looming as Krenikov, Jukic, and Gerard approach that final ascent to the finish. Getting close to the 30 minute mark now. Again, Travis Mayer with a top time, 32 minutes, 16.22 seconds. Krenikov oh, right wow. to the bear hug. He has yet to put that Husafel bag down. Both Jukic and Gerard are gonna dump it. And Krenikov, as they said, be able to interlock those fingers a little bit. I haven't seen anybody make that transition from walk to carry. First time he's put it down, here comes Ricky Garrard. Haley Adams in the back, moving pretty well with that Roosevelt bag and is able to lock her hands on that thing. And Ricky Garrard now threatening to pass Roman Krenikov and Garrard is back in the lead. But Haley is doing the carry much earlier than she needed to. And Haley is going to do the same thing as Sarah Kaya, and here comes the judge right away. Got to put that thing on the ground. Gerard and Krenikov. Staring at those steps. Here comes Lazar Jukic. Jeff Jukic. Adler is behind them. There's a term in horse racing. I think that's Tia. Called mutters. And they're not the fastest horse. They're not the most conditioned horse. But when the conditions are at their worst, those are the horses that win the races. And when I look at Ricky Garrard specifically, I see a mutter. An athlete that performs in the most inopportunity positions. The conditions that aren't perfect. An athlete that likes it when it gets dirty. An athlete that excels when the chips are down. And Ricky Garrard is that mutter between these athletes. Final ascent for Ricky Garrard looking to win another one. And there will be no doubt this time, Ricky Garrard, his second event win here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Roman Krenikov is in in second place. Travis Mayer now has the third best time. Lazar Jukic is even with Jeff Adler. There's Gabby Magawa who is now past Haley Adams. Tia Toomey is lurking in the background there. And Haley's arms are gone. And here comes Sam Quant. Jason Hopper making his way up the steps. Quant with one flight of stairs remaining. I want to look back and see where Haley went from the overhead carry to the bear hug carry much earlier than she needed to. And here comes Sam Quant across the finish line. And welcome back to the CrossFit Games, Mr. Quant. Gabby Magawa now in the lead for the women and looking to lock up the event win here. Here comes Jason Hopper lumbering up the steps. He has passed Jeff Adler. Haley Adams had to take a huge break and see her in the back. And it's just the complete arm fatigue in that carry. Adams is back to work. Magawa with one flight of stairs remaining. 49 steps in total here. Gabby Magawa is going to win event five. Magawa in 11th overall, desperately needed a finish like that with a 27th and 30th already. And Haley's gonna have to worry about the other athletes behind her. Here comes Justin Medeiros. Alongside Haley Adams. So Medeiros is just trying to do damage control now and not surrender too many points to Ricky Garrard. Dwarven Carl Gumitson is back there. 
Lazar Jukic, Lazar Jukic is just yeah. collapsing on this as Bjorgen Carl Gumitsen comes across. Jukic is now just trying to inch that bag up the steps, as is Haley Adams. Haley Adams needs to look behind her and see how close the other girls are because she still doesn't necessarily need to pick it up too soon. Second place in the event for the women is still very much up for grabs because Sayer Kaya's top time is now second, and that's 39.17.62 seconds. Look behind you. T is coming, as well as a couple other athletes, but it's unlikely they can carry it the entire way. Oh, Haley's done. Wow. Her muscles are just shutting down. Willie George is across now. Here comes Laura Horvath. Wow. Laura Horvath is in, and she's going to take second place in the event. 97 points for Horvath. Jukic is at the finish line. Toomey is across. Wells. Wells got in there. So Toomey has finished third. Brooke Wells is across. Toomey is going to pick up 94 points, and now we got to wait and see what O'Brien and Lawson do. Haley can't even pick the bag up anymore. That's how shot the grip is. But I like what she's doing. This is exactly what you would want to do. They're Third not going to still available. They're, exactly. They're not going to pass me from the stairs. I have time to recover and time from the best time in the previous heat. Here goes Haley Adams. Good job. And she is in. So Haley Adams will take third place in the heat and third place in the event. Very smart move by Haley Adams to look back and wait to see where the other athletes were behind her. Saxon Pantic, Lazar Jukic, Cole Sager, and now Noah Olsen have all finished for the men. Danielle Brandon and Amanda Barnhart also came across. Now there is overall leader Mal O'Brien, who's behind Christy O'Connell. That was a big finish for Barnhart and Brandon. So Danielle Brandon finished sixth. That will be worth 85 points. So it is likely that Tia Toomey could find herself in the overall lead after this event. She has to pick up 16 points on Mal O'Brien. Here comes Pat Vellner. Christy O'Connell with the bag back to her chest. Mal O'Brien behind her in the red pants. O'Connell is in. And here comes Mal O'Brien. So Mal O'Brien is across. O'Brien's going to take ninth. That's 76 points. Which means, unofficially, Tia Toomey will be your overall leader by two points. Unofficially. Huge result for Tia Toomey. Emma McQuaid making her way up the steps. Emma Lawson looked like she was back there as well. Emma Lawson has now finished. She'll take 11th in the event. Meanwhile, for the men, Nick Matthew and Jay Crouch have come across, and now Pat Velder is in, and he will take 15th in the heat, 23rd in the event. That is Heinrich Hapelainen who just came across. There is Alexis Raptus. Will Morad is on the left side of your screen. There's Spencer Panchik, and he is in. 39 minutes, 
5.99 seconds. Now Will Morat trying to finish up. Will Morad, the man who overcame a 76-point deficit in the final event of the Syndicate Crown to earn a trip to the CrossFit Games. And the gray shorts just trying to find a way to get himself up those steps. Here comes Alexis Raptus. It's Ariel Lowen. There's Kara Saunders working her way up the steps. Lucas Utnix is on the left side of your screen. Will Morad clinging to that bag, and he's going to get across. Athlete control out there just trying to clear the carnage. Saunders and Utnix are in. There's Turi Helgedotter and Matilda Garns. We talk about memorable events, memorable settings, images that will last. There is no doubt that this event Climbing. is going to go down as one of the most memorable in CrossFit Games history. Climbing the steps of the Capitol is, you're right. I mean, this. This will be one of those things we see for replays to come for the next decade. It is an incredibly iconic moment. You know, Jason Khalifa said when I spoke to him, he said one of the best moments in his entire career was in the Burden Run when he came in through the stadium and the stadium was filled with people and it erupted when he walked in. That feeling here on the Capitol, I got to tell you, this is more inspiring, more chill setting than that would be. These athletes, to experience this, they'll never forget. Turi Helgedotter is across. Matilda Garns is in. There's Paige Semenza. And I believe that's Yona Koski, who is the last man left on the course. We still have one woman who has yet to finish, and that's Rebecca Fusile. Koski is in. Keep jumping straight through, Yoda. Keep walking. We got water right here for you, brother. We've got one more athlete making their way towards the Capitol. Just one woman left out there on the course again. That's rookie Rebecca Fusile, who we have yet to see uh, pick up the Husafel bag. We are waiting on Fusile is out there. You see her, and there she is. She's, she's walking with the bear hug way earlier than she needs to. She can put that on her shoulders. And I don't know if that's a product of the inability to get it up to that shoulder position, but you know, 150 pounds sandbag clean. Now, obviously this isn't easy as a sandbag. It's an odd object. It's unevenly weighted as far as distribution from top to bottom. On the right side is Tia Toomey who finished third in this event. Again, that's good for 94 points. And she was trying to erase a 16 point deficit to Mal O'Brien who is now next to Pat Vellner there in the white top and red pants. O'Brien finished in ninth, so it looks like Tia raced that deficit. Meanwhile, Haley Adams 
Haley Adams did was, some damage control, but smartly got herself well, across okay, the finish so line at the, the end. Okay, so look in the back, Haley Adams. She has it on top of her shoulders. Now, the rule is you can carry it to your shoulders to the base of the steps like you see where Ricky Garrard is. But watch Haley in the back. She still has at least 10 to 15 meters before she gets to the base where she has to do a bear hug. But she picks it up in a bear hug here and walks 15 unnecessary meters to get to the edge here. In fact, she continues past that until she gets to near this, this fountain area that we saw they dropped the bags on. She carried that for almost 20 to 25 meters in a position she didn't need to. Now, the implications of that were at the end because Haley could no longer pick up the bag anymore. Her grip was completely shot, and that opened up the door for Magawa right there on the left as she makes the pass. Look at she can't even hold the bag anymore, Haley on the right. And that had everything to do with her blowing up before she even had to hold the bag in that position. And, you know, she led wire to wire until that position. And, and really, that's that's the heat of the moment. Just she thought she had to carry it from that position, what it seems like, until she got there. And that was really the deciding factor between Haley, who could have got her third event win of the weekend, and then it ended up being Gabby Magawa's first. She does finish in fifth place overall. And when she got to that point of failure at the end, she was she did take some smart rest in order to just do some damage control. Absolutely, to get yeah. The way she handled that at the end was very smart on Haley's part. On the men's side, they had that three-horse race between Lazar, R Karenikov, and Gerard. Now on the carries, on the the cherry can carries, Lazar actually tried to outrace everybody there, getting to the bags nearly first, along with Roman and Ricky but ended up blowing up his grip at the end as well. But as we said, just Ricky's grit and Roman's grip, they are very similar athletes as far as grittiness. And Ricky was just basically to outgrit him at the end. Ricky Garrard, his second event win so far. He's going to widen his lead over both Maderos and Krennikov. He will continue to wear the leader's jersey as we head into the rest of day number three here. Rebecca Fusilay continuing to just try to find a way to get herself across the finish line. There is no time cap here. And the reason for that is the totality of the event and the toll that it takes on these athletes is part of the thing that every athlete should experience going through. How detrimental that sandbag carry is up the stairs and what was coming in the North Park Stadium coming up. Ring muscle-ups. And if you don't have to go through this, you are at a massive physical advantage going into that event. So having no time cap and forcing them to complete this is part of the test that every athlete needs to take. Let's go to Nikki Brazier, who is with Gabby Magawa and Ricky Garrard. fully recovered almost at this point. Congratulations to both of you. Gabby, let me start with you. We have seen you excel at endurance events. I remember talking to you back at the Triple Three at Regionals back in the day. What exactly do you do to train and prepare for events such as this one? I mean, I just run a lot. Oh, like this, this season, I run even more than usual. Like the, um, the goal this season was to actually train for the games since the very beginning. I didn't divide the preparation for open prep, quarterfinals prep, and uh, quarterfinals prep, it was all like games prep, yeah. So I think th it really paid off, and going into this uh, workout, I was just thinking, okay, this is another Wednesday track session, just go for it, and yeah. What was it like for you for the first time experiencing the city of Madison as part of an event here at the Games? I mean, I have to say that uh, it was hard to uh, admire the, the views when we suffered that uh, that much, but it was pretty cool idea to uh, brought the event outside the Colosseum and actually running uh, next to the Colo uh, Capitol was very cool. This uphill though was very challenging, it was spicy. I bet, I bet. Now Ricky, you're out here to make a statement, sir. It's the first time we've seen you compete in some time and here you are at the top of the leaderboard. What was it like for you going into this event knowing this was going to be another chance to really put your stamp on an event here at the Games? 
Yeah, for sure. I knew this was going to be a good event for me. Um, the running comes pretty natural. Um, I do love a run, so honestly, I never flipped the pig before. Okay. Um, so I surprised myself on that. A couple of reps got a bit, a bit shaky, but um, I managed to get off them as quick as I could and, and get with the front pack on the run. And yeah, we just we worked together. And we just kind of pushed it, pushed the wind for each other, and pretty much got to the farmers' car at the same time. And it just come down to who was tougher and who who wanted it more, who had the grit. And, yeah, I came out on top, so I'm stoked. You need that grit. You need that grit throughout the entire week here. For you, mentally, is this season about proving something, or are you? Level, so it's really tested my patience to finally get that opportunity again, and I've only got myself to blame. So I'm out here to prove it to myself, and I'm just going to put my best effort forward every event, and so far, so good. Congratulations to you both. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Rebecca Fusilay is still working on that Pusafel bag. Yeah, Chase, I agree with you. I'm really happy that they're making the athletes finish this event because the CrossFit Games is an endurance competition. It's over a series of days with multiple events. And that fatigue stacks from day to day to day to day. And if you don't have to finish an event like that, it creates an unfair advantage. And you want to make sure that the athletes actually carry that fatigue equally. She's got to finish. And you look at, we, we've made this connection a, a bit. When you look at a, an endurance test, like say the Tour de France, it's a much larger scale, but you have multiple stages, different courses, climbing, sprint events, time trials, not dissimilar from the type of differential that we have event to event here. It'd be like you getting to the hill, the, the mountain range event at the Tour de France, and you just get to skip it. The, the benefit physically of having to just get time capped on something like that. No, you have to endure something like this because of the physical ramifications for the rest of the weekend. Well, and what the tour does that's even more, like you said, a time cap. If you don't finish within a certain amount of time from the winner, you're out. You don't even get to come back the next day. And so it is recognized in sport that you must do the work if it's a multi-day event, a multi-day competition. Rebecca Fuselet is making her first individual appearance at the CrossFit Games. She is a two-time teenage competitor in 2016 and 2017. She was ninth in the 16 to 17 year old division in 2016 and then finished 10th the following year. From the level 10 gymnast who started CrossFit when she was 13 years old. So part of that up and coming next generation of the sport. This is what is so great about this sport. Remember the cheers that the winners got. It's the same. And this is the sense of community that you feel in this sport, that what we look at is your effort. She is putting in maximal effort here, and you've got to respect it. She's really, really pushing that. And I love that about this sport. Just because you won, doesn't mean that you get all the applause. Oh, you see that in the gym. You see that in every class. Is that the respect someone get in the gym or in your affiliate never centers around the weight that you lifted or the time at which you went. And, and you know, there's there's one thing to say is that that's where you can see the the community, the draw of the sport, especially within the CrossFit community, is that everybody's been this person and they can empathize with that situation. But at the same time is that your time and your weight and your number of reps you completed are irrelevant to me, for me to you as a human being. That's why we could all relate to what happened to Haley Adams. We all can relate when we misjudged a workout. We all understand that we've done it before, which gives a little bit of compassion. It's like, I've been there. And here comes the crowd behind Rebecca Fusilay. Okay. This is fantastic. I don't mean, think she realized who was what was behind her. You think back to last year with the fans running with Scott Panchik and what a great moment that was. And here you have an entire 
fan base behind Rebecca Fusile, who has to get up those steps and across the finish line. If you want a reason to walk into a CrossFit affiliate, I can think of no better example than that moment right there. Because you get that every day you walk into the gym. In any gym. Any gym. Any CrossFit gym, you get that. And whether it's you're coming in with you know, you're, you're coming in the gym and you're, you know, you're, you're last because you're uh, of the of the work at, of the day or you're coming in with your own personal baggage that maybe people don't know about. And you're going to get that. You're going to get this camaraderie inside your affiliate. You're going to get this camaraderie inside your gym. You're going to get that in every class. You're going to have coaches there. You're going to have people that want the best for you as a person. Right. It goes well beyond the sport at this point. It goes well beyond you as an athlete. That's correct. And you as a human being, being celebrated by other human beings is the most beautiful part of this community. And even the athletes still hanging around. Noah Olson was there to cheer everybody across the finish line. Gabby Magawa picks up the event win, followed by Laura Horvath. Tia Toomey looks to overtake Mal O'Brien for the overall lead after this event. And that margin could be very slim between the two of them, Brooke Wells and then Haley Adams rounding out the top five. On the men's side, Ricky Garrard picks up his second win of the competition. 31 minutes, 54.47 seconds. Roman Krenikov will finish in second. Travis Mayer's top time from heat number one is good enough for third. Sam Quant and Jason Hopper finishing fourth and fifth. What an incredible start to day number three here in Madison, Wisconsin. A memorable event to kick things off. Plenty more action to come today. Want to thank Chris Hinshaw for joining us in the booth. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much. You can head to games.crossfit.com for official results, standings, and more. We're just getting started here on day number three of competition at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Team action coming up next. The 2022 Noble CrossFit Games are sponsored by U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Noble. No excuses, no shortcuts, no gimmicks, no tomorrows. Noble. Halo, the official ring of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Thor, the official supplement partner of CrossFit. And guaranteed rate the official mortgage company of the Noble CrossFit Games. A lot of things were going through my head. After birth, I still remember I could not walk downhill with the stroller. Now all of a sudden, podium was realistic. You've also got this development where you're starting to get these younger athletes. Kids who have been doing CrossFit since they've been in elementary school. Mal O'Brien, we saw her stare right in the face of the reigning women's champion and not blink. The young, upcoming, new blood of the sport.
Whether your goal is to chase records, write history, or become the best version of yourself, the intention put into the process is the same. To push your body to give its best every single day. For your body to give you what you want, you have to give it what it needs. The consistency you apply in every detail around your training is key. It allows you to perform one more rep in the last second. It's that rep that makes all the difference to make you better tomorrow. Yourself, it's just like a hundred dollar bill. No matter what you go through, if you believe in yourself, you still have value. The cool part about Expanding Horizons is there's no other program out there that bridges the gap between youth on probation and life after probation. So it's a court order program uh, where they come to CrossFit four days a week for an hour and participate in CrossFit. And this the success of that program over the course of the last four years has been phenomenal. We all talk about this, right? CrossFit's developing friendships through thrusters and pull-ups. Truly, that means community, and we surround the youth with community. What these kids need is they need a, a positive community that really rallies around them and supports them to be the, the, the best person that they, they can be. You can make it. Remember the values you have in yourselves. That's the lesson I got for you.
Welcome back to the North Park here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games, the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. It is day three of competition for the team. So a little event we're going to call Muscle Pig. Alongside Tanya Wagner, Jamie Hagia is down on the floor. 2009 Women's Champion. We, are now has, we now also have the 2017 Team Champion with us. Adrian Conway joins us. My name is Joel Gadet. Take a look at how we got to this point. Oslo Navy Blue is in first place after two days of competition. Just a 12-point lead, not over Mayhem Freedom, but a 12-point lead over CrossFit Invictus. The near four-year streak of a white leader's jersey run for Mayhem Freedom was broken on day one. It was broken again on day two. How did Oslo Navy Blue do it? Well, they finished fifth on the lift. They then won the run. That's your way to stamp your foot down on the gas pedal. They annihilated that run. 18 minutes, but six minute miles for consecutive pairs. Unbelievable that they all could do that run so well. Two ladies finishing things off here for Oslo Navy Blue, the sprint to the finish line. They will wear the white leader's jersey for the start of competition here on day three. And that all starts with Team Event 5. It's what we call the Muscle Pig. It's a nice little chipper of four rounds of 10 synchronized muscle-ups that all four teammates will have to complete. And then 10 pig flips on the female pig and the male pig. Ladies will alternate their flips, as will the men. Men's pig weighs 510 pounds and the ladies 350. Coming out of that, we got event keys, which are gonna be extremely important when we think about what teams are going to do to have success in this workout. When we think about how they're gonna to need to navigate these rings on these long straps, it's gonna be strategic sets, primarily focusing on the weakest link for that specific movement on your team. And then of course, you gotta have tempo with that pig, set up and execute time and time again as you rotate in and out through your pairs talked about Oslo Navy Blue. They will be in heat four here in event number five. Here's your heat one start list. A lot of teams from Norway. We're going to get two of them here in heat one. There are four Norwegian teams, 16 Norwegian athletes competing in this teen, uh, team rather division. That is 10% of the field, and it starts with Sarpsborg. And Sarpsborg is another one of the teams similar to Oslo that is following the Krieger training that Kristen Holta uh, is, is there as well. And so a strong team coming out. Their first place finish, our best place finish was in the first event where they took 12th, where they moved the big bob really well. We'll see if they can move the pig well, as well as they did with Bob. And CrossFit Trondheim as well, out of Trondheim in Trondelag, Norway. All right, so we are underway here for this 15-minute time-capped event. We start with the synchronized muscle-ups, and already we see something that, Tanya, I think we talked about we were going to see. Somebody was going to get to the top of the muscle-up and have to hold it, waiting for everyone else to get there because this is synchronized up top. That is where it's synchronized, and there are some movements that as a team, they're just easier to synchronize, like burpees where you're, under, you're not under fatigue while you're waiting. You're just hanging out there on the ground. But the muscle-up is a completely different story. So if you know you're faster to get up there and your cadence, your tempo is quicker up there, you don't have to be the first one up there if you know where everybody's at. This takes time and you have to practice these to know. Adrian, we're looking at singles from a lot of these teams. Does that surprise you? You know, when I consider the difficulty of being outside under the sun and with the long straps, then you add on the synchronicity that is needed for this particular thing. I'm not. Um, I, I will say that a lot of these teams don't have the opportunity to just face each other like this in training and actually apply this unusual skill of synchronizing this style of ring muscle-up. How many affiliates have four sets of rings put in this kind of close proximity that you can even do it? Well, like Adrian said, too, the long straps make a big difference for fatigue, and we know that number of 10 doesn't sound like it should be much. A lot of these teams can do 10 unbroken, but the biggest thing is it's about the longer straps, the fatigue, and the compounding effects of this pig and what it's going to do for them. Team 2150 in lane five, the first one out to the pig flip here. These pigs weigh about what a pig weighs. On the men's side, 510. On the women's side, 350. Maybe coincidental, maybe not. It's a lot of bacon. Prefer not to think about it that way, Adrian. 
I do. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me sad. Now, these pigs are, they're tough to flip. They make them look easy, but when you think about that weight and what they're doing time over time, it's as if you're setting up for a max lift. And that's why, Adrian, when you said about the tempo of the pig, it's really, you have to have the power and speed once you get up there, but you need a good footing and you need to have a good setup. That's extremely important. And, and as we're even watching on it, it's like you see the way these athletes have to brace themselves. We want to see that the shoulders are slightly in front of their feet here as they kind of lean forward and get as much momentum going forward as they can. Of course, there's upward momentum that needs to be created, but if they're not forcefully pulling and pushing into that pig as they get their hands underneath it, they're going to really struggle. And we'll see some athletes miss it in the transition. This is 10 flips down the field here, and you do have to alternate back and forth, athlete to athlete. The men are going on their pig, the women are going on their pig. So obviously your ability to get back to the muscle ups is held up by which of the pairs flips the pig the slowest. 2150 continues to be in the driver's seat here out of Nordhaven, Denmark. Qualified fifth out of the Lowlands throwdown. I love this combination of the pig being a strong man element, a strong portion, and then you people that are smaller can say, oh, you know, I, my advantage is not, I don't have the advantage there. But then you go over to rings, which is the opposite. You can be lighter and flip through. So I really like the pairing of these two, that it wasn't two strong man elements together. Yeah, I love it. It's a beautifully programmed event when you think about four people. No matter where you're going, on the rings or on that pig, your weakest link's going to be highlighted in some way. And we love to see that from a team competition because we know at the end of these heats, we're going to get the most well-rounded team that's going to be standing on top of this particular 100 points. It's 21.50 that makes their way back to the rings here. 21.50 has the advantage with their synchronizations, or at least they did the first round. We'll see if they can make up that time again because Training Think Tank definitely moved the pig faster. Training Think Tank jumping up front by a couple of reps. Basically a dead heat at this juncture. And this isn't where it matters. It's really going to be the compounding effects. Their forearms, Adrian, their forearms, their biceps, the pulling and holding onto the pig. The last thing you want to do is fatigue your, your arms like that going into synchronized muscle-ups. If it was by yourself, you could do your own thing, but because you have to wait the extra second at the top and have that control with the long straps, that's what makes the difference. Now we're talking about the secret power of being a successful team. Your, your fittest individuals have to be some of the most empathetic and aware people on your squad because it's not about what you can do, Tanya. It's about how much I'm struggling on the rings, perhaps, and you got to be able to see that in me. Well, and that's where I, I love when we bring the super teams together and you have all these incredible individual athletes, Team Reykjavik, and individual Usually they have fantastic abilities, but it is, it's being able to put yourself in somewhere else, in somebody else's shoes and see where they're at and adjust yourself. Bear Complex is the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. This is a fitting time to talk about Bear Complex. Head to bearcomplex.com to shop the best grips on the planet, up to 15% off. And if you run to the Bear Complex tent, they do have some leftovers of the grips that all the athletes were given here at the Games this year as well. Got myself a pair. Wise choice. I rarely am doing ring muscles without him. Back to 2150 here. Frederick Studa, Victor Munter are the men on the far side of your screen. Mia Furu and Astrid Tind are the two ladies in the foreground. Ah, now that was a no rep. They need to wait now. And this is only heat. This is only round two. And the waiting is important, right? You would think, hey, you're in a race, hurry up, hurry up. But every failed rep is another failed rep piling on top of each other. And right there, you jump up, you miss the rings, it slows you down even more. Yeah, and even as we see Yaz right here getting set for their next rep, it's hard to make these considerations when you're not used to playing with rings outdoors. And Gemma Raider has now got to leave her whole team hanging, and that is a very taxing oh, one rep. Oh, the communication there, and then not knowing the next one. This is this is what we expected to see where some teams would fall apart with that communication there, and that's wasted effort. And Yaz is a team of individuals. Gemma Raider did the work to put them together and say, hey, let's combine our forces, but they were four individuals who were trying to get to the games. This is the ultimate teamwork situation. 
And that's where, you know, again, the beauty of it all is that it's going to come together and get tested here. We, we know the test will rely potentially on individual fitness capacity, but you're on a team for a reason. You're competing for that affiliate cup for a reason. And it's to see, we want to see how well can you do as a unit. Well, that is trading think tank in the gray right now, leading the pack. Mike McGoldrick and Chris Kinjeski at the top of your screen. Brandy McGoldrick, Mike's wife, working at the bottom with Mia Janelli. That's Mike who just flipped over the pig. Mike is an OG. Been competing against that guy since at least 2012, so he's been around for a minute. Now you can start to see the lead of the trading think tank is opening up. Even on 1855, who's hot on their heels in lane four near the top of the screen. And these guys out of training Think Tank, they've, they've got a whole cadre and squad there, not just this team, but individuals representing them as well at the games. And they've got some great coaching and a lot of experience. So this team is can't be a huge shocker to see them do well in something like this. And they are coaches. Three of the four on that roster are coaches. Mia Ginelli, as a matter of fact, was hired out of college to be a coach at training Think Tank. And when she got there, couldn't do a strict handstand push-up. And she struggled with ring muscle-ups. She gonna do both today at the CrossFit Games. No hiding behind that lack of experience or lack of capacity. And I'll tell you what, that also shows her ability to really put in the time and effort to develop as an athlete to see her on a, a stage like this and you walked into affiliate not having those skills. That says a lot. But 1855 is right there with them. But Adrian, it's who you it's who you hang out with. You tell, I tell my kids that who your friend it matters them. who you hang out with and who you hang out with at your affiliate and how they're training. It bleeds off into you. It, it really is. It matters the depth and who how people push you. No, it's it's an amazing point that you're making. It's 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 the community. Right, and it's what drew us all into CrossFit usually to start is the working out kind of sucks at first and then you're like, oh, I like these, these are my people and they push me to be better. That's what's important. And you come through on the other side and it just, it's a bond. Yep. Sarpsburg in lane eight. We highlighted off the top, the Norwegian team running back out to the pig. We're on round three of four here with a 15 minute time cap. So if teams are gonna get in under that time cap, they're gonna have to hustle. And I didn't notice specific splits off of that first round, but it seems a couple of these teams actually have refined their ability to synchronize these muscle-ups versus round one. There was a lot of faltering, and some of them are a little smoother. Well, and I think that's this, it, it's a smart strategy to come out and go slower with the, with the straps. And then also, let's see what that pig does to us. Let's see how fatigued we are. You don't want to go to the pig with your first set already heart rate high from holding on and working so hard on the muscle-ups. So they're kind of going all at the same pace, I feel like, that from that first round just to take a little more cautious. Yaz was in the top three earlier. They have dropped out of that position at the moment. 1855, a repeat team from last year's games, right now holding the lead. Gemma Raider is on the right. That's Martha Cook right in front of you. Mike McCary, Paolo Rosil, formerly the fittest in Guatemala, are the two men for this team from Yaz, competing out of the UAE. Here's a note to stick into your basics, folks. The athletes that are waiting at the top of this ring muscle up are in an isometric contraction, a ton that can be overlooked with, hey, let's just accumulate some time and a ring support and build our ability to wait for our teammates. Those athletes that didn't overlook that aspect, are, it's probably paying off for them right here. How often are you guys doing ring supports in the gym every day or every week, month? That's a really great question. I would say for me, um, I had some great advice early on in my career. And around the time of 2012, when we first made it to the CrossFit Games on Hacks Pack, uh, we would do that as finishers often, accumulating three minutes to end a session. So I try to tie it in relatively as often as I can that or some type of L support. And early journals, 2002, from Greg Glassman, it spoke about dynamic and static gymnastic movement, being able to control your body, not just through movement, but also through holds, L sits. Handstand holds, those isometric, any of the, any of those kind of isometric contractions, or even just holding squats. Any of that is so much you can't move your way through uh, weaknesses. But if you can be, be solid in every part of start to finish of a movement, that shows so much more control and body awareness. 
Now here comes 1855, has jumped well out in front of training Think Tank with that two rep advantage. 1855 competing at the games last year. They came in 21st. Three of their members showed up on time. Leah Dean, Leo Connor, and Pete Shaw. Thomas Markhauser was given a reprieve because the teams checked in on Monday. Thomas was getting married. He wanted to stay married, so he took care of that and then came in and checked in the next day. Congratulations, by the way. Just about three minutes until the cap here. We're going to have a lot of teams hit that cap mark. And you've got to think about the fact that you are flipping 510 or 350 pounds 40 times. Well, 20 times individually. Yeah, that's where teamwork makes the dream work. You get to split the work up, but there, there's, a, there's a strict rule that you have to alternate every time. We've seen events like this. We did an event like this similarly in 2013 when the athletes were doing the burden run for teams where we had to flip the pig the length of the floor, but we didn't have to stay in a particular order. So that meant if I was a stronger athlete, I could carry more of the pig weight and my teammate could rest perhaps for three to four consecutive flips. This makes it much harder for that weaker athlete that could be struggling when it's their time to step up. Now, training think tank's got a lot of ground to cover here, but they're doing a, and I know it's number of flips, not distance, but you can see how quickly they are gaining ground on 1855 in terms of the pig flip efficiency. Yeah, and it's, it's easy to kind of assume who will do well, right? If we look statistically at who might have the larger deadlift or the larger power clean, those are the athletes are gonna have an easier time with that pig flip. Here comes 1855 again with a minute and a half remaining to work. It's just taking them so much longer probably than expected on the rings. It's chewing up a lot of time, and so I'm surprised we're not probably aren't gonna get the team to finish here in this first heat. That surprise you? that the rings were that much of a stumbling block? I did. I really thought teams would come out and just do small sets, threes, twos, maybe a set of, possibly a set of five in the first, uh, five and five on the first um, round. But yeah, I am, I am a little surprised. It is still though the first heat. So, um, but uh, yeah, the singles and, and that right off the bat, taking this much time, it is the compounding effects and the effects of this movement for all four of them having to be synchronized. Yeah, communication, 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 and trust. Because it's, it's very easy to panic when you're the person who feels the pressure. If you're the woman or the male that's struggling with the ring muscle-ups, it's so easy to say, I can do it, guys. I'll do another one, or let's go. And if you rush really a second, there. yeah, second too fast, and then it's costly. 20 seconds remaining here in the first of four heats. The time to beat will be cap plus something. What will that something be? 1855 in the driver's seat, training think tank just on the heels here. Final five seconds of heat number one. See if you can get another one in the bank. And that will be a no rep for 1855. But it is 1855 that leads the way through heat one and establishes that early time to beat. Good effort though for training think tank as well back for their second consecutive season at the games. So for this event, it was 21.50 with their smooth muscle-ups. They were the team to show us the early lead of how to work together on the rings. But training Think Tank, when they got to the pig, they took over the lead there, left 21.50 behind. And then 1855 was just kind of smooth all the way through with their consistency on both the pig and the rings. And that's why they were able to get the event win in this heat. All told, 40 synchronized ring muscle ups. The ultimate workload here. And then the 40 pig flips added on top of that. It is a lot of work and the synchronized muscle ups. I think Adrian, you talked about the length of those straps. Maybe the length right off the top made that a more complicated movement than we expected. It certainly does. It catches a lot of athletes off, off guard, especially if they haven't an opportunity to practice with those particular long straps. Take a look at the 
full results from that first team. Yeah, cap plus 16 is where we're going to be. Still had a significant amount of work to get done. On to heat two here at the North Park on the third day of competition for the teams at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. The Alliant Energy Center, the site here in Madison, Wisconsin. Crowd starting to flow back in after they spent this morning at the Capitol. Tip of the cap, by the way, to Adrian Bosman for the programming on the individual side, both from the actual programming itself and the location. It's been a great start of day three. Jeremy Austin shuffling into the booth. Adrian Conway, 2017 team champion. Last team to knock off Mayhem Freedom. Jamie Hagia is our reporter down on the field. My name is Joel Godet. Standings at this juncture. Juncture said last team to knock off Mayhem Freedom. Adrian, you were on it. Oh, look at that. Two teams right now ahead of Rich Froning and company. We'll talk about how they can finish the job with Adrian uh, as we go through the course of the day here. But Oslo Navy Blue is your leader right now. 12 points the advantage over the Sea of Green from San Diego and CrossFit Invictus. Muscle Pig is the test at hand. Event number five, we're gonna flip stuff and we're gonna flip ourselves onto rings. Tough old event five to kick things off. Some struggles in the first heat, but four rounds for time. 10 synchronized muscle ups with the four team members. 10 pick flips per pair, alternating for the male and female pairs. 510 pounds for that pig and 350 for the females as well. 232 kilos for the men and 160 kilo for our conversion. Let's talk about the straps on the ring muscle ups here, but this is also the first time, Adrian, we've ever seen the teams use the pig. So it's a new implement for them. It's new and there are specific keys that they need to focus on to have success in this event. And one is that they need to be strategic with their sets on those long strapped ring muscle ups. And second, they've got to have a steady tempo on the pig. They should not rush when they know their backup teammate might not be quite ready. Just be steady. Talked about Oslo Navy Blue being in the lead right now, the team that is trying to knock off CrossFit Mayhem Freedom to stop the mayhem. Well, they have their training partners here in heat number two. Oslo Purple Red will be in lane one as we get set. Greater Heights Ascend, keep an eye on them. Did really well in the strength event yesterday. Open Box Athletics, CrossFit OBA had a ton of hype coming into the games. Mayhem Justice, one of the three teams out of the Cookville affiliate competing here in Madison this year. And there is Oslo Purple Red trying to be the nice second piece to that Oslo puzzle here in Madison. They did well in the run yesterday, really set the time to beat in that first heat and Navy Blue saw that as a red flag and went straight to it. And Greater Heights, fifth in the strong events and that was the exceptional lifting from all team members. Jordan Cook, massive squat. So we utilize that to uh, best efforts for the team greater heights. They already start off with a little bit of a slip though. And it's those little things that matter. Like, is it a huge deal? No, but we've already seen no team finish. So seconds could become really important after just one heat. Yeah, and those slip ups early, they, what they can do is create second guessing as the workout develops. One of the most important things on a team is to have everyone composed and calm. So as you begin something such as a high skill movement like this, you're on the same page. You make the first few reps count. Seeing something we didn't see too much of in heat number one is that consecutive muscle up movements, but great synchronization. Absolute key to this, and we saw some communication really falter some teams in that first heat. Greater Heights, not just shifting heavy weight externally, but body weight, keeping them in front. And it is Greater Heights Ascend that makes their way out to the pig first. Being led by Emily Tanner out there getting first to the pig. I can remember when she was pursuing the individual side of this sport, her and Jordan Cook both. A great history as a, as a regional, back in the day, regional athlete. And Emily's returning from uh, becoming a mother. Her daughter's birthday was on the first day of the games. Happy first birthday, Delilah, August 3rd. Emily was actually the last piece of that team really to fall back together, just had a child. Didn't really know if she would be able to get back to competing. And it was around January when things started to click for her. And 
she was all in on the team. That's Tanner right now who's approaching the pig. 350 pounds on the left side of screen, 5'10 for the men, as we said in heat one. That is about the weight of an adult grown male and female pig. Probably a little bit easier to move. A absolutely. Getting underneath, now we worked the event strong yesterday and a lot of the team members went for a split jerk. This positioning we need to get for the pig once we get the weight lifted or deadlifted off the floor, we want to get that positioning almost like a split jerk, exactly what we wanted to see and that triple extension of ankle, knee, hip. We want that explosive movement, we want that shrug getting up, getting as tall as you can so you can get underneath the pig just like a power clean. So you talk about progression, you can start with a light barbell and move towards something like a pig. If you don't have a pig, you can go back and find an empty truck tire that's lying on the side of the road and practice on that first. But the slow progression from the barbell to this implement has been exceptional. The way the teams have progressed in competition at the CrossFit Games over many years. Lift with your legs, not your back. Oh, true. Absolutely. True. We want that back nice and static. The hips are going to be dynamic and they're going to get after it. The thing that I like the cue with the pig is slow to, fast through. Like that. Patience in the setup and then you got to be fast through the middle to get in that split position. Just don't want to be struggling too much with your arms and lifting with those arms because you're about to go to an implement where you're going to have to need that stability at the top of the rings. We've seen in, event, uh, in heat number one, a lot of teams did struggle with that time under tension on top of the rings. That's Kelly Baker on the left. You've got Kelsey Keel on the right, CrossFit OBA. Those two are actually former teammates at the games. They both competed on CrossFit Parallax's team back in 2016. OBA is in second place right now on the right, Greater Heights is in your lead on the left. And we've talked a lot about the long straps. To be real specific, folks, if you're watching this at home and you train on a traditional rig where those straps are a little shorter, when you execute the beginning kip of your swing, the leverage your body creates underneath the rings to pull you over top of them and then to lock out the dip is much more responsive to your body weight. Here, because the straps are longer, they've got to stabilize more at the top. Bear Complex is the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Make sure you head online, bearcomplex.com, to shop for the best grips on the planet, up to 15% off. Bear Complex, get better. 18 foot high, the, the Zeus rig 20 feet. The rings are actually onto that lower section at 18 feet. And I don't think there's not too many affiliates out there with that much height in your affiliate, some are low, so a lot of... It's a lot of cubic feet. Uh, absolutely, rent. upwards. <laughs> and a lot of affiliates have the rings set up on their pull-up bars or something similar, so it's a lot easier to get on top of the rings. With these straps so long, a lot more difficulty. We do see that in Olympic competition. Jordan Cook just flipped the pig. This is Duncan Milady now going to work for Greater Heights. He is excited for the future of this competition. It's already been announced there will be swimming. Duncan Milady is a swimmer at the highest level. He's just trying to get through this one and then bring it on. He's trying to make it through so he can shine. NCAA champion at Texas A&M, Gigum. Five minutes in to this 15-minute time-capped event. Still looking for a team to finish. Cap plus 16 is what 1855 threw down as the marker to beat in the first heat. And you got to keep that pig within the lane lines. You talk about accuracy as one of the 10 general physical skills of CrossFit and nailing the positioning as his 510 pounds or 350 pounds is falling towards the earth and be able to control the positioning of that. Make it easier for your teammates as well for their next setup. If they've got to go and move that, you're just cutting into precious seconds that they can't really afford to waste. Yeah, you're truly talking about now the difference between high-level success in an event like this and what everyone considers the challenge, right? A lot of people see the struggle of the pig. And watch Jordan angle. Cook trying to get that thing back straightened out. Yeah, you've got to correct it. So the accuracy is extremely important and often underlooked here in an event like this. This is round two of three. Ashley Wozni is now trying to do the exact same thing for OBA on the left side of your screen as Greater Heights makes their way back for round three on the rings. Accuracy being one of those 10 general physical skills. Another two, power and strength. Strength getting it off the ground, but power getting it in position enough so you're not working too hard once that peak does get to 
that vertical position. Here comes OBA. Nicholas Hecht leading the charge. It's interesting, Adrian, watching the time off in between muscle-ups. How these teams recover, not going too soon, making sure that when you go up, especially in this seat, you can knock out at least three, maybe four reps. Yeah, and the, and the big thing that you got to think about is the total work volume done. Do you, is your team going to have a chance to finish this workout? And if you do, you've got to account for the least capable of your athletes through 40 ring muscle ups and what tempo they have to or can sustain throughout an event like this. Greater Heights breaks after two. OBA, that's a costly no rep there. Actually, Wozni did one, Kelsey Keel did not. Communication, you mentioned Adrian in teams before. You know how crucial it is to success. We've just seen Greater Heights then just have a split second break and the four team members have this mini chat just before they go back up for their next sets. Yeah, and that's extremely important it's going to cost you time to communicate, but communication is what allows you to have that success. Hey, checking in. How you doing? We're good? Okay, three more seconds. Take a couple breaths. Here we go. We're going to go do another set of three. What time is more costly, right? Is it more costly to have the communication, or is it more costly to have wished you had had the communication on the back end of it? Right, and, and most often it's going to be the communication is valuable that happens before the mistake. The mistake, you're going to have to wait until you're ready, and you've likely cost three other members a lot of energy. And that elevated chat after the misrep. Increased anxiety, increased heart rate, which you don't want. You want to stay as calm as possible. There's a lot of what I categorize as death stares going across the field when, when that happens. And you got to be patient. The silent communication. But these teams working together so much in training, they should know exactly where their strengths and weaknesses are. And mastering the basics of these movements. If we go back to fitness in 100 words from the old school of CrossFit, it is mastering the basics of gymnastics. And the gymnastics dip is exactly where most of the teams are failing right now. Just had a no rep there for greater heights. We see if OBA can't capitalize. And they will. So Open Box Athletics is going to now jump in front here. And they'll string a couple of reps together. So OBA is now done and has jumped to the front of the pack here and will race down to the pig with five and a half minutes left. And look at the urgency. I, lo I love that, that Nick Height just took it upon himself to lead the charge back to the pig to feed off of that momentum that was just created by that overturn of them capturing the lead. It's a wildly veteran team for OBA. First time competing together though. Joey Tortora has been to the games a couple of times on teams. The Central Beast out of Columbus, Ohio. Kelsey Keels. Yep, a lot of talent. We think about teams recruiting and pulling people in from other locations for a year to live, to give us a chance. Guys, we can go to the CrossFit Games and potentially compete for that affiliate cup, and people are doing it. And this is a great opportunity to see, can they, though, come together and be a cohesive forward? What's going to be their limitation to success? Five minutes left to go in this event. OBA still leading, but Greater Heights right behind. You can see in the center of your screen. Joey Tortora is the bearded one flipping on the right. Bench strength's a real thing, too. Yeah. Now, if we talk about yesterday's events that got postponed, we've got a max lift, we've got some cardio as well with the monostructural element, and then polar opposites with the way they're programmed. Exactly the same today, we've got a strength event, and we've also got some body weight, high skill gymnastics. Muscle up on its own is tough enough. You start with progressions from pull ups to chest to bar to bar muscle up to ring muscle up, and then we've got a sequence four people at the same time. So there's gymnastics progressions as you get harder. Obviously, we can drop that back if you are joining a CrossFit affiliate. We can do something very similar to get that empathy that these athletes are feeling right now. 100%. And when you talk about even the elements here, we, we talked about the strategy, 
as we watch athletes get under and flip this pig, the grip fatigue that builds as you wrap your hands around that to create the force needed to move 510 or 350 pounds is so often forgot. And then as we watch these athletes elongate into a beautiful kip on these long strap ring muscle ups, we gotta remember they're hanging from their fingers again. And the lack of confidence or the struggle that can exist due to that built up fatigue is such a real challenge. I gotta be honest, these OBA ring muscle ups are art. Just the the shape of all of those athletes, the way that they sync those up together, that was three beautiful yep. reps as we show you Greater Heights Ascend now. When we go back to your point, Adrian, about using those hands or those smaller muscle groups, you want to use that core to extremity. So big muscle groups first, smaller muscle groups later, because your smaller muscle groups are going to fatigue a lot faster. So you want to make sure it's internal to external, if you get my meaning. All the time, all the time. And the, the beauty here, what I really see is with this ring muscle up, the trunk is so dynamic because we're opening the hips and then sitting up, almost like a GHD sit up as they transition through the rings. And then when you're flipping that pig, it's so static. Costly. And they have to have such a bracing. Costly no reps for OBA there. Nicholas Hecht missed the ring on the jump up and everybody held. And then I just think Kelsey Keel and Joey Tortora came down too early and then they went for another one. So back to back no reps, killer. And it does open the door for greater heights on the left. When you think about no reps, Joel, if you drop the pig halfway up, that's okay. If you miss a no rep here, it is very costly because all four team members have to go back up again and get that high fatiguing movement done again. Oslo Purple Red is on the left. They're now in third place. CrossFit's are outs in the middle. Rhapsody has been in third for most of the competition. They've now dropped down into fourth. They're on the right side of your screen. And this is where communication is key. Look, we're, we're closing in on quickly having 90 seconds left for them to finish the work here that is demanded of them. They know the race is tight. They know it could be decided at any moment. You've got to know who you're looking to, one specific person on to tell everybody, is it time to go or is it time to rest? Because if you're looking at all three other people, everyone's going to get confused. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that. OBA still does have a one rep lead that is now evaporated. That's good for greater heights on the left. OBA will equal them again and hang up there for a second rep. The communication is really good for open box athletics in that sequence. And also the rings coming down the straps, they control them every single time on the way down so we don't get that wind blowing those straps, even though it is causing a few dramas now. The last thing you want to be doing is trying to battle moving objects, then sequence the bottom of the movement to get that kip right, but they are on song once they get it right. They do call them the still rings in Olympic gymnastics, so try to mimic that the best we can. <laughs> Even though we're going to have those things swinging, we've got 40 seconds left here. Well, gymnasts use this to get onto their apparatus to do their events. It's not actually a movement, it's something to start the movement. <laughs> We use it as a great test, though. 30 seconds left to go. OBA back to the pig. Now, can they do enough work here to catch 18.55 and make themselves the overall leader through two heats? Every one of these reps is huge. And just look at the way that and struggle there for Ashley Wozny, but how quickly she followed Kelsey Keel. Now, watch Keel come in right behind her. Good teamwork trying to flip. That is a good rep for Kelsey Keel, and it just eats up Joey Tortora, so he can't get another flip. But Open Box Athletics throws down the hammer here in heat number two, trying to get themselves back in the mix of things. It was Greater Heights that led the majority of the way. They'll finish second. It is Rhapsody in third for the heat. An event like this sometimes just leaves you in more frustration than it does fatigue. OBA doing very well, but it was all about greater heights. Getting those muscle ups done very early. Their sequencing was very good and some great control. Some great positioning as well on the underneath that pig to ensure they're not fatiguing too much and big explosion of that body and those hips. OBA, a few falters on the muscle ups, but the back end, they nailed it to take back that lead. They will wind up at cap plus seven, so they will actually have the lead here, besting 1855's first heat performance.
caps, and he does so as well. It was cap plus 16, so those top four scores are the top four scores heading into heat number three. Adrian, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me. I had a great time with you guys. 2017 teams champion. Hopefully it'll rub off on, uh, rub off on us a little oh, bit here, Jeremy. God, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need some more. I need some inspiration here. Adrian Conway joining us as we continue with the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games team competition here at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Time for heat number three of event number five on the team's side of things. Some teams looking to make a move into the final heat. Try to put themselves in the best position possible. Heading into event six this afternoon. This is event five for the teams under a bright blue cloudless sky in Madison, Wisconsin. Jamie Hagia has competed on a team at the CrossFit Games. She's our reporter down on the floor. Jeremy Austin, Tanya Wagner has won the CrossFit Games. My name is Joel Godet. Let's talk about what's in store for the Muscle Pig and these teams. Oslo Navy Blue right now is in front. 15 point lead over Mayhem Freedom, the defending champions. Let's not forget about CrossFit Invictus, the only affiliate to have had a team in every games. There has been a team competition. And then Mayhem Independence, could we get two teams from the same affiliate on the podium? Those teams will compete in Heat 4. Here's what's on deck for Heat 3. And they have a nice little couplet here, Muscle Pig of four rounds, synchronized muscle-ups. 10 synchronized muscle-ups for the whole team, and then 10 pig flips per pair. Women and men will each have their own pig, and they have to alternate those flips on the 510 pound pig for the men and 350 for the ladies. 15 minute time cap, no one has completed this event yet. Tough old time cap, Tanya, and the key to success for this is down to the muscle up. They're spending so much time, those strategic sets. You mentioned earlier on, you thought they were going to go out with bigger sets. I did as well. I thought the teams would be coming out with sets of 10, but some of them are down to single reps. So really important to get those strategy on those sets right. And the pig doesn't seem to be stopping anyone. It's just making sure you can get the pig flips done in time to get back, recover enough to get back up on the rings. Start list here, CrossFit Pro 1 Montreal, right in the middle of the field in lane five. Urban Energy was a top 10 team at the games a year ago. 2015, first year Rich Froning was on a team. CrossFit Milford finished second by five points. They're in lane nine. There they are. Led by coach Jason Layden, he had started his affiliate back in 2008. This is six consecutive games that CrossFit Milford has been at, but this exact team, it's their first time here. They're coming off a first place event. Win in strong yesterday. They are strong. They're going to crush this pig. It'll be how they communicate on the rings. And Pro One Montreal, Chloe, uh, Chloe Govan David called herself a diesel truck, said that Maud Riappel is more the F1 to my diesel truck, but Chloe is a gymnast as well. This should be a good event for the team out of Quebec. We expect to see good things from them on the rings. Coming in eight for the Bob event as well. Can they shift right down this North Park as well as they did in event number one? Starts with the 10 synchronized ring muscle ups, and already you can see these teams take a beat. Don't jump up too early. Make sure you're on the same page. If you've ever done ring muscle ups at the games on these high, high frame and the long, long straps, everybody talks about it. It's what you talk about because it just makes it just incrementally harder or exponentially harder to do them. So uh, the wind out there, the straps moving. These teams have already watched two other heats go. They've watched the, the reminder now is just to, as you come down, stop yourself, slowly get the rings under control so that you can be on your own time and not wait for the rings to stop. We've talked about the straps a couple of times, but what does it feel like different when you're on straps that are that much longer than what you're used to in your regular uh, affiliate? Well, the longer the straps are, the harder it is to control the positioning of the rings. If you've got a bar muscle up, for instance, you can just, that's a stable object, you can move your body around that. Now you're moving your body around two separate objects that are moving. The shorter the strap, the easier it is. We try and replicate this as much as we can. We go back to the Olympic Games for the gentlemen doing their ring sequence. 
and their straps are very similar in height. This one, 18 feet hanging off the Zeus rig. No surprise that Camo Athletics out of Olathe, Kansas, got through the muscle-ups quite well. They're the sneaky, fit little gremlins, remember, but how can they deal with the pig as a team of smaller athletes? Struggle for the pig flips early. The foot position is really crucial, and you can't dig your feet under. You've got to get that foot placement done early. You need to extend those ankles, knees, and hips. The triple extension. Well, both Addison and Toya here on the right side of your screen, both they're, they're just, their timing is off and their hand placement isn't there. To be able to get underneath it, they need a little bit more uh, patience and a little more drive, get a stronger deadlift. They need their hips to get back a little bit more and use more legs. They're really just trying to pick this up with their arms and that's going to crush them when they go back to the muscle-ups. People think about doing the split jerk with a barbell and they find that position really easy. Nothing really changes with the positioning of their feet. We see a lot of narrow feet, bottom of screen, with the athletes trying to get this pig up, ensuring those position and minimizing the fatigue, really important. And the accuracy of getting this pig inside that narrow zone up and down North Park, another crucial factor. And it's that composure on your setup, like we said, that's one of the keys, making sure that you have your setup. You don't rush to a barbell and just pick it up for a max lift. You get your foot setting, you get everything in place, lock down, get your tension through your full body so that that first initial drive and that push to get yourself moving is all connected. Five rounds for time here, 10 pig flips down the North Park field with the 10 synchronized muscle-ups. Brought to us by Bear Complex, the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Head to bearcomplex.com, shop the best grips on the planet, up to 15% off. KT CrossFit here, the men have got this pig figured out and they are just moving it so well. The ladies have to straighten some things out, so a little bit costly there. Efficiency wise, efficiency wise. But they sure knew how to move that pig. Kate C explosion through those hips. Big shrug. Powerful. With, oh, to get underneath and just to limit the amount of work you're doing with your arms because you're just about to jump up on an implement where you need your arms. Kate C came in 16th overall, team out of St. Petersburg in Russia. Didn't make it to the games last year because of travel issues. So have waited for this opportunity, got into the States early this year and have been training. They are an underdogs team. They've been training with Tommy Hackenbrook, who knows a thing or two about winning here at the games. He sure does, led Team U back in the day. But what I like to see out of them was their communication right there. Not everyone was ready on the rings, but they just watched and they took a beat. And it looks like the rings are just swinging. I love the descent of the athletes, some athletes having to drop straight down. But also, the other athletes who do have a little bit more control can make sure those straps are, and the rings are not moving around too much. Senia Trubatskaya is the captain for this team. Alexander Plyoshkin is in the black shirt, standing on top of the riser to your right. Ivan Kukartsev is on the left. That's Ivan right there. 23 years old. He is a strength athlete. Gymnastics necessarily isn't this team's strength. You could have fooled me. But you know, muscle-ups anymore at this level of play, it's not about the muscle-ups. It's more the synchronization that makes this muscle-up uh, more challenging. So they've worked together. The volume of gym, we're not back in 2008 or 9. We, we, everybody has them, they're proficient. But the element of keeping it as synchronized movement is, is the challenging part. Well, you think about if you did this individually and you had to do five pig flips and you had to go back and do 10 muscle ups on your own, that's not too difficult of an event for athletes of this standard, but you put those elements together and having to synchronize that positioning at the top of the rings makes it a lot more difficult. And I'm absolutely loving pig positioning for KT. Ivan will get on next at the bottom of screen, second lane from bottom, and his extension, absolutely loving what he's, oh, that pop-up, it's just so easy. Speed through the middle, and it's so powerful. It looks slow almost, Jeremy, when people just watch it for the eye, but you know how much power he's putting behind that. You have to remember, all of the talk that Freedom got, and that Oslo Navy Blue got, and that Reykjavik got for sweeping their semifinals, 
KT CrossFit won five of the six events at the Far East Throwdown, and the one they didn't win, they came in second by 13 seconds. They were as dominant as anybody in their semifinal qualification. 15 minute time capped event. No one has finished of yet. We are on heat three. Second round through of four. Six and a half minutes gone by. Good push there by Pliushkin. Ivan now, this extension pop straight underneath, and it's just like that power clean, so the progression of barbell to either tie flip or pig flip and getting underneath. You mentioned speed through the middle, Tanya. It's just so important to make this as easy as possible. It translates so well to everyday life if you need to pick something up. And that's where if you move well and you're moving appropriately with the barbell and you have good technique and good form, you'll see that bleed over into other areas. So Vaughn really clued in from KT getting that ankle, knee, hip extension into that big shrug, ensuring he can get underneath. Some of the other teams are really struggling with the pushover. Even look look at the way that Aijan Zarazova got under that. A smaller athlete, but it's that hip pop, right? And then she's so quick, like a barbell, it's fast under the bar. Move your body around the object. If you talk about long levers as well, Avant's very tall. Makes it a lot easier for him to get under the weight. Although it is a 510 pound or 350 pound pig, they're not actually shifting the entire weight because it is still resting on the ground, but still heavy implement to move. And another quick break, making sure they're communicating well. I really like that. No, I wasn't ready. Let's drop down. Let's go again. And straps just moving around a fair bit in this breeze now. And that's it. The athletes can use one riser, but that's not always enough for these athletes. Cannot use two risers for safety. They don't want them slipping off one another. So if you can reach with a little, just a point of your finger to keep that. There we go. And then the extra hold there at the bottom to just stabilize the rings. They don't give you the PVC pipe like they do in the affiliate to stop the ring from swinging. How about that teamwork too, by the way? For Kakarts have to come over and say, you know what, I can reach the rings. I'm gonna slow them down for you. You can help. We were there at the team briefing. You're allowed to go over and help your teammate get up on the rings if you need to. Oh. And now everyone's waiting. Oh. And they'll come back down. That's a no rep. And sometimes that's even smarter, right? It's better to not hang out in the static hold for too long. Pro one on the left of screen is in first place right now. KT has fallen off of pace. CrossFit overtake team density is now in second. Poor T has moved into third from Finland. KT just dropping back a little, but they just are taking that extra bit of time on these synchronized muscle ups to ensure that they do get back because they are making up a lot of time with these pig flips. And no surprise here, Chloe Govan David in the gray top, a gymnast originally got out of that because of injuries, but that is her background. And Frederick Dubé just using his size to flip that thing around like it's nothing. 510 pounds. And a, breathe, uh, a breath here for Tristan Leclerc. Overtake has now passed KT off of the rings. Second team to the pig flip here. At the end of round three, we have five minutes left to go in this 15 minute time capped event. Maud Riappel, who is the second female for Pro One. Final five flips for Pro One. And again, it's Leclerc and Riappel, the two rookies on that team, giving way to Govan David and Dubé, who were on the fifth place team a year ago at the games. I love the way she's following the pig down, making sure it's set for the next flip. Leclerc really following that forward. 
I think also stabilizing themselves there yeah. just to breathe. I don't want it to fall back Get on me. Get a breather. Don't want that fridge refrigerator to fall back on me. And a quick pop. Interesting technique. That little pop with that knee. Enough hip extension to just drive the knee up to ensure that it's moving forward enough to just push and drop it down. Ensuring that you're just not using your arms too much. Well, if you know any, if you're familiar with the strongman movement, it is a little bit different with that barbell. You use your knee like that, you use your legs, you hinge at the waist to kind of get that position. It's a strong plant position, you're stable, and you can just allows for a little support and like a regrip. If you do get your feet in position, just like your split jerk, you can rest the implement on your front leg, and it's not going to cost you too much because you're in a solid position of support. That's overtake. Or excuse me, that's KT trying to work their way back into the top three here. But we are on round four of the muscle ups with Pro One Montreal right now in the lead. Remember, Pro One finished fifth at the CrossFit Games last year. And there have been a lot of talk about a lot of teams coming into this season. And the thing that Chloe Govan David told us beforehand, she said, We're Pro One, we're somebody too. I referred to them during the semifinals kind of as the Canadian mayhem. If you go into Pro One's gym, Rock Patrol has signage for days that they have gotten at various competitions. You can never count out Pro One. They might not do it in the flashiest form as other teams, but they're going to go fight. But listen, that's just like any other CrossFit Games division. The fourth, fifth, sixth place teams, they're the ones we're not seeing and talking about all the time because they're not usually taking first in their events, but they are incredible athletes. They're incredible teams. The, they, they are, in my opinion, just the overall ones. If they can consistently be in that area, they are the best. They, they are absolutely deserve to be here. I'm glad they're getting the love right now to shine in this heat. Two minutes left to go in this heat. And especially, it's been an eight-year journey for Maud uh, Riappel on the right side in the black top. She has tried to make this team time and time again. And the biggest stumbling block for her this season when she finally made it, Chloe Govan David said, I don't need you to be Manon Lesseur, who was the second female on the team last year. I need you to be Maud. Go out there and be you. You are good enough. And certainly, yeah, she, here she is at the CrossFit Games leading a heat with Team Pro One. Well, don't give up either. Have your goal. Set your goal, whatever that goal may be, and keep working at it. They have looked so good on those rings from beginning to end here. Now, can they finish? 70 seconds. No team has finished yet. Maud Riappel tightening up that weight belt. You've got time, but you do have to go. Good pop. <laughs> Chloe just gave the thumbs up to the camera. <laughs> the confidence and the ease from the veteran. 30 seconds to go. Pro One has to move here. Time is there, but it's fleeting. They've got company as well. Overtake. Trying to do just that. Boy, those pick flips this late into an event are just moving for CrossFit Overtake. Team Density is doing a great job. Marco Coppola just flipped that like it was nothing. Oh! Eight seconds left to go. Marco Coppola, the driving force of Overtake. Manhandling the pig. Wow. That's an amazing That's finish. Ooh. It'll wind up being pro one, but I tell you what, Overtake also came to play. What a final charge, but Overtake out of nowhere did everything they could through the men's pig to get every rep and every repetition of that pig flip does count. But Pro One showing how to do it on the rings. Oh, I think they, their patience right yeah. throughout the 15 minutes got them there. They didn't rush the first part of it. They got their sequencing right. Really good discipline. That just shows what a disciplined team they are to know their patience, execute where they're where they're dominant and where they can just, uh, you know, excel. And they really stayed that for all four rounds. They did it. But just knowing each other that well. Cap plus three. Pro One finishes, overtake at cap plus six right now. Puts themselves in second position because Open Box Athletics was at cap plus seven from Heat Two. 
still yet. No one has finished, although at plus three being the marker, I think we're going to see some teams cross that finish line heading into E4. Well, Pro One already has a top 10 finish. They took an eighth in Biker Bob. It could be, but there are 10 more teams to take this one on. KT out of the box very quick and maybe a little bit too fast. Vaan, those massive pig flips, that massive extension, so much power and a little bit of rest time for him as well. And a great battle between KT and Pro One. And it all came down to the strategy of the muscle upsets, as we mentioned earlier, making sure we sequence correctly, minimizing that fatigue on top of the rings. And what a great finish. Overtake coming in very late. The females for Overtake, just one pig flip behind. But Pro One Montreal in sync both with muscle ups and big flips. And what a great finish we had. They gave themselves enough of a cushion there from the rings to keep the lead. These are the standings overall prior to event number five. And these are the teams we are going to see in heat number four. Mayhem Freedom, the odds on favorite coming in. They are in third place. Rich Froning's team had not, not worn the leader's jersey since 2017. They're in third. Oslo Navy Blue and Invictus, top of the board. Get to what they're doing. It is the Muscle Pig. Pretty apropos. There's craziness going on later today, but right now it's a standard couplet ring muscle up, synchronized, and pig flips. They're going to do 10 on the rings, all four athletes, followed by 10 pig flips for each of the pigs. One pig for the men, one for the ladies, weighing 510 pounds, 350 pounds. You're going to have to alternate those flips. 15 minute time cap, and it's a tight one. Key to success. It is all about those sets at the rings. The pig not proving too much of an issue but managing fatigue as best you can within your team of four is going to be the key to getting the win here in heat number four, three reps short in heat number three. And the tempo of the pig, you just got to go out and nail it, get back to the rings and rest as you need to. Oslo Navy Blue, middle of the field, will be able to look left and right. We'll have Mayhem Freedom and Invictus flanking them. Mayhem Independence in fourth, looking for a podium position as well as we go down to Jamie Hagia. I spoke with CrossFit Oslo Navy Blue this morning and asked them if they felt any pressure coming in today in that top spot. And with their happy, jovial selves, they responded, no, we're just enjoying the moment. They know they have three more days of competition. And Avon even joked, at least we have two white leader jerseys we can sell for a lot of money when we get back home. You know, the memorabilia market is big nowadays. Got to get those things authenticated, though. We got to get the sticker on them and all that, right? Oh, that's it. Yeah, put them on eBay. <laughs> Something. Yeah. <laughs> put them up in your gym. <laughs> there are those white leaders jerseys. And by the way, CrossFit Oslo does have a pig. They made it themselves. It's made out of wood, but it's an implement that they may have had a chance to use in training before. Third day of competition, they have come in so strong, just physically, but also <laughs> mentally. I love seeing their confidence this year. And here is CrossFit Invictus, Devin Kim, Brittany Weiss in the front there, trying to reestablish as a podium affiliate as they were in 2019. And 12 points behind Oslo, that's it. I mean, their lowest place finish at this point was seventh. Invictus has been around forever. Sent teams here, it, they are just another strong affiliate, and I'm so glad they're sitting in second place right now. And has the bear been poked again? We're about to find out. Starts off with 10 synchronized ring muscle ups. Honestly, you talk about poking the bear, Jeremy. The biggest thing for CrossFit Oslo Navy Blue right now, they cannot have a slip up on this event. You took the leader's jersey off of Mayhem last night. You need to come back out here and stomp on a throat. You've got to assert yourself. We've seen that before in other teams. They come in, they get a lead, and they just rest on their laurels. If I can use a massive cliche like that, and they just let Mayhem sneak back in and take over, and they just continue on right throughout the weekend. Start to Friday, there's a lot of work still to be done over the next three days, but they really need to assert their ascendancy right now. Wow. Ooh. I was just about to compliment how well Mayhem was doing with the synchronization. 
And Mayhem is the first to come off like it was absolutely nothing. Listen, this these movements for them, it is nothing. The, I mean, they really, they work together. They are the best at working together. They know their timing. And really, they just need the points. They need the first place. They have, they need, they haven't had a first place finish yet. So they need that one. Tonight is a crapshoot with the event. We were there. There's a million questions going on. But this is the one today they know they can get. Well, if they can, we spoke about strategic sets. If they can do that for every round, they are going to take a massive lead coming into every round of pig flips. Other teams we've noticed throughout the previous three heats, they've really struggled with their sets and going down to sets of one. If Mayhem can keep doing that, this is going to be an absolute walkover. Volume. When you think of Mayhem, you think of volume, volume. So 10 for them. I I want to know, do they ever train with just 10 muscle-ups? They've all practiced on those high straps. Uh, to them, a lot of teams don't have that depth of just practice here at this level with the high straps together like that. So I'm, I would say these would see the 10 and say, that's no big deal. Absolutely not. Now, Rich just could probably get a little bit more explosive in his hips. And we talk about how much you're using your hips and your core and your trunk when you are getting into your muscle up position. I have, no, I have noticed when doing muscle ups, my abs are sore for days, even though I haven't done any specific sit up work, but that's probably my poor. Sounds like a you problem. problem. Yeah, absolutely I, I just problem. Wanna, I just want to recognize something. Sorry, Jeremy, I'm, I'm ignoring your ab comment. Here's the thing. I want you to recognize Mayhem is walking back yes. to the rings. They are under complete control. It is all on them. They're watching their field. They're only competing against the other 10 right now out there. Look how easy this Dominant. is. Dominant. Did you they notice? Might, are they going to go 10 on Broken here? Because the synchronicity, we've seen teams doing ones and twos all morning long, so they will break there. But that was that was either six or seven strategic sets, and they want to do negative sets as well. What I mean by that is, do if you've got ten to do, you want to go over five. Easier for the brain to calculate, and also a smaller set to finish with. So if you can do a six-four or a seven-three for your set of ten, it's going to make it a lot easier. Rich Froning on the previous set that he did, looking left and right, eyeballing everyone in the team because he's got so much time. Now, even Oslo on the right of the screen in the leaders' jerseys, they're pretty good. In the synchronization. They're not Mayhem. That looked too easy for Mayhem, and they're only going to grow the lead here in uh, heat number, or rather in uh, round number two. So if you think about their first set where they absolutely nailed it, that one was probably a 6 4 7 3, as you mentioned, Joel. As we go along, I think they might do something very similar with their next set, even a 6-4 I would do. And the last one, depending on what the time is, depends on what lead they have, they probably break it up the same way. Or if they're under a little bit of pressure from Oslo Navy Blue, they might even nail all 10 to finish off. Andre Nistler having to do some work there to keep the pig back in the lane here as this event is brought to us by Bear Complex, the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Head to bearcomplex.com, shop the best grips on the planet with up to 15 percent off so rich's feet not getting too long now his split jerk we know is a very good he can get very long his feet are very close together once he does get that pig up got a great shot of it here feet just narrow so if he widens those feet he could make this movement even easier for himself but jeremy i'm not worried about rich it's the ladies over there they're just taking a little bit more time Andrea is having just a little more of a hard time keeping the pig straight when she watch, gets underneath Watch the it. full extension. That one was a little go. bit that was easier. That was, she's, she, she was a lot tighter on that one. As I mentioned with Rich, that foot position, trying to get those feet as wide or as long as you can. Get that stance nice and strong. But look at where the pigs are. Like, they're going back for round three on the muscle-ups. No one else is, relatively speaking, even started round two of the pig flip. You mentioned it on the other round, Tanya, they're just walking, they're under control. They don't need to rush to get back. Then so they can communicate as they're going back. Well, and the eyeball again. <laughs> keep in mind, no team has finished yet. Yes, they will. They are halfway minutes. through, oh, a third yes. of the way through the time. This they don't need to run because they are just so far ahead of the pacing line. Now keep in mind, there are multiple teams on the rings. They're not doing the same round. And now I'm kind of watching where Oslo Navy Blue is in relative to the rest of the field because they're not here at the top. 
We said you have to stomp on a throat if you're Oslo Navy Blue. That didn't mean you had to win, but you can't open the door like an elevator door. You've got to stay in range. But they're probably doing very well in relation to the other heats. And that's a struggle there. They're working way too hard. So here's the thing. They're also getting very tight to each other, and they have to be careful that they don't start bumping into each other and that they kind of get a little more separation from their pigs because now you need to be careful you don't smack your teammate. And Billadell's really having to work once to get those hips underneath. 510 pounds of 350 landing on you wouldn't be pleasant at all. But you've got to realize that these guys are probably doing very well, just not in relation to mayhem, and could come in with a very strong time. Yeah, right. There's only so many points, right? Only it doesn't three. matter how much mayhem beats you by if, if you're second. It's only a three-point drop. Reykjavik right now is in second, though. Move fast, lift heavy is in third. That is the thing that Oslo needs to be cognizant of. Reykjavik in fifth place overall coming in. Move fast, lift heavy is in tenth. This is the third round of pig flips here for Mayhem Freedom. Third flip, Andrea looks real settled in to this, as settled in as you can be with 350 pounds. But looking good, moving that pig. The thing you have to think about with Mayhem and Rich Froning, and Taylor Williamson said this coming in. Last year was the largest margin of victory in team's history at the CrossFit Games. And I said to Taylor, what did that feel like? And she said it was it was weird, right? You're not panicked. You never really felt like you were pressured. There was this odd calm of being so far in front. But she knew it would be different this year because there was such a respect for the depth of this field. And here they are in this position having to fight. Lauren Fisher, we saw her in the Coliseum struggling a little with those bar dips at Left shoulder strapped very heavily, and as expected, I thought the other teammates would go up early and have to wait for her to sequence. They have dropped back to third. Which is not bad. I, I, all really, things considered, All yeah. things considered, I am surprised to see them there. I'm happy to see she was able to do that, but that would be the failing point for them, not surprising. Final round on the muscle Final ups. round. Are they going to go all ten? On the clock. <laughs> The bear has been poked again, and again they respond. This is mayhem freedom. This is what people love to see. This is why they're so dominant. We love when they come out here and execute like we know they can and like we expect. Tony, you mentioned it before, they haven't got an event win. They're going to get one right now. They have the most in CrossFit Games history. 29, this would be 30. That was disappointing. You expecting more? Look at this. <laughs> they Great got teamwork. They got all sorts of time. comes over and just straightens out the rings. They had four on that first set, but no need to rush. They are. They have got so much time. Pig flips you in know front. what? I love it though. Here's the thing. We're ahead. They could smash it. They could hold on. But why risk that? There's, There's no, no need. need to open the door. Just stay in your lane. Confident composure. Don't need to be a hero at this point. So far ahead. The extra two, three minutes, if they do rush for that recovery at the end, is really not worth it. There's nobody here. That was a great call from Rich Froning. It's all them. It is. Oh, wow. They're in their own lane, literally. And, oh, just, I'm loving the communication and patience they're showing right mm -hmm. now. And just, Rich, knowing the experience, looking around, where's everyone else at? He was checking the, the Reykjavik lane, seeing if the team directly behind them was returning. Conway A is looking super strong at the bottom of that dip as well. He's got a bucket load more. Oslo is around Here we behind. go. Rich wants the crowd to <laughs> give him some love here. And they will. The bear has been poked. <laughs> Rich Froning is an angry man here on day three of competition. We knew someone was going to finish, but not by this much, I don't think. I mean, th this heat is the best. We've been seeing the best team, so for them to be so far ahead is just incredible. Nobody came to the pig anywhere near this time. And they're dominating this final pig flip here. No team has finished yet. Not a single one through three heats. And with four and a half minutes to go, CrossFit Mayhem Freedom is absolutely re-announcing their presence here.
You wanted mayhem freedom. You got mayhem freedom. The bear is poked. Froning is back. And an absolute statement from the four from Cookville, Tennessee. Walk to the finish line. It's yours. Stroll right across that line, boys and girls. Oh, what a statement. What a start to Friday. They absolutely demolished that event. Incredible. Mayhem, then specifically a lot of daylight. A anytime you get the guy that programmed the games to come over and say, yeah, that was a good job. Well, listen, <laughs> you've got to think about tests. And the test is out there, and they struggled in the Coliseum with all the teams, and three teams finish. Here's another one. Like, that's what just happened. That, yes. they, they turned in their test, and the teacher just looked at them and went, well, you uh, just screwed uh, up the curve there. Uh -huh. <laughs> well done there. Yeah, good. Left skewed. Uh, Reykjavik is still in second place, and they have three minutes until anybody else comes into the equation. Honestly, kudos to Lauren Fisher. We know about yes. the shoulder, and she has absolutely fought through here like a champion. To not be able to hold on to the big sets like Mayhem did, that is incredible for Reykjavik to be in this position right now. But, who Oslo, Navy Blue, a lot of waiting. This is a problem. Navy Blue only had a 12-point lead over Invictus overall, 15 points over Mayhem Freedom. I'm loving the way that Lauren Fisher is catching at the bottom to protect the shoulder. We obviously know there is an issue there. The tighter those elbows are to her body, the easier it's going to be. Tola just fixing up those rings and straps. If you can see the catch now, the really fast turnover is really helping. Here comes Rakivik. The rings. Look at this. This was the battle people expected in preseason. Second place here, only three points back from Mayhem. They may jump. Jumping from 17th to 5th. And don't leave out Independence is here in the race too. Right next to the different Mayhem team, they're racing. They've actually overtaken Reykjavik by a rep. Alexis Johnson, a good push to Sasha Niemis. Big time strength athlete, Angelo DiCicco and Luke Parker are bulls. They're coming into this event in fourth place. We haven't got a chance to talk about them too much, but they are absolutely having a fantastic game so far. Third in Biker Bob, 14th in Strong, 8th in Fast, and then the P-Bars and Pegboard, 6th. So fantastic start to Independence's games. It's a race for critical points. This is a podium race right here. Team in fifth, team in fourth. The teams in second and third, rather in second and first, are nowhere to be found. And they have to move. Meanwhile, Lauren Fisher struggling to get that pig up. As you mentioned, every rep's going to count, so Tola and Khan need to get finished. And it's Independence that races across in second. All mayhem, all day, here to start Friday at the games. Freedom, Independence, one and two. Now here comes Reykjavik. Solid finish for them. 94 points for Reykjavik coming through, minimizing the damage. They have done well. Wow. Mayhem. Incredible. Iceland and his team bouncing back from a 30th place finish in the Coliseum. And now this is disaster for Oslo Navy Blue. Well, you mentioned it before, Joel. You need to put your foot on the throat. This is not the way to go about it on day number three, even though it is second day. No, the, the team you wanted to put your foot on the throat of turned around and put their foot on yours. Booted you into next week. Invictus is done, so they'll remain in contention. And now here comes Oslo. They're not going to finish. And there are massive amounts of teams from earlier heats that will put themselves between Oslo, Navy, Blue, and that finish line. Invictus with 91 points as well, so they are going to stay up in that top three. Seems like an eternity since they finished. It, it, it was. was. It was, yeah. <laughs> I'm blown away with how fast they were. They moved just incredible the entire time. It is the Mayhem Freedom team. Everybody wanted to see, expected to see. They were able to shine. They walked away with this thing. They killed the muscle-ups every single round. This event came down to all about how your team executed the synchronized muscle-ups. They smashed the pig. No problem here for any of them.
They always had a long enough lead or a far enough lead ahead that they could just walk. They kept their Hari under control. That was their recovery so that they could come back to the rings and really stay tight. They were together the entire time all the way through. They literally walked across the finish line. They were so far ahead. Absolutely dominant. Not only this Mayhem team, but then Mayhem Independence just a bit later crosses in second place. This is what they're used to doing every day. Just like Cookville, ladies and gentlemen. The Chico told us they wanted two Mayhem teams at the top of the podium, and at least in one event, they got it. Heat results, not the overall event results. Keep that in mind. The top four, or excuse me, the top five teams, though, are the top five teams, the only ones to finish. Move fast, lift heavy. Got in under the cap as well. Tip of the cap there. Down to Jamie with free him. Rich, in a couplet like that with high school gymnastics and a heavy odd object, you guys took a commanding lead from the start and were able to hold on to that and even further that as the event went on. What was the key to that win? CrossFit. We've been doing a lot of CrossFit, so we actually got to do some CrossFit there. It was fun. With the muscle ups, we haven't seen synchro all four since 2018. What was the communication like during that, the muscle ups? Well, I was the leak wink for most of the muscle ups, so everyone just watched me and then I just tried to hold on. <laughs> and Taylor, you had mentioned that last year was a little weird and not feeling panicked and pressure, but this year you knew it would be a little bit different with stiffer competition. How does it feel to be in it now? Amazing. Let's go. 100 points for you guys to start the day, your first event win. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, at least she kept that one clean. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, event number five in the books for the teams. There are your mixed results from all the heats. Again, the top five teams are the top five teams, but Oslo Navy Blue winds up in ninth. That's not good when you're chasing Mayhem Freedom, who we know, for the most part, they're going to pull off top fives. Well, Reykjavik moving their way up again. Invictus, important result for them. Mayhem Independence. This top five is going to juggle around. OBA doing well coming in that 10th spot as well. It's going to be a battle for the next three days. Big shake up on the leaderboard. This is a turning point, definitely, and tonight will be as well. Oh, here they oh. are. Mayhem Freedom. Now, the lead is small, but it is a lead. In the white leader's jersey in the Coliseum by six points tonight over Invictus. Navy Blue actually flops with Mayhem Freedom. Independence still in fourth. Reykjavik still in fifth. That is unchanged. And Invictus. Look at them. Holding tight in second place. Fantastic. First three days of competition for them. Oh, we still have so much more, <laughs> though. All the fitness. <laughs> We'll see you at the Coliseum for the teams coming up this afternoon. For Jamie Hagia down on the floor, Tanya Wagner, Jeremy Austin, the rest of our crew. My name is Joel Gadet. Games.crossfit.com has all official results, standings, information, and more. Follow along with us in Madison. The CrossFit Games have so much more to give. Catch you back here this afternoon. Get pumped. What makes a good coach? Well, we, we have the definition of effective coaching, but at the heart of great coaching, first thing is you have to care. And what we try to teach everyone coming into the level one is regardless of the ability level of who walks into your gym, that person deserves a cue. Whether that be someone who 
is coming to their first CrossFit class or a games athlete like Chandler Smith, our ability as coaches and our effectiveness is directly impacted by our ability to have someone leaving our class better and have learned something new than when they walked in the door. Nutrition has become more in the forefront of my preparation and getting ready for the CrossFit Games. Trifecta makes my life easier by taking the guesswork out. I think at the Games there's a lot of things that are thrown at us. Having your nutrition dialed in gives you peace of mind. It's something that you don't have to think about. Trifecta is a great tool to help people chase their goals. My goal is to win the CrossFit Games. You don't get to do what you love if you're in pain. It's a slow. Slow, smooth. Good, back to the middle. And right ear, right shoulder. We're here testing the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games workouts. Rusty's role is to make sure the athletes are able to perform to the best of their abilities so that we can do our part to ensure this year's test is the best that it can be. Great. Here at Arosti, what we do is we find things that are holding you back, things that are causing you pain, that limits your ability to not only work out really well, but to just live pain-free, do things you love to do. We find what's wrong with you, we get you out of pain, and then we show you ways to keep yourself healthy so you don't have to keep coming back to us. Thank you, appreciate it. Here at Proven, we strive to be the best in every facet. So when we created our gym, we knew we had to have the best for our floor. We needed flooring that could withstand the hardest training sessions. We needed the flooring to be durable and reliable. Time and time again, Surface Coat finds themselves being used at the highest levels of competition. So Proven had no doubt that Surface Coat was the floor for us. Ooh, here we are again. I've always wanted to do that. Are you ready to get the party started? We're back, baby! <laughs> While the games are fun and exciting to open, is the reason that I started doing this whole thing. It's my birthday. I feel like I should be able to choose the workout. Four reps remaining for Justin Medeiros. I want to win the games and the team as well. We know they're the best. They know they're the best. They can be beat. This is what all the work is for. All she does is eat, sleep, train. Everything I do is with intensity and purpose. It's kind of a coach's dream. That's it, I am on, constantly in pursuit of helping people reach their maximum potential. Us together, working together, and pushing each other, it's going to be scary. It's really scary. I want to make it back to the games. I want to have my best year yet. I'm ready to run through a wall, man. <laughs> Let's split some be Let's do it. Are y'all ready? Let the games begin.
legend Justin Brenner, originally from Moxville. <laughs>
Day three of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games continues here at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. We are back inside the North Park, and we're glad you are with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland alongside Chase Ingram. Mike Arsenault is down on the competition floor. Event number six couldn't be simpler, Chase. We're going <laughs> up and over. Man, we have a nice little chipper style of getting to that lunge at the end, but you got to get to the muscle-ups and the log. We have another new implement here on the floor. <laughs> you see those tarps over them to keep the heat up, but what we're looking at here, when I see these movements, and I've heard this from a lot of coaches looking at this, is the hips are going to take a hit because what we've already done today, three and a half miles of running, Husafel carries, pick flips, and then at the end with that front rack lunge, it's gonna come down to who wants it more. And those are your keys to success presented by Bear Complex. Let's send it down to Mike Arsenal on the field. Well, the jump over portion of this event is all about showcasing agility and athleticism. And that will start with the log here, 50 inches uh, off the ground. All the athletes will be able to navigate the 25 reps up and over. The separator will be the athletes that are more athletic and more agile will be able to do this portion of the event that much quicker. And that will also set them up well for the box jumps and the jump over the pigs here at event number six. Two heats of 20 men here in event. Number six, Brent Fikowski's a man that needs to start making a move here to get himself up the overall standings. And then lanes 11 through 19 have a handful of rookies, Dallin Pepper, Enrico Zanoni, and Tudor Magda. But Guimajeros, not where we expected him to be at this point in the competition. Not at all. This is a guy who had, you know, his name was in the conversation of maybe podium or at minimum top five but when you look at this event specifically this is very similar to what we saw in the quarterfinals in quarterfinals event number two that was three rounds of muscle ups pistols and ghd sit-ups of 30 30 and 10. a few more muscle ups same ghds but the middle portion is changed with these different jumping implements whether it's over the log onto a box or clearing the pig and he actually tied for first overall with the men's field that he's competing against. So this could be a big bounce back event for him. Guimajeros, as Chase said, coming off a career best finish at the CrossFit Games last year, seventh overall. There's Arthur Semenov. Dallin Pepper, one of the promising young rookies. And there's Baden Brown. And the question is, how have these athletes recovered since the capital run because you had the pick flips that is hands biceps hips you had the run which is a lot of posterior hamstring work as hinshaw was talking about previously but then the the jerry can carry and the husa fell back carry where did everybody fail it wasn't that it was too heavy is they couldn't hold on to it anymore so how have these athletes recovered since then guillaume briand out of france and Brent Fikowski, who comes in in 25th place overall, he was able to move up five spots after taking 15th in the capital. But the field, if you look at quarterfinal two as any type of predictor, Fikowski was in the bottom 10 of the field based off that quarterfinals yeah, event. Yeah, event six, heat number one is underway, and we start with the 12 muscle-ups. Talking to Adrian Bosman about this rep scheme, they've tinkered with that quite a bit, and the range being around 10 to 15, landed on 12, because 12 is, he specifically quoted, that number that is gonna dare the athletes to go unbroken. In their training, no problem. A lot of these athletes are 20 plus unbroken ring muscle-ups. Sets of unbroken 12 is nothing new. However, after everything they've gone through up until this point, knowing what's coming, and the fact that, look, we say this every time we see it on the Zeus rig, the ring strap length has a massive impact on your ability to do these muscle-ups. Just about every athlete finishes those up at the same time. It's just up and over that log 25 times, however you can do it. 67 total score repetitions in each round. And remember, we have the lunge after the three rounds of the muscle-ups. The 
up and overs and the GHDs. Now there's one specific piece to this movement that has to happen or can't happen per se. The athletes cannot lay their torso on top of the log. So you can't just lay an arm around and swing a leg over. So you have to actively clear. And look at the movement pattern. Look at Guy, he's doing a wonderful job. It's almost a pummel horse style. But look, press out to come over. Press out to come over. Where is that gonna come into play after 25 of these? The lockout of the ring muscle up. Guy Mahanos right now through 33 of his 67 reps here in round number one. At the 37 mark, he will move on to the GHDs. Guy Mahanos in the early lead here. On to the GHDs. Guillaume Briant, Tudor Magda, Brent Fikowski, Augustin Rokelme, and Alex Vigno all done with their up and overs as well. Magda at the bottom of your screen, Vigno is in the middle. Now being a three round event, with the volume at which we have for the muscle ups, the speed that the log takes, the, the box jumpers and the clears of the pig, the GC sit-ups is, there's, there's elements of rest in here that athletes can take their time. A lot of times you'll see this, this race mentality. I have to get out fast. I have to be quick between my transitions. And there is enough time built in there just by the nature of the movements and how fast they could be done that you can just afford to sit in cruise control at a, at a certain extent. But it's really, I think, it's going to come down to the rig. I talked to a lot of coaches about their athletes before the event started, and they all had a plan for round one. And to an, to an athlete and a, and a coach, they said, We'll play it by ear after that round because they're not sure. It's like, okay, how do the jumps affect my hip extension? How did the GHD affect my ability to turn over at the top of the muscle ups? And we'll find out that in round number two. Augustin Raquelme is the first man done with round number one through 67 of the 200 and five scored repetitions in this event. And Tudor Magda working his way back to the rings as well. Another 12 muscle ups. Then it is on to the 42 inch box. They can use their feet to land on it, but that's the only part of their bodies that can touch it as they work their way over that piece of equipment. And Augustine Raquel may, relative to the field, looking at quarterfinal two as a bit of a, a, a guide on who will do well. Second in the field to this, and one of his strengths really is high volume gymnastics. So as far as a skill set, this is a very decent event for Raquel May. Raquel May with a couple rep lead over Mahiros, Magda, Zanoni, and Vino right now. Raquel May making his third career appearance at the games. Last year was his best career finish. He was 32nd. There's Guy Mahieros. As Raquel may now get set for the 42 inch box jumps. And again, they can, if you know, rep, you can only get your feet on there. And I was just about to say, I don't think people truly understand how high this box is. 42 inches, three and a half feet, just over a meter in height. And there's a lot of stipulations here is that, you know, it's a big jump. We've already taxed your ability to really extend your hips because of the GHDs and the muscle ups twice. They're not allowed to put their hands down to aid with the landing as well. This is, this is a very tough movement to do, especially after, again, the totality of the weekend. The event that we just had really took a lot of some of these athletes' legs. McKelma continues to lead, but Briant and Zanoni are creeping up on him. At the 104 mark is when he will be able to move on to the GHDs, and he's through 89 reps, is Raquel May. Remember, 42-inch box jumping. 
a guy that you immediately think of on this one who might have a problem is that guy, Colton Mertens, but yeah, and seems I mean, to be look, doing just fine getting, getting plenty of runway there. Yeah, it, it's the nature of the movement, and, and look, you get your strengths, you'll get your weaknesses, but Mertens, that big run-up is definitely something that he needs, and that's the balance of the test. It shouldn't favor one type of athlete as far as a skill set or strength. It shouldn't favor one type of athlete, whether it's their stature or body type. Everybody should get theirs. The fittest person at the end of the day across the divvy of tests will be the fittest at the end of the weekend. Let's send it down to Mike Arsenault there on the field in the North Park. We're just over two hours since these athletes finished the Capitol, and I spoke to a number of CrossFit Games veterans in the warm-up area, and they said to a man that was definitely the top, one of the top 10 hardest CrossFit Games workouts they have ever done. Not really an opportunity for a full cool down or a full warm-up. However, every athlete also told me that was probably the most memorable CrossFit Games event of their careers. Way more people at the Capitol than they expected, and they'll remember that event for a very long time to come. Enrico Zanoni is your new leader. He is now done with his 25 box jump overs and will move to the GHDs. The first Italian man to qualify for the games via regionals or semifinals. And one of our keys to success coming in is that it's all about the hips. And one of the misconceptions about a GHD sit-up is that it's a, a core exercise because that's usually the only thing that gets sore after you do it. It definitely has core, but more in a core stability. What's bringing you up is not the abdominals. It's not the interior part of your core. The abdominals job in this movement is to make sure nothing gets out of place as far as flexion and extension. But watch his legs. As he goes back, he has a bent knee. To drive him up, he'll drive that leg straight. And that's when we say hips. That movement is activating and utilizing his hip flexors. And that's it to the little muscle group. If, if you're just watching at home, sitting down, Take your thumbs outside your belly button and put your middle fingers down. That's really the span of your hip flexors themselves. And that is what's getting taxed and smashed during these GHD sit-ups. Couple it with the jumps, the, the logs, and that carryover into the rings. There's so much unseen interference in this event. It's really beautiful. Zanoni is done with round number two, and he will work his way back to the muscle-ups. Bear Complex, the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. You can head to bearcomplex.com to shop the best grips on the planet. Get up to 15% off. Now starting round number three, 12 ring muscle ups normally in your gym, not after doing six events coming into this time. Ring straps about the height at which you prefer. What we look at is the turnover in that receiving position for Zanoni is really high. Look how high he receives that in the dip position. Most athletes will land a bit lower. We saw Sam Briggs do this so well. And what that does is it saves the lockout just a bit that may be able to sustain you deeper into big sets as opposed to a full depth dip. But at the same time, more effort is needed to catch that high. If you want to climb that leaderboard going... Zanoni has four reps remaining on his final set of 12 muscle-ups. Alex Vigno and Dallin Pepper are back on the rings as well. See Vigno on just to the left. Again, that deep receiving position for the dips, which you normally see. Dallin Pepper on the left needs to be careful because that lockout out to the side and that push back, that's a lockout that we're trying to steer away from. And he, he just got, got a yep. no rep. So good for the judge keeping an eye on that. But you got to really be careful. And that's something you see a lot of athletes default to when they're, they're really struggling to finish out those reps. Zanoni is now on to the box jump overs. You have to clear that pig. It's two feet wide, 20 inches high with every jump. So he yep. got no reps. He has to land with his back to the pig. Yep. So you have to clear it front facing the entire time. You can't twist in air. You got to land in the same position that you take off from. Now, this is probably the quickest, I don't want to say easiest of the three implements so far in the middle portion of these rounds. This is actually where you can gain a little speed on somebody. But those box jumps themselves, that's probably the toughest part of the entirety of this event. Until we get to the front rack lunge, and that will <laughs> that will be the leader in the clubhouse as far as most difficult portion of this. Two Europeans lead here. Enrico Zanoni is through 100 
62 of the 205 total scored reps. Guillaume Briant is right behind him. He's about seven reps back. Augustin Raquelme sits in third, followed by Alex Vino and Brent Fikowski in fifth place in this first of two heats for the men here in event number six, the second of three events they, they will face here on Friday in Madison. And I talked about the interference of the movements between themselves, how the jump affects the hip extension that you need to have an effective and quick GHD sit-up, how that affects the turnover in the ring muscle-up. We have still yet to mention the compounding effect of all three of these going into the front rack lunge at the end. The amount of core stability these athletes are going to need. The amount of front rack stamina and strength they're going to need with an axle bar nonetheless is something we actually haven't touched on. I talked to Dan Bailey earlier who actually tested this event and he had a plan. He's like, okay, you know, they got lines on the field. He's like, all right, I'll walk to the first line. He got about four steps in before that, that <laughs> bar came down. So he said these athletes may have a rude awakening once that bar gets in the rack position. Gilbriel, far side of the field is in second place. Enrico Zanoni is in first. No shirt with the green shorts. And now Alex Vino is on to his final set of 30 GHDs. At the 201 mark is when they will take off on that weighted front rack lunge with the axle bar. It's the same weight we had last year at the finale, where we had three different walking lunges to the finish line. But the, with the axle bar, it, pre it presents a much different challenge. It doesn't sit on the front rack as cleanly. In fact, just getting it to the front rack is a challenge in and of itself. Bar's not spinning. You have to have a pretty big pull and turnover just to get it into position. Here goes Zanoni on his 185-pound front rack lunge. He'll get a rep for every line he passes. Last time we saw an axle bar front rack finish in competition is actually at the 2013 regionals. It was the second to last event of the weekend and to a person, if you ask him what the toughest part of that was, it was this front rack position. If this was back rack or overhead, completely different discussion. But the fact that Enrique has yet to put the bar down is amazing. Zanoni with his first stumble. And this is when you gotta play it where it lies here. They don't have to retreat to the prior line. If they drop it, they pick it up where they drop the barbell where it first hit the ground. And here's Guillaume Briand. You know, if I do my traditional play where it lies in uh, my golf game, I always give a little toe kick closer <laughs> to, that, that to the uh, closer to the fairway. <laughs> Bryant, uh, Brion, pardon me, is creeping closer to the Zanoni. Brion is towards the top of your screen as more men are getting on that front rack lunge, but Enrico Zanoni is about a lunge away, and he is in, and Enrico Zanoni is across the finish line, and he will take heat number one with a time of 14 minutes, 18.12 seconds. Guillaume Briand looking to be the next man to finish. But Brent Fukowski is putting the pressure on him. Fukowski gets his left foot in first, and here comes Brent Fukowski to take second place ahead of Briand. What a gamble by Brent Fikowski. He was at no man's land position of one step or one and a half. He needed to just sent the foot out there and hope that it was enough to get across the line. Here comes Dallin Pepper. He is in. Alex Vino is across. Pepper at 1504.08 seconds. Vino two seconds back at him. And now Jay Crouch has finished up. Seven men have completed this event so far. Guy Mahiros and Agustin Raquelme squaring off here, and Mahiros is going to win that race. 
He smartly finds that giant fan. Here's Raquel May who had an early lead in this heat. And he's going to wind up taking ninth place. Fifteen fifty-eight point zero eight seconds for Raquel May. But there's Enrico Zanoni, who right now has a top time, fourteen minutes eighteen point one two seconds. And this is where he made his move. We're talking to Boz where you can actually make the most ground up or separate yourself from the pack. And he has said it was actually in the middle part on those forty-two inch box jumps. But Enrico. Once he got back to the rings for that third and final round, he only took one break. But when he got to the bar, the distance he traveled on his first lunge set was extremely far. But his ability to stabilize through that entire thing, very impressive performance by Zanoni. Heinrich Hapelein and Tim Paulson, Colton Mertens and Baden Brown have all come across the finish line. That's Andre Uday on the left and Tudor Magda on the right. Uday is in just ahead of Magda. Less than a minute to go before we hit the time cap. There's Georges Caravis. That's Arthur Semenov. And if you haven't been following since day one, Semenov came in with a double hamstring injury and has still been gritting it out event to event. Hoping to get across the finish line inside that 18 minute time cap. And does not look like he is going to make it. 18 of the 19 men in that opening heat finished the event. Enrico Zanoni has the top time, 14 minutes, 18.12 seconds. Brent Fakowski edges out Guillaume Briant at the finish line as four of the top five are all rookies. The top four all going sub-15. Dallas Pepper takes fifth with a time of 15.04.0. Zero eight seconds. Heat number two is set to begin for event number six for the individuals here at the North Park at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Your overall standings through five. Ricky Garrard is pulling away. He now leads Roman Krenikov by 78 points. Justin Medeiros sits in third. He is 12 points back of Krenikov. Jeffrey Adler has moved into fourth. And Lazar Zhukic is into the top five. And Sam Quant has now moved up to sixth. Up and over is event number six. Three rounds for time, muscle ups, jump overs, 25 reps. That changes every round, followed by 30 GHD sit ups. And when that's all completed, taking it right into an 84 foot front rack lunge, 185 on the bar with that axle bar. And these logs that these athletes are going to have to jump over again, their torso can't touch it. And you look at the things that are getting taxed the most, it's like Chubb said, it's all in the hips, Sean. <laughs> it's all in the hips. The hips are going to take a hit if they haven't taken one already after this morning. But with the jump overs and the GHD sit-ups, coupling that with the muscle-ups to bring that into that final lunge, if it comes out to a lunge race, it's really going to come down to who wants it more. And who can go to his happy place to ignore <laughs> the pain to get through this event. 20 men in this second of two heats. Overall leader Ricky Garrard will be in lane number 10. We mentioned Sam Quant. He finished second a couple of years ago at the CrossFit Games in 2020 in Morgan Hill when it was just five men competing in person. Missed out last year, but he is climbing up the leaderboard here. Ricky Garrard, though, has been Mr. Consistency. Two event wins so far. 
and doesn't look like he is going to slow up at all right now. But if there's a wrinkle in the fabric for Ricky, it's compared to that quarterfinal event in this field, he was in the bottom 10 with an event very similar to this. Send it down to Mike Arsenault. Well, at the start of the week, we were fully expecting an Australian athlete to be at the top of the leaderboard in the individual competition. We just thought it was going to be Tia Claire Toomey and not Ricky Garrard. He's starting to reach exit velocity, a 78-point lead here through six scored events. Seventh is his worst place so far, and his confidence is just continuing to build. We're seeing he's almost like a ball rolling down a hill. Every event that he does well in, his confidence just continues to climb. I asked him how he's feeling. Feeling. He's very relaxed. He's taking one event at a time. He says, I don't have pressure. Everyone else has pressure. They're the ones chasing me. 30 seconds. And there is Ricky Garrard with a 78 point lead over Roman Krennikov and a 90 point lead over Justin Medeiros. We mentioned Sam Quant. Right now, sixth place overall, and he's moved up from 26 after event one. He just does it so quietly and so casually, but you know, Quan is one of those athletes that I had in the top 10 as a potential to surprise some people, and he's already doing it in the place that he's in. A little windy there in the North Park, but everyone has to deal with it. And here we go, heat number two. Now, and you can see some guys struggling to get up to the rings there because those things were blown around pretty well. And I was talking about Ricky and in an event like this, you saw at the quarterfinals. This happens every year where we see something earlier in the season maybe rear its head at the CrossFit Games. In 2017, it was the open workout 17.5, but with heavier weights between the thrusters and the double unders. Last year, it was the wall walk coming back with heavy thrusters. We've seen a lot of this over the years, and this is really a beefed up version of that quarterfinal qualifying, qualifying event number two, which was three rounds for time of muscle-ups, pistols, and GHD sit-ups. Already on to the 25 up and overs on the log. Medeiros and Ricky Garrard right next to each other. Here comes Roman Krennikov. Garrard right now has the lead slightly over Olsen, Quant, Medeiros, and Gumanson. Talked about where you can make your move. For this movement, for everybody, there's not a big separator here as far as difficulty of movement or height of the log. It's just your ability to navigate through this without losing ground on the field. But after the second round, we still have the GHD sit-ups after this, and then as we go back to the round. But those boxes on the left side of your screen at 42 inches and 25 reps is a huge opportunity to either separate yourself or fall behind the pack. So when that second round comes up, really keep your eye on how people are going to pace those out. Ricky Garrard and one of the Panchicks onto the GHDs. And the Saxon Panch, and here comes Justin Madera. So 30 reps here to close out round number one. Enrico Zanoni has your top time, 14 minutes, 18.12 seconds. And it's Saxon Panch right now who is in the lead. You can see in the background at the Zeus rig, those rings swaying everywhere. And, you know, to talk to some coaches is that their game plans on the muscle-ups might change, obviously based off their athlete's ability to maybe handle 12 reps. But the other is, is it almost worth coming off the rings and have them swing around even more, the time lost versus the effort gained between taking a break or going unbroken? Saxon Pantic, your leader right now. Ninth place overall after taking 12th in the prior event. So he's been creeping up the leaderboard as well. Just look through that extension on the back part of the GHD sit-ups. A lot of hip flexors involved. Just the, the muscle group that's in charge of opening and closing at the hip. If you just bend over and touch your toes and stand up, that's the muscle group we're isolating on the GHD sit-ups. And that has a dramatic effect on the athlete's ability to turn over on the ring muscle-ups. Panchik, Gerard, Gumanson, Olsen, and Medeiros all done with round one. There are 205 scored repetitions in this event. And Panchik is through 70 of those. 
At the 79 rep mark is when he will move on to his next set of up and overs. And this time it's that 42 inch box. And remember, you can only touch it with your feet on your way over. It's a lot of effort. Every jump for 25 reps. Hey, Ricky on the right side. Looks like he took a break right around seven where Pancheck went unbroken. Medeiros took a break as well. So Saxon Pancheck now to the 42 inch box. 25 reps here. The 104 rep mark is when he will move on to the GHDs. Jorvin Carl Gumanson has moved into second. Here comes Ricky Garrard and Noah Olson. There's so much effort per rep on these box jump overs at this height. 42 inches, just over a meter tall. Just a lot of things are getting tested and taxed. Obviously, we said the hips as well. But just the exertion, and think of it as far as like, okay, well, what, what does the difference really feel like? Okay, well, would you rather do regular burpees off the ground or bar facing burpees when you have to jump over a bar? We're talking about maybe a six to eight inch difference in clearance for the burpee, but it's so much more physically demanding. Your average box height for a male athlete in the sport is right around 24 inches where the highest one's 30. We're adding a foot to that, to this. So imagine how much more difficult that is from say your regular 24 inch box, nearly increasing it by another two feet. Bjorven Carl Gumanson, we mentioned earlier doing Bjorven Carl Gumanson things, just sneaking around and now he's inside the top 10 for the first time after taking ninth in the capital event. Breaks a string of finishes that he had outside the top 20. He was 24th in the shuttle to overhead, the second portion of that event. And then he was 25th in the skill speed medley, but second in Elizabeth elevated and then ninth. So here comes Bourbon Carl Gumanson into the top 10 where we're accustomed to seeing him. Saxon Panchik moving on to the GHDs. Bear Complex, the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Head to bearcomplex.com to shop the best grips on the planet, up to 15% off. Saxon Panchik, the only man on his second set of GHD sit-ups. Uh, as you said before, and just like Boz had predicted, is that where you can gain some ground on the rest of the field, and he has put a substantial gap between him and the field. And here comes Pat Vellner, who has moved towards the front with Ricky Garrard and Sam Quant. BKG's in the mix as well, so Vellner made a very big, big move on those box jump overs. And if you want to think about where does Vellner tend to always succeed the most. And it's events out here in the North Park with really classic CrossFit movements. We have the gymnastics with the GHD and the ring muscle ups, as well as the box jump overs. It's a very good event for Pat Vellner's skill set, but Saxon Pancheck is not backing down as he moves into his third round. 12 more ring muscle ups for Saxon Panchik, trying to chase down Enrico Zanoni's top time of 14.18.12 seconds. Bjorvin Carl Gumanson and Sam Quant, Noah Olson, and Ricky Garrard have all caught and passed Pat Vellner on the GHD portion of round two as Panchik is into round three, third and final round. He's got unbroken the first two rounds. The athletes chasing him has all broke one time. At least between Medeiros and Garrar, but I don't even see them off the GHD yet. Well, here comes Garrard, Quant, and Gumanson, as well as Pat Vellner back to the rings. As Saxon Panchik only has three reps remaining before he moves on to his final set of up and overs, and it's a jump up and over the pig without touching it. 
And it looks like Saxon had broke it six or seven, so he did his last set into two sets. And the backside of the screen just on the right, Pat Vellner, who is exceptional at high volume ring muscle-ups. You know, you've talked about how difficult that lunge was. The compounding effect of what these athletes are doing here in the middle portion of this event is making that of that movement even more difficult. Absolutely, and think of one thing that we didn't talk about. We talk about the movement itself as being a detriment or an interference of the movement. Look at Saxon's body when he lands. Every landing, legs, quads, that landing takes its toll. It's not just the movement itself, but part of this coming off a high box, landing over a box jump over or a clear over takes its toll physically just as much, sometimes more depending on how athletic you are when you do land as the movement itself. Sam Quant and Bjorgren Gumanson on the right side. Noah Olsen is on the left in the gray shorts. They're trying to cut into Saxon Pancic's lead, but now he is on to his final set of GHD setups. 30 reps for him here, and then it's on to that 185 pound axle bar. And Ricky Garrard has moved into third, along with Cole Sager and Bjorgen Gumitsen. Now Pat Vellner is on to the jump overs on the pig as well. Now Ricky looking a, a little fatigued here in the middle portion. And, you know, we saw Ricky at the first event at the Torium Pro. A, a bigger chipper style, but a lot of different movements in there. And, and a lot of times, just depending on managing that fatigue, it's a, it's a delicate balance in an event like this. First and third overall on your screen, Justin Medeiros in third place on the left with 471 points. Ricky Garrard done with his box jump overs. And all he needs to do right now is just stay close to Medeiros and Krenikov. Yeah, you, you can't really concern yourself with what Saxon's doing on the other side of the field. He's so far out of contention, at least for your podium or first place position. You don't want to let that tr trap you into doing something of which your key priority, as you said, Sean, is staying ahead of Medeiros and Krenikov. Saxon Panchik is now done with the three rounds of the muscle-ups, the up and overs, and the GHDs, and the 185-pound axle bar awaits. Time to beat is 1418.12 seconds from Enrico Zanoni in Heat 1. And here goes Saxon Panchik. 84 feet, he'll get a rep for every line he clears. Saxon Panchik right now, the only man onto the axle bar. You saw Saxon switch hand positions in the middle of that, and a, a lot of that is, it's not necessarily grasping at straws <laughs> towards the end, but it's, it's the end of whatever it takes. Here comes Ricky Garrard, solidly in second place behind Saxon Panchik. I like how he just put his hands on the bar and just got it to the front rack position. There goes Ricky, who looks to increase his lead yet again. All right, you saw he had his fingertips on the bar. It gives you a better shelf and rack position, but the fingertips start to, to pink off the bar. And then once that happens, his last resort is just cross it over into that genie front rack position. Justin Medeiros is on to the front rack lunges. Saxon Panchik is going to win event number six. Ricky Garrard and Justin Medeiros in a fight for second. Now for Garrard again, he just has to stay close to Medeiros. If Medeiros beats him across the finish here, he's only going to pick up three points. And here comes Justin. Oh, he had a step, Ricky, back behind the line. So Medeiros is going to come in ahead of Ricky Garrard. Medeiros will take second place in the event. Ricky Garrard will take third. And he will only surrender three points to the defending champ. 
The same shell game we saw Medeiros play on Vellner in the final day of competition last year. Sam Quant and Bjorgen Gumitsen coming in. Quant in just ahead of Gumitsen. Quant is in. That'll be good enough for a fourth place finish in the event. And Bjorgen Carl Gumitsen, fifth. <laughs> just a straight shot down the fairway. Probably used a, a three iron. You know, it doesn't get out the big dog. I don't need to go left into the woods. That looks like Pat Velder towards the top of the screen. So Velder is trying to get back on track here. He can still finish in seventh place in the event as Cole Sager has just come across the finish line. So Velder with the barbell down and he is done. There's Uldis Upnis coming across. Oh. He'll take ninth. Uldis had his legs lock up. To me, that's just a sign of maybe cramping. And there's Yonikowski who's in. Spencer Panchik also finished. Spencer's going to take 10th. Kosi's going to take 12th in the event. There's Jeff Adler and Roman Krenikov. Well, Justin Medeiros was only 12 points back of Krenikov. And it's likely that Medeiros is going to erase that deficit and move into second place overall. There's Jason Hopper. Willie Georges is done. Alexander Carone is across the finish. 1502.20 seconds for Carone. And Lazar Jukic is in. Travis Mayer also finished. Leaves Nick Matthew, Jason Hopper, and Will Morat left on the field. And Matthew will be the next man to be done just ahead of Will Morat. So Jason Hopper has plenty of time to finish. Hopper, who came in in 10th place overall, he finished fifth in the Capital event, but he's had an up and down competition. And he'll be outside the top 20 with this result. That's down to, to recover from that from this morning is a tough thing to do, especially with this event on the tail end of it. Hopper is across. And with that, event number six for the men is done, and Saxon Panchik picks up his first win of the competition. Twelve minutes. 40 seconds flat for Saxon Panchik, the only man to go sub-13. Justin Medeiros is going to pick up three points on Ricky Garrard. Sam Quant will finish fourth, and Bjorn Carl Gumitsen, right where we used to seeing him. Fifth place, Mr. Consistency. Saxon Panchik, we didn't talk about it over the first round, but in the second round, when he got to the box, I think someone told him where the key to the event is to get ahead of everybody. He got ahead on the box jump overs, but he really made a big push after these GHD sit-ups. Had enough time at the end to actually take one break on the ring muscle-ups in the third round. But once he got to the end, only had to take one or two breaks. In fact, he got right to the end, dropped the bar, had to reset and pick it back up. But he had enough distance and enough work done between then and the finish line. That Saxon Panjic doing what we thought we'd see more of across the weekend here in this event. And he is with Mike Arsenault. Saxon, a dominating performance here in event number six, 100 points added to your total. I noticed in the final lunge there, you're switching between the front rack and the crossover. Why? Just trying to get comfortable. I felt like um, just from the muscles, my biceps were a little blown, so just to switch that up a little bit felt good. You've had an inconsistent performance thus far in the competition. You have three finishes inside the top three, two outside of the top 30. What is your message to yourself to bounce back after maybe disappointing finishes and events? Yeah, the big thing was just not knowing those two events. Um, you know, tell me where my fitness is. There's 14 events for a reason and just keep my head up and keep grinding. Thank you very much. Congratulations. 100 points on event six. We'll see you later today. Thank you.
Saxon Panchik's first win of these 2022 Noble CrossFit Games and the second event win of his career. The men are done with up and over. Women, coming up next, stay with us here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Damn, Brian.
Action continues here on day number three of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. We're inside the North Park at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland alongside Chase Ingram. Nikki Brazier is down on the competition floor. Event number six for the women. You go up and then you go over. We also do 12 ring muscle-ups, just like the men. And Adrian Bazin always raising the bar, and this time raising the number of ring muscle-ups. Three rounds for time, 12, 25, and 30 for the GSD sit-ups. The jump over is changing each time. And you look at the interference spread throughout this event. You look a lot at the hip flexors. The hips themselves are going to take a hit in this event and leading off what we had earlier this morning and at the end if it's going to come down to a race on the feet and the lunges it's going to come down to who wants it more those are the keys to success presented by bear complex let's go down to nikki brazer with more on the law Hey guys, these are very basic up and over movements that we perform in our CrossFit gyms and in our lives every single day. But if you watch the men's heats that just went, you probably noticed we haven't changed out any of this equipment for the ladies. So the women taking the floor will tackle the exact same log as the men did, 50 inches high, eight inches around. Pretty high for some of the women that are about to be coming out here. And so we'll have to see who wants it more when they can get up and over. They can use whatever body parts they want, but they'll have to get that out of their system because as the event progresses, they won't have that luxury. Tell you what, the only familiarity I have with that movement is running from the cops after getting house <laughs> parties busted and hopping fences. It's a good life skill to have, kids. <laughs> 19 women in this first of two heats. Sayer Kaya is in lane at number 11, coming off that great performance in heat number one of the Capitol event. But Rebecca Fusile is on the field, and you talked about recovery. She's had the least amount of time, but was part of what will become, I think, one of the more iconic moments in CrossFit Games history. Yeah, what she did this morning was incredible as far as her, her willingness to suffer through the end. But what the most incredible part was the community behind her. We talk about sport being at the top of the pyramid when we look at CrossFit itself. You go through all the gymnastics, weightlifting, nutrition, metabolic conditioning, but sport. We separate that so much from the affiliate side. And this is where the affiliate community came and bled into the, the DNA that is the sport of CrossFit. Rebecca Fusilier now has to shake off the ordeal as all of these athletes do that was the capital event and find a way to get through this next challenge that begins with the 12 ring muscle ups we are underway opening heat for the women here in event number six the second of three events that they will face here on friday and they still do not know what the challenge that awaits them tonight is. And when you look at this event relative to say the men is the, the ring muscle ups are definitely going to be a much bigger factor for the women than the men. One reason in particular is just they're just doing the same volume. Over the last decade, there's always been that, you know, if it's 12, maybe it's nine. If it's 10, maybe it's seven. That kind of difference between, but they're all doing the same number. And so navigating through that will be the bigger portion of this event as far as who will succeed and fall behind, as well as, look, uh, the, the log over, that's staying at the same height, but when you look at the boxes, they're a little bit lower 30 inches, but it still doesn't change the importance of the box being a big separator with this group. Freyova, Mikulishin, Gazan, Colin Brander, the Moose Brugger, and Karatala Sanahuyu are all on to their up and overs. Danny Spiegel there as well. Freyova leads, sees through 19 reps. At the 37 mark is when she'll be able to move on to the GHDs. Now, one thing to consider if you look back at the semifinals, when one of the standardized events across all of them was the legless rope climb event. So all of these athletes have been vetted as far as having pull-up endurance, or at least upper body pulling endurance and upper body pulling stamina. So this is a field that appropriately has been tested and vetted to fare somewhat better on the ring muscle-ups than not. Caroline Spencer on the right, she and her husband Austin competing here at the CrossFit Games together, the fifth married couple to be competing together 
at the games in the same year. Now we mentioned that the box height is different for the women, 42 inches for the men, 30 for the women, but has not changed is the height of this log. So it was a mere formality for the men. They can just kind of pummel horse clear over. But for this one, this is a much different physical test for the women than it was for the men, being the same height log that they're working on. Karen Freyova is the first woman done with those up and overs. Rebecca Fusile in second place right now. She's on the GHD in the background. And Bailey Rail moving to the GHDs as well. Freyova's best finish was a 20th in event number one and then the second part of event two, the shoulder to, to overhead portion of that event. What do you think of two completely different athletes when you look at Karin Freyova, Freyova and Rebecca Fuslies? Freyova sitting at 5'10", Fuslies is just right at 5'2". So the advantage and disadvantage they have are completely different out here on the field where Fuslier may be better at, say, high volume gymnastics. Freyova can use her size and athleticism to navigate the jump portion of this event to take advantage of that. Fuselier is now your leader, and she was a former level 10 gymnast who started cross at 13 years old. So the rings are going to be no problem for her, and she did very well on the up and overs over that log. And the question is, when we cycle back around, how's the box height going to fare for her? The 67 rep mark, she will move back to the rings to begin round number two. Fusilay is done with round one. Bailey Rail has now finished up her GHDs and has moved into second place. Karn Freyova will be done with one more rep. So right at the four minute mark after round number one. And we're just talking about that 39th place finish in event for number five might be the, the most celebrated 39th place finish in the history of the CrossFit Games. Just what she had to endure the entire time because there was no time cap for this morning's event. Everyone, it was demanded that they finish this event, and she did. And she did it the hard way because Fuslier, if you guys didn't watch, it was a 200-meter Husafel carry from start to finish, where the second half was up the stairs. On the first half, you could carry it any way which she wants. She bear-hugged that the entire way. She did it the hard way, and it took her the longest time. But to come back in this event and be in the position she's in now is remarkable. Fusile is through eight of the 12 muscle-ups here in round number two. Bailey Rail one rep back, as is Karin Freyova. Rail back to work, and she will now tie Fusile for the lead. And with that rep, she will overtake her. That's nice. She looks very good on the rings up into this point. We've got a couple of hands. And this is something we've seen, Sean, as you look on the left, her finishing places, most athletes have been all over the place. There's not really been the most consistent athletes except for the ones that you see at the top, but it seems like almost like everybody has, has one event just right outside the skis. Bailey Rail is a former collegiate golfer. She played at Drury University. And in high school, she qualified for the Class 4A state championships in three of her four years, and she was 16th at the state tournament in 2013 and was third at sectionals, second at district, and was second at the Central Ozark Conference tournament. So better than us. That's essentially what I'm saying. <laughs> Shoot, my four-year-old son's better than me. I am <laughs> terrible at that sport. You and me both, my friend. <laughs> 104 reps is when Bailey Rail will get to move on to her second of three sets of GHDs. This is the 30-inch box jump up and over. Your feet can't touch it, but no other part of your body can make contact as you work your way over. I like what Rebecca's doing on the right. She's landing low. I mean, she doesn't have to jump nearly as high to get on top of the box. It's more of how high and how quick can you pull your knees up. And that's just going to limit the amount of exertion you do each and every box jump. And when it comes to a box jump over, where the requirement different than a box jump is that you do not have to stand up all the way. Being able to stay low is just one way to conserve your energy. Bailey Rail is your leader. She's on the bottom left. Rebecca Fusile, Karin Freyova, and Victoria Campos. 
Along with Alex Gazana, the athletes behind Bailey Rail. And Rail now moving to the GHDs for her second round of 30. Bear Complex, the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Head to bearcomplex.com to shop the best grips on the planet. Get up to 15% off. Bailey Rail and Rebecca Fusilay continuing to lead the pack here in the opening heat of event number six for the women. Here comes Card Freyova. And keep your eye in the middle where Rebecca Fusile was, is that her cycle rate on these GHDs is re really where she got ahead of both Freyova and Rail. You can see her on the right side of your screen. Being a smaller athlete at five foot two versus Freyova and Rail, who are both at five foot seven, is that she's using that size and quickness to her advantage on a GHD sit-up where really cycle rate is your biggest asset as far as getting off this before other people. 134 reps is when round two will be done. And Rail has three to go. She and Fusile have really separated themselves from that pack. Well, Bailey Rail is done, and she is heading back to the rig, and here comes Rebecca Fusile. Still plenty of athletes on those box jump overs. Amanda Barnhart is one of them. She's in the black top there. And you, you, we talked about the ring moss-ups really being the premium movement that's going to dictate who does well and who doesn't in this event. And if you look back on, you know, one of the things that Amanda Barnhart has always been trying to improve in its high-volume pulling gymnastics. And, you know, that may be really the separate. I don't see, you know, she's, a, she's an athlete, right? Getting over the, the log, the box, I don't really see that being an issue what she's going to do with the barbell at the end, but how she's working through these ring muscles might be the crux for her. Bailey Rail has five reps to go in her final set of 12. Fusile is creeping up. And now she is tied with Rail. And she will take a break with five remaining. Karn Freyova in the background, beginning her third and final set of ring muscle ups, and then closest to the screen. That's Victoria Campos. Here are your top two women, Bailey Rail on the left and Rebecca Fusile on the right. And if you look at the three, if they all get to the lunges right around the same time, which they may, right, you're going to see Rail and Freyover maybe maybe get ahead of Fusile before they get to the box jump overs, maybe extend that a little bit. For Rebecca, she's going to have to keep pace here as close as she can. And she maybe need to make a bigger move when we get to the clear overs because that barbell, I think, may be the toughest part for Rebecca versus the other two. Rail onto the jump overs here on the pig, two feet wide. And you have to land with your back facing the pig. Yeah, that, that, that's a big stipulation there because a lot of athletes, will, you know, they'll try that. We just see that on bar facing burpees all the time. Even burpee box jump overs to a certain extent is, oh, can I save a little time by twisting in the air? The answer is yes, you can. As far as here's concerned, it's out of the question. You got to stay facing the same direction as you do when you take off. Fusile is done with her final set of ring muscle ups and she will join Bailey Rail on the final up and overs. And remember, you have to clear that pig in one jump. Feet can't touch the top. And watch rail at the bottom. It's really just a turn, keeps that plant foot there, and she steps into where Rebecca takes one or two steps away and then walks back. It's a little bit of a running start. It does help the jump itself. Elena Caratella-Sanahuya in the background has Moved up into third place. Karn Freyova now on to the up and overs as Bailey Rail moves to the GHDs for the final time. At the 201 rep mark is when she will move to the 125 pound axle bar and lunge at 84 feet to the finish. Rail, one of those mayhem athletes, and you know, this is a movement they just you know, fall out of bed doing. 
their, their buy-in to joining the program is 200 for time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not. But maybe. <laughs> Elena Caratalas on Ahuya has now passed Fusile for second place. Victoria Campos sits in fourth, and she has passed Karin Freyova as Bailey Rail. Is still the only woman on her final set of GHDs. She has five remaining. Put a hand in the air for Bailey Rail. So now we also have a new second. Eleni. There it is, Kiki. Ding dong. Here goes Bailey Rail onto. The 125-pound axle bar, 84 feet between her and the finish line. Now that, that move she's had in putting on the weight belt, and that's there to help stabilize her midline through what is going to be a very taxing movement. Having that bar on the front rack, doing walking lunges after all the jumping you've done, after 90 GHD sit-ups, that midline is absolutely smoked, not to mention everything that she did this morning up until this point. Fusile, Karatala, Sanahuya, and Campos are all on to the GHDs, and now Kara Freyova is getting started on those, but it's Bailey Rail who is way out front here in the first of these two heats. Saxon Paxchet was talking about that rack position, and if you look at the arms, right, hands in contact with the axle bar, but the the action on the bicep itself to make sure that bar doesn't slide off the front part of your shoulder is massive. And after all the ring muscle-ups and the bear hugs that they've gone through up right to here, is that he, he said it's like the arms are just smoke, which is why he went to that crossover position in the front rack. But Bailey Rail. I mean, I did not expect anybody to go wire to wire. But Bailey Rail has not put the barbell down. And she is the only woman on this portion of the event. And Bailey Rail is going to take heat number one. Impressive performance from Bailey Rail, 14 minutes, 15.70 seconds. Rebecca Fusile and Elena Caratala Sanahuya are on to the lunge. Sanahuya just put the barbell down. And here comes Fusile. And my question was, is how is she going to handle the bar at the end part of this lunge? And the answer is pretty darn well so far. And give Rebecca Fusile a ton of credit for being able to bounce back from what she went through earlier today and come out here and perform in event number six. Impressive so far for her. And yeah, Victoria Campos, who's creeping up on Fusile. You know, this is the, the ultimate test of fitness here at the CrossFit Games, but a lot of the things you look for is those silver linings when things aren't exactly going your way. And the one thing I've seen from Rebecca, as Campos is closing out here, is she's just, she's tough, right? There's no quit element in there, and you got to put a lot of respect to that. And you can see is the grip is just gone. And fights through it and is able to get that barbell into the front rack position. Position. Karin Freyova is on the left side of your screen. She is starting to put some pressure on Fusile, but Fusile is doing everything she can to hold on to this thing because getting it up to her shoulders has been a problem. And the problem is she can't see anybody behind her, so she's just got to do everything she can to get across the line. Fusile is in. Wow. Girls got guts, man. Fusile is going to take second in the heat. For a second, it looked like Ellie Turner come across, but that was not the case. Was Fusile in at second place, 1555.70 seconds. Here comes Paige Powers on the left side of your screen. Race to the finish, and Ellie Turner is going to win. Freyova, pardon me, is going to win that. Paige Powers is in. That is Elena Caratala Sanahuya, who looks to be the next to finish. Julia Cato also finished, and Victoria Campos 
is across. Elena Karatala-Sanahuya is done. Alice Gazan finished just ahead of her, and there's Sydney Mikulishin who's in. Or probably Freya Moosbrugger who came across. Sayer Kaya, and now here comes Danielle Spiegel. Kaya was able to finish. Here we go. Give it up for Danny Spiegel, ladies and gentlemen. They have about 20 seconds to go. Ellie Turner, I think, is already across the finish line. We just don't have a final score for her yet. Amanda Barnhart also finished up as well. There's Elisa Fuliano, who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis eight months ago and realized that her window to make the CrossFit Games was shrinking, and she had to pour everything she, in, she could into it this year, and she made it. But it's Bailey Rail, 4.15.70 seconds, who's your heat winner. And it was a... Battle between Rail and Fuselay for the majority of that event. And beginning it, Freo was in the, the factor there at the beginning, but after that, Rail took over on the third set of ring muscle ups and then really extended her lead after these pick cl clear overs. And then Rail, once she picked up the bar, she went end to end on the front rack walking lunges. And that's got a you know, be in the back of some of the athletes' mind in heat number two of what it may take to get a top time in this event. A Bailey Rail, 14, 15.70 seconds, the only woman to go sub-15. Rebecca Fusilet, 15, 55.70 seconds. Freyova, Powers, and Cotto rounding out the top five. Moving on to the second and final heat for the women as we get things reset at the North Park here. On day number three of competition for the individuals at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games from the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Sean Wither alongside Chase Ingram and Nikki Brazier down on the field. Overall standings, all is now right with the world. <laughs> Tia Toomey by two points over Mal O'Brien. Emma Lawson sits in third and Haley Adams has moved into the top five. Daniel Brandon now sits at fifth, tied in points with Christy O'Connell. Event number six, up and over, presented by Bear Complex. Three rounds for time, 12 ring muscle-ups, 25 jump overs on three different implements, the log, box jump overs, and pig clear overs, followed by 30 GHD sit-ups. After all of that, a 84-foot axle bar front rack walking lunge to the finish line. Now I said it was all about the hips, but for the women's side, it actually may be all about the dips because the ring muscle-ups is gonna be a big separator. And I tell you what, keep on, keep your eyes on Tia Toomey, who I think may actually try to go unbroken every single round, and who wants it more at the end? Tia Toomey will be in the leader's jersey. She will be in lane number 10, looking to widen her lead over Mal O'Brien in this event. Mal O'Brien will be right next to her in lane 11, but in lane number 12, Haley Adams, who as we mentioned, is now inside the top five. Tia Toomey is where we are all used to seeing her on top of the overall standings, but only by two points. Let's go down to Nikki Brazier. Now you mentioned that Haley is now inside of that top five, and the real question is, she's in a precarious situation. Is she, and how is she going to be able to come back from what we saw earlier this morning at the Capitol? If you remember, she came out looking really strong in that run and was one of the first female athletes to get into downtown. But when it came to some of those heavier elements, started out 
strong, but ended up losing her grip a little bit. And we have all been there in the gym when your arms give out, your shoulders give out, and you need to grit through that mental toughness just to get to the end of a workout. A couple things we do know about Haley, she trains with Mayhem, she trains with Rich Froning, which means she trains not only her physical strength, but her mental strength as well. We'll see if it works. Haley Adams is masterful on the GHD. And through this grunt work style in the middle, I think this does play to her strengths a bit. It's just how are these ring muscle-ups gonna fare for her after that absolute collapse that we saw in the previous event just because of overall arm and grip fatigue. And when you talk about toughness, you have got to talk about Haley Adams. Think about a couple of years ago at the ranch in Aromas oh, where yes. she did Atlanta and her hands were just bleeding profusely and she gutted through the whole thing. She also ran through the hills of Aromas on what is a, a disastrous ankle injury. So I, I really, after the 2020 games at the ranch, I cannot think of many people tougher than Haley Adams. Well, Tia Toomey is your leader early here on these first set of 12 ring muscle ups. She has done it, she'll get right to work on the log. For Tia Claire Toomey, not having the best start that she obviously would have wanted coming into this, getting the leader jersey, it took till day three, basically, to get to it. This is an event where Tia can reclaim basically her dominance over the field. There's really nothing in this event that's gonna trip her up. Her ability to do high volume, high sets of unbroken ring muscle-ups is second to none in the women's field. That was no more evident last year in that ring muscle-up, bar muscle-up event that also had pig flips in it. So I could see this being that the last time we have to talk about Tia maybe stumbling towards the end. 25 reps here. At the 37 rep mark is when they will be able to move on to the first set of GHDs. And Tia Tumi continues to lead here through 32 of the 67 reps in this first round. And now Tia Tumi will move to the GHDs. The Toomey's only stumble was in the skill speed medley. That's event three when she finished 23rd, did not even make it into the second round. And it is such an odd stumble when you think of the, the one movement that gave her that place finishing and it was single unders. But the amount of points that she lost because of that, I almost liken it back to 2018 where a sandbag fell out of Matt Fraser's backpack and he lost 45 points because of it. It wasn't a, a measure of him not having the ability to do well in a certain event. It was something as simple as a single under. 75 single unders unbroken is the reason why she was in the hole that which she was. Tia Toomey cranking through these 30 GHDs at the 67 rep mark is when she will be done with round number one and she will make her way back to the rig. Mal O'Brien sits in second, followed by Emma Lawson, the two women immediately behind Tia in the overall standings. And there is Haley Adams as Tia Toomey is out front, back to the rings, second set of 12. Tia went unbroken on the first set. Now, last year, there were 48 ring muscle-ups in the middle of the chipper on day number one, and it was a split between ring muscle-ups, double and bar muscle-ups, and back to the rings. She went unbroken on all of those sets of 12, so this is nothing new as far as set number that Tia Claire Toomey is not used to. Mal O'Brien and Emma Lawson were also making their way back to the rings, as is Haley Adams now and Christy O'Connell, but Tia Toomey continuing to lead. 79 is what she's got to hit before she gets back to the 30-inch box for the jump overs there. You see the, the straps, just the length of them makes this movement much more challenging than, say, what you would, a normal setup you would have in your gym. And she will go unbroken. Toomey moves to the 30-inch box, 25 reps there. Time to beat Bailey Rail, 14 minutes, 15.70 seconds. 
I like the hop off the middle of the box. She's not spending any time in the bottom. You'll see some athletes that'll the land wide, stay low, and step off. But that little spring off, it's there's a give and take. It's faster off the box, maybe a bit more demanding on the quads and the legs, especially in the landing part versus, say, stepping off the box. But the cycle rate is much quicker. Christy O'Connell has moved ahead of both Emma Lawson and Mal O'Brien for second place right now. Lawson on the left side of your screen, O'Brien on the right. You know, we may see, may be seeing you know, the future of our sport surrounding the greatest to ever do it. You know, not knowing how much is left in Tia's career, seeing what the future could look like on either side of her is pretty cool. Toomey gets to the 104 mark, that's when she'll move on for her second set of GHDs. Look at the cycle between on the left side of your screen with Emma, Mal, and Tia, and what the difference you see on the right side with Chrissy O'Connell taking a bit more time in between reps. And as you said before, you can really extend the gap on everybody. The best opportunity is really on these box jump overs. Toomey into the GHDs for the second time, 30 reps here. Bear Complex is the official grip of the Noble CrossFit Games. Head to bearcomplex.com to shop the best grips on the planet and get up to 15% off. Toomey's got to get to 134 before round two is done. We're talking about judging at the CrossFit Games or anywhere. It's such a stressful job, and really, unless you have to judge someone like Tia Toomey. Same Honest. deal with Rich Froning. Rich Froning, Matt Fraser, all the greats. That was, uh, you always thought it might be the stre most stressful part, and it tends up being the easiest one just because they move so well. Tia Toomey's career began back in 2015. She has never finished lower than second at the CrossFit Games and has 34 event wins in her career. I don't think I've done 34 workouts this year. <laughs> Her coach and husband, bottom right-hand side of your screen in that light blue shirt, that is Shane Orr. He looks as comfortable and relaxed as always. I'm sure that man has lost no sleep over the last two days. <laughs> and Toomey back to the race for the final time. Mal O'Brien and Emma Lawson in second and third, and Haley Adams is in fourth, followed by Danielle Brandon. Toomey's gone unbroken through her first two sets. You know, a trick when you're using long straps is what T is doing very well. And watch her gather herself at the base of the ring dip where she squeezes in really tight. A lot of times when you have smaller straps and that's not an issue, you can kind of land and press out immediately. But watch her turnover. She'll land, secure, and then separate the dip portion where if it was shorter straps and less less length on the, on the straps themselves is that she'd be a, a lot quicker out of that dip. But if you're too fast, you can fall through. It can slip out much easier on these long straps. Tia Toomey got through eight reps before she took a break, and now four reps remain for her. She was 30 seconds ahead of Mal O'Brien getting back to the rings. Emma Lawson is now back, as is Mal O'Brien, on the right side. And Tia Toomey moves on to the jump over the pigs. One hundred seventy one reps is the number that Toomey is looking to hit before she gets back to the GHDs for the final time. Time to beat again is Bailey Rails right now. Fourteen minutes, fifteen point seven zero seconds. Let's see what T is doing is she's stepping into the jump every time, but she's leaving a plant foot there. She'll land, keep that plant, pivot on it right in front, saving seconds. When you're in a stacked field like this, is very valuable. It's one of those things where if I can save five to ten seconds just by doing something that simple, as far as transition between the reps, is something that would be much beneficial at the end. Mal O'Brien making her way to the pig. And she is still in second place here, but Tui has a sizable lead on the youngster. 
And the next generation is really starting to take over 15 rookies on the women's side. Three of them are teenagers. Toomey on to the GHDs for the third and final time. Christy O'Connell and Emma Lawson are now on their final set of up and overs. Toomey with 10 to go. Mal O'Brien now into the GHCs for the last time. Tia Toomey is done onto the 125 pound axle bar. 14, 15.70 seconds is the time to beat, and Toomey's got plenty of time to get in inside of that. As now Emma Lawson is now approaching the GHDs. Nobody else is there, but here we go. She is lunging it out, Joshua G. We are looking to go unbroken. Bailey Rail did not put the barbell down, and I don't think Tia Toomey's going to either. No, when, you, when you've been sitting behind the pack and having everyone, including us, asking, you know, what's wrong with Tia? Is this it for Tia? Are they going to beat it? And the one really easy way to quiet the noise other than putting on that red and white is to come out here and do this to the field in the next event once you got back in the top of the leaderboard. Taking a second to adjust that barbell. And here comes Tia Toomey. And now a quick break, but she is so far ahead, that's just a minor inconvenience. Kids, mom's home, and I think playtime is over. <laughs> 11.58.92 seconds. Now here comes Mal O'Brien. Looking to only surrender three points to Toomey. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter how much you win by. I mean, it's the old Fast and Furious rules. It doesn't matter if it's an inch or a mile. When here, you can beat me by a mile, but if I'm right behind you, it's still three points. So at the end, if Mal can get across the finish line, she was only two points back coming in. She's only going to be five points back going into the final event this afternoon. Mallory O'Brien with a couple of athletes in her rear view. She wants to take second. Emma Lawson is on to the lunge. One more lunge should do it. And Mal O'Brien is in. And she is not going away easily. Now Haley Adams is on the lunge. And she was getting close to Emma Lawson. Danielle Brandon also on to the lunge. And she's behind Emma Lawson by 15 points on the leaderboard, so this is big for Lawson, not surrendering, surrendering anything to Haley Adams. Lawson's going to take third in the heat and third now in the event. Haley Adams looking to catch Danielle Brandon, and this will be a race to the finish line. Haley is going to get there first. She Fourth Did she just place. come out of her shoes? <laughs> Did I see a shoe? Fourth Did we place lose for Adams. Shoe? Daniel Brandon is going to take fifth, and Cara Saunders is now across. Matilda Garns finishing up as well. Here's Ariel Lowen. Man, that's big for Haley to get ahead of Daniel Brandon if it is official because she was only clear of her by three points. She did. She <laughs> Here comes Paige Semenza. 
And Semenza is now done. And Ariel Lowen has finished up. Chrissy O'Connell finishing up. And Lucy Campbell in a race with Laura Horvath, and Horvath is going to edge her out. Lucy Campbell. Campbell getting it done right behind Horvath. And Jacqueline Dahlstrom is done. Emma McQuaid across the finish line. As is Alexis Raptus. So Megala, Helga Dotter, Prevo, Wells. There it is for Megala. And Barnhart, now as Megala comes in, are the only women left. Turi Helga Dotter is across. Here comes Carolyn Prevo. And Prevo shakes off a near stumble and she gets across. Now Brooke Wells. Uh, we said it was a high volume set of ring muscle ups. And after the injury that Brooke Wells suffered last year, the recovery time it takes and some of the last things she's able to do is something like high volume ring muscle ups. In fact, when they appeared, in the quarterfinals, she really wasn't sure how it was going to hold up. It was one of the last movements she got cleared to do. And when you have this, that was already not a strength of hers prior to the injury. And to be off of that training for near a year, it's no surprise to see that be a struggle for her here, just as a product of the, the rehab that she's had been doing since that injury. Amanda Barnhart is still on the field. And she is on her final set of up and overs. Obviously clear frustration. in 16th place overall. She was seventh in the last event. And you wonder how big of an effect that had on her. Well, traditionally, when you have that amount of running in, in an event, it's not necessarily in her wheelhouse. I mean, she's she has that swimming background, so obviously metabolic conditioning has never really been a problem. But the toll that thing, that event this morning, I mean, the carnage that we saw on the front steps of the Capitol, with those Husafel bags and the totality of that event and your event and the ability to recover. And we said the, the fatigue level of the arms, the grip, the forearms, the biceps to navigate through the end of that event. And for Amanda, as we said earlier, is that high volume pulling, especially ring muscle ups, isn't a strong suit for her. This might have been a, a bad combination back to back for her. Now, Tia Toomey from the get-go making a statement. Yeah, and that's exactly what she set out to do. And a statement she made, as well as how, say, how it looked on the field, however, how it looks on the leaderboard, not much of a difference because she only got three points on Mel, if which she'll only have a five-point lead going in, and Daniel Brandon in the back dropped the bar at the line, had to take an extra step, and Haley Adam comes out of her shoe. <laughs> get that thing off me and get me across the finish line. So a huge finish for Haley Adams to keep herself within distance of that elusive podium position for Haley Adams. Tia Toomey a minute faster than Mal O'Brien, but like you said, she's only going to pick up three points. On the Rookie of the Year from 2021, Emma Lawson finishes in third. Let's send it down to Nikki Brazier. Tia, you were able to pull ahead early in that event, but you were flanked by the Young Bucks on your left and right who are coming for your title. How does that affect your strategy? 
Oh, it's great for the sport and it's awesome to see that we've got some hungry, hungry competitors. Um, and yeah, it just makes for a good competition. Definitely. Now, earlier this morning, we saw arguably one of the most iconic events that we've ever had here at the Games. You were in downtown Madison on that run. In the context of your career, how does that event rank? You know, every year there's a special event. Last year, I think paddling across the lake was really special. And then obviously going up to the capital today, it just creates memories for the sport, for your athletes, and um, it's just great to be a part of. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Tia Toomey with her second event win of the competition and the 35th of her career as she is still in the overall lead, but only by five points over Mal O'Brien. Team action coming up next. Stick around, everybody. You can head to games.crossfit.com for official results, standings, and more. The 2022 Noble CrossFit Games are sponsored by Rogue, the official equipment supplier of the Noble CrossFit Games. Arasti, the official rapid recovery provider of CrossFit. Monster Hydro, the official energy drink of the Noble CrossFit Games. GoWad, the official mobility partner of the Noble CrossFit Games. And Noble, no excuses, no shortcuts. No gimmicks, no tomorrows, no bull. Let's get started, guys. We already kind of chatted a bit, but let's go around and share where you're at, where your head's at, just one or two sentences, What, how you're coming to the meeting. I'll start. CrossFit affiliate roundtables are moderator-led, small group conversations. Affiliate owners can gather together consistently to celebrate wins, identify weaknesses. In that time, we share all sorts of things that affiliate owners would talk about. Oh, my gym and your gym sound surprisingly similar, so. Yeah. You get back what you put in. So if you're really looking for, for advice on business and business only, there's a round table that will do that. If you're looking to be like, man, I just need some emotional support as an affiliate owner, there's a round table that'll do that too. We get into this business because we love exercise. And what we discover is that we need support. There's so many conversations to be had. And we're just trying to open that door so that they can connect. What does it take? How do I train? What do I eat? How do I recover? How much do I sleep? How do I react? What if this happens? What if that happens? Am I prepared? It all adds up. It's not about what I do. It's about what I don't do. No excuses, no shortcuts, no gimmicks, no tomorrows. Where I am is exactly where I'm supposed to be.
My name's Rich Froning, four-time individual CrossFit Games champion, five-time affiliate cup champion. As I've gotten more advanced in my career, nutrition has taken more of a front seat to go along with my training, and RP has helped me over the last couple of years dial that in and take the guesswork out of what I'm doing. Nutrition timing is a huge piece, as well as nutrition or macro count. And currently, I'm eating 100 grams of fat, 200 grams of protein, and about 500 grams of carbohydrates. We've played around with that over the years, but that's kind of what we've settled on, especially this time of year. RP Diet has helped me a ton, and it can help you too. As a 10-year affiliate, I would advise somebody who's new and starting out in the CrossFit world to be passionate in your pursuit of education, to hone in your craft and your skill, which CAP programming helps us do, and really take the opportunity with the time that's freed up to get to dig in deep with your members and your community, get to know what motivates them and triggers them and keeps them excited about coming back.
Welcome back to Day at the Games, presented by the U.S. Army. It is a beautiful day here in Madison, Wisconsin. And day number three of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Tommy Marquez alongside Annie Sakamoto. We are inside the Coliseum as action is shifting here shortly. But Annie... Thoughts on the competition so far? There has been action everywhere today, Tommy. We've been off campus. We've been in North Park. We're in the Coliseum now. There's been masters. There's been teens, uh, adaptive individuals, teams, and we're only halfway through the day of competition. And we kick things off in dramatic fashion with an event that really spanned the totality of Madison, the Capital event. And we had some amazing finishes down at the end. On the men's side of things, it was Roman Krennikov, Ricky Garrard battling the entire way. And on the final steps, Garrard holds onto his bag. He passes Krennikov, and it was just enough for Ricky, your leader, to get another event win. And then on the women's side, it looked like Haley Adams was maybe going to go running away with the event, but she started to struggle on that final set of stairs and opened the door for Gabby Magawa. Magawa charged that final Husafeld bag, walks away with 100 points as she continues her climb up the leaderboard. And man, Annie, what a phenomenal way to start the day. We talked about the, the iconic finish of being at the Capitol when it came to this event. Talk about iconic CrossFit moment. Rebecca Fusile had been struggling with that bag. At that point, the entire crowd that was at the Capitol got behind her and saw her up the stairs. This is what our, our, our sport is all about. Yeah, if you had to summarize CrossFit in a picture there, it was that last little finish for Rebecca. Taking a look at your overall standings now on the men's side coming into the next event. Ricky Garrard, still your overall leader. He leads by 87 points over Justin Maderos. Roman Krennikov slides back into third. And then look at Saxon Panchik, Samuel Quant, and Jeffrey Adler slowly creeping up inside the top 10. Some strong performances from them today. But Annie, what really stands out for you based on where we're at today in the competition? Well, going into this fifth event, Justin Medeiros, last year's champion, was in third place, 12 points back from Roman Krennikov. This second place finish moved him into second place overall, and now Medeiros has 27 points over Roman, so he's slowly inching his way back to the leader jersey. The question is, does he have enough events to make up all those points? The Medeiros got a small win by passing Ricky at the finish line there in that last event to maybe pick up some momentum heading into the evening evening but switching over to the women's competition right now and everything that's been going on we were surprised at where Tia Tumi was entering the day she's starting to get some momentum behind her yeah first two days of competition this is not where we expected to see Tia Claire Toomey the five-time champ this today's performances are definitely what we expected now having said that I can't lie Tommy it's been kind of fun to you know wonder what was going to happen is Tia Claire Toomey human she said it herself this makes for a fun competition thank you Tia for this fun competition <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's really starting to gain steam as we come into the Coliseum again switching over to the team competition now and your overall standings coming into today and mayhem freedom Making a push again. I think this is the race we all were hoping to see. They are six points clear of CrossFit Invictus continuing to charge. Your leader coming into today, Oslo Navy Blue, has slid down to third. They are 12 points back of the overall lead. But you have to give credit to Mayhem Freedom. Came into the day in second. They made a statement. Yeah, they on. were 15 points back from Oslo Navy Blue. We knew that they were going to have to come out and make a statement. They absolutely crushed event five. Previous to their heat, no team had even been able to finish this event. Not only did they finish the event in 11 minutes, but they beat the next place team by almost three entire minutes. And switching things over to the age group and adaptive divisions, here are your overall leaders for the teenage divisions after four events and some familiar names that we've been talking about all weekend long. RJ Mestri, Caleb McClure, Olivia Kerstetter taking care of business in the 16 to 7. Riley Beebe, we haven't talked about him much, or her much, sorry, but she leads the girls 14 to 15 division. But RJ Mestre, he, he has just been nearly perfect all weekend long. Well, and like you said, Tommy, this is a team that we had talked about, we had our eyes on. He has three first place finishes and one second place finish. In this event in the Coliseum earlier today, he was almost 40 seconds ahead of the next finisher. And one of my favorite things about RJ in this event, he finishes it, he gets up on that, uh, on that finish mat. I mean, look how solid he looks. 
He gets up on the finish mat. I don't know if you're a Golden State Warriors fan, <laughs> but I'm a Steph Curry fan, and he put that crowd, he put the, those players to sleep with that one. I think a ton of fans out in California were celebrating that one in particular. Switching over to the adapted division, and your leaders throughout all the divisions, Casey Ackery remains perfect so far. Valerie Cohn, we've talked about her a bunch. Brett Horcher holding down the men's neuromuscular division and then the women's neuromuscular division. Morgan Johnson, impressive so far. Very impressive, Tommy. This is her first appearance at the games. She has a pair of first place finishes and a pair of second place finishes. Uh, so great job through four events for Morgan Johnson. And switching over to the Masters competition. And on the men's side of things, these are your leaders as it stands right now. Alexander Jolivet in the 40 to 44 division. Jacob Grubb, we talked about him coming in. He's looking good in the 45 to 49. Al Charrington holding things down, teaching the young guns a little thing or two in the 65 plus. But then the guy that caught your eye, Andy, we've maybe heard of him a few times. He was here, but maybe in a different capacity last year in Roy Gamboa. Exactly. Pretty seamless transition for Rogelio Gamboa. Last year, like you said, Tommy, he competed as an individual at the Games. In fact, he's a four-time individual competitor. He's also a one-time team Games competitor. Uh, he, he made the transition quite nicely into Masters, especially without Sam Dancer in this division. Unfortunately, he is in first place. No surprise there. I, it would be hard to imagine somebody else winning this division. Roy, just an awesome athlete through and through, but your overall leaders on the women's side of things, and Annetta Tucker, a surprise performance in the 35 to 39, kind of staking her claim there. Jen Ryan holds on in the 40 to 44, and then Mary Beth Padromedy is in the 60 to 64 division, looking strong. But I know one athlete you were excited to watch coming into the weekend was Cheryl Brost. Definitely, and that's because we haven't seen Cheryl Brost compete in a couple years, but she is a two-time Masters champion. She's a five-time Masters competitor, and she actually competed in the individuals division in both 2011 and 2012. Right now, with these, the great four performances that Cheryl's had so far, she sits 10 points ahead of Kim Purdy, and much like athletes like Jason Grubb, Frost is a games athlete. You know, she thrives best in the games with the higher skill, the heavier weights, and I think she'll do just fine. Well, one of the big topics of discussion anytime we come to the games is what the programming will be. We usually save a few announcements for here on site. And up next, we just learned what the individuals will be tackling here inside the Coliseum. And this is an individual event seven. And man, if you were wondering if we were going to get back to some basics, maybe some gymnastic movements, you have it here. You have 30 calories on the echo bike. It'll go 30, 20, 20, 30. And then between each movement, you will have 10 block deficit handstand push-ups facing the wall for the women. They will have 25, 15, 15, 25 on the echo bike, a two inch deficit for them, a three and a half inch deficit for the men. I mean, if you thought Adrian Bosman was gonna put his stamp on the program, you can definitely see it here. I love, 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 love this event. The, the way it's gonna require athletes to be much more virtuous in that handstand push-up, not being able to arch out of it and have to keep the belly facing the wall is gonna be a beautiful sight. And considering the level of skill here and what these athletes have to do in the standard, who are some athletes that you're excited to see take part in this? Um, on the men's side, I'm going to say it's going to be uh, BKG and Patrick Vellner. I think both of these gentlemen will do quite well on this event. On the women's side, I'm going to say Ariel Lowen and Emma Lawson both stand a chance at, at doing really well. Unfortunately, well, I don't, I'm not going to say unfortunately. Laura Horvath is another athlete that I definitely have my eyes on because Deficit strict handstand push-ups have always been her kryptonite. So the question is, what happens when the belly faces the wall for Laura? Yeah, I think this could be a big turning point workout for her as we enter the Coliseum. Going to get you guys caught up on what's left in store for these athletes the rest of the day. And here is your schedule to close out Friday. The age groups and adaptives, they will still be outside. Teams are up next. And then the individuals will close things out again once we get through competition here. Want to say a special thanks to our sponsor for today, the U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Discover the career for you and opportunities you never knew existed within the U.S. Army. Visit GoArmy.com forward slash CFG. Oof, man, Andy, I cannot wait to see this event go down. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back at the end of the day to wrap all the action up. Thanks for joining us here at Day at the Games. For Andy Sakamoto, I'm Tommy Marquez. We're going to leave you now with Individual Event 7. I'm oh, sorry, Team Event 6.
CrossFit Affiliate is a place. It could be in a park, it could be in a, in a brick and mortar. What they would find is a community that they can instantly bond with, uh, great people, great coaches, people who really want to see them succeed through their hard work. CrossFit Affiliates are owned by thousands of small business owners who are part of their communities in every different corner of the world. It's literally the ownership are the people that are in the community. So they're people that might have started, lost 100 pounds, recognized that, hey, there are other people that need this and I want to be the providing source for that. So the CrossFit affiliate gives people a sense of belonging. It's that camaraderie. It might feel a little bit intimidating at first, but when you understand that everyone within those four walls wants you to do the best, it's very addictive and it's very beneficial and positive to you. You don't get to do what you love if you're in pain. Nice and slow, slow and smooth. Good, back to the middle. And right ear, right shoulder. We're here testing the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games workouts. Arosti's role is to make sure the athletes are able to perform to the best of their abilities so that we can do our part to ensure this year's test is the best that it can be. Here at Arosti, what we do is we find things that are holding you back, things that are causing you pain, that limits your ability to not only work out really well, but to just live pain-free, do things you love to do. We find what's wrong with you, we get you out of pain, and then we show you ways to keep yourself healthy so you don't have to keep coming back to us. Thank you, appreciate it. Before you were a beast, life was boring. And so were your sunglasses. <laughs> What makes a good coach? Well, we, we have the definition of effective coaching, but at the heart of great coaching, first thing is you have to care. What we try to teach everyone coming into the level one is regardless of the ability level of who walks into your gym, that person deserves a cue. Whether that be someone who is coming to their first CrossFit class or a games athlete like Chandler Smith, our ability as coaches and our effectiveness is directly impacted by our ability to have someone leaving our class better and have learned something new than when they walked in the door.
These are the CrossFit Games 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Inside the Alliant Energy Center here in Madison, Wisconsin, back at the Coliseum for the second time at this competition on the team's side. Alongside Jeremy Austin and the 2009 champion, Tanya Wagner, Jamie Hagia is down on the floor. My name is Joel Godet. You wanted a competition? You got a competition. All eyes on CrossFit Mayhem Freedom coming into this week. And CrossFit Mayhem Freedom made it interesting through a couple of events, but in the fifth, Rich Froning and company put the pedal to the metal, and they are right back wearing the leader's jersey where you would always expect them to be. Event number six, a little bit of a different challenge though. A little bit of a new challenge. Absolute challenge, Joel, as well. A lot of moving parts, but we've got two rounds for time. 40 echo by calories for the men as the women do some block handstand push-ups and new position, a new movement we have seen in the past. 30 echo by calories for the female and then back to the males for the handstand push-ups and then they split and do a 500 meter row each while they do a handstand hold, swap over and do it all again. Let's talk about the standard of the handstand push-up and for that we go down to Jamie Hagia and the demo team. These athletes will be doing block handstand push-ups. We have the lovely Allison Scuds, the demo team captain, who will be demonstrating. They will start in a wall walk, getting up to the wall. So these are wall facing. She's going to get her hands to the block. And then there are going to be deficits over her head. The women have to come below that line. The men have to go past that second white line, pressing straight up, not using their legs. It is a much different standard. Thank you, Jamie. And it makes it a whole lot interesting in terms of the strategy. It sure does. With any new element, you have to be cautious, but you need confidence in a handstand push-up like that being so challenging. So you need to have cautious confidence on your handstand push-up and then awareness and timing in the rest of the event, especially when you're on the back half of the event where the athletes are going to be in their box doing that static handstand hold. You have to know when it's your turn to kick up on the handstand. Take a look at Orlando Simons here for the first of four heats. Teams right now that are playing with the cut line. That is what starts to creep its head in here. We will cut the teams almost in half after competition tomorrow. So these teams need to move their way up into heat two if they want to have a chance of staying alive on Sunday. Only eight teams in this particular heat started with 36 at the beginning of competition. Here is CrossFit Trondheim. This maybe falls right into the wheelhouse. Well, this is the team that Ingrid Twandal with her strict handstand push-ups, that's the movement that got her into this competition, a winning out of strength and depth or just squeaking by to get into the qualifying position. So I don't expect her to have a problem with the handstand push-ups. And because you can share the load with these handstand push-ups, it doesn't have to be, like we saw earlier today, synchronized. Everybody does not have to do the same amount of work. So you rely on your strengths in this one. Absolutely, you need strength for this and head not being able to go anywhere near the ground once they do pass that white line, the rep is good. The closer you get your head through to that locked out position, the easier these reps are going to be. What makes this handstand push up so challenging is not just the difficulty of it being wall facing and the, the, how much demand there is on your shoulders and your core, but getting into that position and doing that wall walk and step up and step back, it's very demanding on the shoulders. One more thing to keep in mind, there's no rules to how these have to be divvied up. If one person wants to knock out all of them, she or he can. That's the split and the strategy. And no specifics on where you put your hands either, wherever you can get a good position and meet the requirements of the movement and fatigue already starting to kick in. With the echo bike, this is going to be nice and paced and if they're communicating well and with a little bit of vision, seeing exactly where their team members are and left of screen signaling how many there are to go even though they will have a judge to tell them there's five to go with a ton of moving parts it's really important to know how many handstand push-ups because you don't want the bike to be what's holding you up here and i gotta be honest when you watch me a for 2150 mount the blocks there i think the mount is one of the hardest spots and you can see it right here it's the trust of making that big of a step backwards on your hands well with a wall walk you can actually step your hands in however close you want to to the wall with this you've got that big jump up to that height and that two inch deficit for 
The females already proving difficult, but head position is going to be the winner today. Tron time, as expected right now, is your leader. And as you talked about qualifying out of strength and depth, they actually came from a non-qualifying position heading into the final, the sixth event at strength and depth. And it was really because of Ingrid Twandle's proficiency in handstand push-ups, strict handstand push-ups, that the team was able to make the jump they did with a second place finish in that event. The women are now on the bike, however, with Trondheim being in front. So it's 30 calories for the women and now 20 of these block strict handstand push-ups for the men. I know we spoke about timing, so trying to minimize the work to two minutes or less to make sure the transitions are quick. And trying time at the moment, getting through those first set of handstands and those Echo Bike calories, 126, so well in front, but with a little bit more fatigue, we may see that blow out. This event presented by Monster Energy Hydro, the official energy drink of the Noble CrossFit Games. Now, this event is really tricky, though, because even if they can get through this portion of the event, it's a two-round deal here. So they get through it once, they come back. How much more fatigued will they be if the second round through? Because the back half of this, of this event is the handstand holds. So there is so much demand in the static hold coming up and the fatigue that will just compound. 18 minutes of a time cap here, 3.41 in. And head judge Todd Whitman, the only requirement for the handstand was no cartwheels. So no cartwheeling into position and making sure they're in a nice, strong position, getting close to the wall. As there's a lot of people on the floor. But it's going to be the team in lane number three. Cross it 80-20. 80-20 right now. Getting, ready to get the position, getting into position for the second piece of this event. And that is the other interesting movement. And that is that the rowers are on sliders. You'll see that the women will get into their handstand hold now. Someone must be holding a handstand in order for you to row, and that's what just happened there. 80-20s women's kick down out of a handstand. You've got to rack the rowing paddle and then get back into movement. But these two rowers are linked. It makes it very difficult because you must row in sync. Trying to get your communication is getting pretty loud in here right now and trying to communicate with your partner, ensuring that all four feet are off the ground at one particular point to get a smooth transition and the split hold and stack position of that shoulder girdle. And that is exactly what the boys on the rower are wanting. What you've got to do is talk and communicate. You need to say, and in the demo this morning, James Sprague from the demo team would count out loud as he did the description with Griffin Raleigh. And you would hear, three, two, one, I'm coming down. Because if someone can kick up while you're kicking down, your partners can continue to row uninhibited. And Trondheim is doing a great job with that. They are communicating. They're, they're timing that well. But the fatigue does build. Up on the top of your screen, 80-20 has got things figured out now for their ladies, but they had a bunch of mishaps early on where their men kept having to stop that rower. And you saw they just had another one right there. But that is kind of what it should look like as you kick up and down. You just want to be careful not to play with that line too closely. Now, Tony, you and I had a bit of a play around with the sliders just before this event. It was a lot easier for me at the back to see the stroke you were doing and the position and timing of your stroke. So it must be a lot harder for the person in front because they're going to take a full brunt of the load if their timing is off. 
and these sliders are a great representation for what it feels like out on the water and we're using those we spoke to some of the guys from concept 2 earlier and this is where on on land training if you can't get on the water to help people with their timing so that you can be doing the work and sharing the workload because that tempo and timing is so important in the real world well Greg Hammond did mention these have been around for about 20 years and it's the first time we've seen them in an event here so people just haven't taken the opportunity to use them they, they, it was awesome it was really awesome rowing with you uh, we can get some sliders back at CrossFit Apex everybody so head over to Concept 2's website <laughs> it, was, it was way more awesome for me let me tell you <laughs> got 11 minutes left in the event 80 20 still leads the way and the biggest thing, like we said, is that awareness. For the rowers, you're not really paying attention so much to your other athletes doing the handstand holds. It's about just making sure you're staying in sync, like Jeremy and I were just talking about, and just listening to your judge. When they say stop or when they say row, that's what you're listening for. But the athletes are doing the handstand holds here. That nonverbal communication is really important. I like how some of the guys are kicking up, almost being like dictating, I'm ready to go, you can come down. Keep in mind, this is a 500 meter row. The quicker you row, the less time you're holding the handstand. So everything here is predicated on your rowing speed and efficiency to relieve those doing the handstand. Joel, you mentioned it before with James Sprague from the demo team trying to communicate. Now, you think about your head position while you're upside down trying to hold that stable position and breathe at the same time and then communicate on how you're traveling. That's really difficult. Some athletes having no trouble with this handstand hold whatsoever. The handstand hold came into play in competition back in 2020 on one of the divisions or one of the uh, stages to the CrossFit Games when we were online. That was the first time we saw that. So a lot of people have been practicing, have been able to do that, but having your partner so close and someone else kicking up like that, Near you makes a big difference. As you look across the field right here, for those teams that are on the rowers, the teams that have their women rowing are in front. If your men are rowing, you are still behind. But we'll start to see some people going back to the bikes because this is two complete rounds of what you're watching on the floor from the right all the way to the left. So those teams that are now onto the bikes are onto round two with about half of the time remaining before the cap hits. The next five, 18 time capped event. The men here will bike 40 Echo Cows while the women are going through these 15 block deficit handstand push ups. They will then switch. New standard of handstand push up and really challenging these athletes. We've seen a number of different events strength speed power now we need some finesse and positioning for two rounds i don't think the echo bike calorie is going to be that much of a drama for the guys but the it's going to come down to the handstand push-ups and then back for the row and trying to finish fast when you're trying to synchronize as well talked to Adrian Bosman who programmed the CrossFit Games this year and when he detailed this standard to us said Adrian where did you come up with this and you've got to remember that Adrian Bosman has a heavy gymnastics background and he said I have been wanting to program these for such a long time came across them in his travels in Asia and he said this is something that I've seen done I've seen it part of people's exercise regimens and it's an advancement of the test and a continued test of the skills for all of these athletes at now this level Handstand push-ups have been around forever, and there's only so much we can do with them, so people have gotten so strong and proficient in them. So taking it to the next level, it, was a, it is time, strict, deficit. We brought in the wall walks the other year, and now add them together. Even in that uh, discussion we had with Boz, it was, we're going to test these athletes, and some of these teams may not finish these events because they are testing the water to see what capabilities these athletes have and see how quickly they can adapt. Not everyone finishes the L1. Not everyone finishes the SAT. A test is a test. test. The bar even. It's just, it's opportunities to get stuck and refine where you're gonna train and how hard, where you need to work for the following year. I'm actually just just see this second half, the speed difference on these handstand pushups for Trondheim. This is Sarpsburg right here that we're looking at. One of the other Norwegian teams, Trondheim, Oslo Purple Red, Oslo Navy Blue, four teams from that 
country represent 10% of the teams in the field, actually more. She's gripping over the ballistic block there, squeezing on with your fingertips, which is a little bit of a different position, similar to parallettes where you can squeeze around. around. It's a little different than that flat position of your hands. Core stability, another factor that goes into this handstand push-up position. And the girls actually waiting for the guys on the echo bike, so the boys gonna have to pick up their game a little. Back to 80-20 here. That's Lewis Pearson, and then doing the handstands is Jim Neal. 80-20 is a cool gym. With that team qualifying to the games, they have now had somebody qualify to the CrossFit Games out of 80-20 in Ported Down, Northern Ireland, in every single division. Teenage, Masters, Team, Elite, Adaptive. Somebody from that gym in Ported Down, Northern Ireland has been here in any and every division. Really cool. <laughs> Lewis is feeling the brunt here. Tap back in Jim Neal. Who are competing with Emma Willis and Kerry Hewitt. Kerry's a doctor. Jim is also a medical professional. And you can see the tape on his left leg there as he was doing those handstand push-ups. He's competing with a grade two tear of his ankle. He is fighting through this. Good news he told us, he's a PT, they've got a doctor, anything goes wrong, he's good. Now foot position, the important part as well, there's no actual requirement for the foot position coming up the wall as there has been in the past with standards for the open quarterfinals. So trying to get those feet inside those hands, imperative, but making sure that head comes through and the more you fatigue, the more the head sits out there. In gymnastics, the tighter you are, the lighter you are. Keeping your body together, keeping that core together. And it's so demanding when your head is moving forward like that. And Louis just having a bit of drama on the left, keeping that head in position. He's probably working harder than he needs to. But here's the thing, you know, you want to probably do singles in this, but the demand of getting back in that position, uh -huh. while you're up there, you might as well go for two because it takes so much time for the transitions. But that's the the options you have to weigh. You don't want to do one wall walk into one hand yeah, right. push-up. Four minutes left to go in the cap here. Progressions as well for this. Not able to do this standard. There's other standards. You can get your feet on a box. You can get your knees on a box. But you can do a push-up. Think about it. We start ours at the gym with a tripod push-up. We're tripod tripod position, and that is that forward position. Um, and a lot of times you see we'll go strict dumbbell press, but this position more similarly mimics the handstand position and it, it demanding the same requirement of the muscles in your upper traps. So now back to the rowing here for 80-20. 2150 and 8020 are your leaders right now. They're gonna be joined by Trondheim. The field catching up here with now three minutes left to go. The women are on the handstand hold. The men are rowing 500 meters. Now technically together because they're linked together, but each one is rowing 500 meters. The judge tapping you on the shoulder to tell you to stop rowing is not a good thing. Means your partners are not synchronizing with the handstand hold. And moving around on that handstand position, very fatiguing, but might be the way you can balance. Oh, that's what you want to see. The nice stacked position of those shoulders, head in a nice position. Yeah, the picture's not frozen on the right side of your screen. Yeah. That is live. It is a split position for legs as well. That's balancing out the center of mass. And that's a great, great transition. transition. Wow. Great transition. Beautiful to say that they're at the end portion of this event to still have the strength, the stability to stay in place like that. It does look a little bit better here than when they demoed it in the athlete warm-up area. I, I thought it'd be a little more claustrophobic having to kick up that close to my partner, but that has not been an issue here in Heat 1 with two minutes to go. It's a four-by-four four box, and these athletes are just demonstrating their great control of their bodies. Well, Joel, you've got to think with that split position as well. That fo front foot is going well into that other box. So as you kick up, you don't want to kick your teammate. Now they're the 
But seeing the handstand hold, the static handstand hold in the 2020 qualify to the CrossFit Games. And roughly, if you think the two minute row for 500 meters, two minutes is a long time to be holding, especially when you have got that accumulated fatigue from those handstand push-ups. I mean, remember 2020, it had to be unbroken, but yes. Katrin won the static handstand hold. It was well less than two minutes. But how many people went and practiced after that? When it comes Everybody. out, then that was, what can I do? Everybody should have. One minute left to go, 50 seconds now left to go here in the opening heat. Less than a minute, teams coming up on 45 seconds. Here's 8020's transition on the left of your screen. Good communication. It was great on the first one. But now look at this in the back here. Solid hold, waiting until they needed the help. Good communication. Been a long few days already. Fifteen seconds left to go here in the opening heat. Mexico Not going to see a finisher, Mexico but what will be Abbott. the baseline heading into heat number two? In three, two, one. <laughs> Big round of applause for all your teams here in heat number one, event number six, and stand the machine. Good work by the Europeans here in heat number one. The Irish team from 8020, the Scandinavians. Also performing well. And it's going to be Trondheim that comes away with that heat one victory. Sometimes we know what we're talking about here. <laughs> Cap plus one. Oh, so Two close. rep difference. Yeah, so, so close. close to oh. <laughs> well, we talked about Ingrid Twandle and her strict handstand push-up prowess. She, Eric Vaudal, Var Thurman Moe, Lars Rudy, able to pick up a heat victory, which are hard to come by at the CrossFit Games. When you think about a two minute transition for each movement, they were very close to getting that spot on. Talk about the event again as we reset here for heat number two. This is handstand machine, Jeremy. Two rounds for time, 40 echo bike calories for the men to start things off while the females do the new block handstand push-ups. Then they'll switch in, the females will do 30 echo bike calories and 20, the gentlemen will do 20 block handstand push-ups. Then they'll split, they'll go and do a handstand hold and a 500 meter row each. And the new concept two sliders seen for the first time. And your recipe for success for this is going to be cautiously confident on those handstand push-ups because we have the handstand holds in the back half of the event, as well as your awareness and timing, good communication, all the good things you need for any team event. A couple of veteran teams here in this heat. CrossFit West Chase competed at these CrossFit games just a year ago. So did CrossFit Rhapsody. Those two teams are right next to each other in lanes four and five. Oslo Purple Red had a heat victory yesterday in the run, the fast event. That was complemented by the strong event outside yesterday. But our eyes are in lane one. The team from Spain, CrossFit Zerouts. Ninka Van Overveld competed on a different team at the games last year, and the guy that he calls himself Mr. Weak, Alex Anasagasti, Strength, not his strong suit, he's stronger than he gives himself credit for, but body weight movements, that's where he shines. He wants to go hit that handstand push-up block. Absolutely, and the number one seeds out of the European qualifiers 2021 and weren't able to progress due to COVID issues. So excited to see what the routes can do. And a Sagasti on the left there also competed at these games as an individual in 2019. And there they go, folks. A lot of veteran experience as we get underway here in heat number two with an 18 minute time cap. Event six for the teams here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. The men start on the Echo Bike, 40 cows, while the women go through 15 of these deficit block handstand push ups. It is a two inch deficit, and you can see that white line, the top of your head, 
must break the top of the white tape. Now for the men, it must break the bottom of the white tape. And watch the cranking of the necks, because if you crank your neck, that takes away from the depth of your push-up. If you keep your neck straight, that adds to the depth of your push-up. And that is all about your core stability, being able to maintain that body position. The tighter you are, the stronger you are in your midline, the more you can keep that head neutral. Taking a look at Mayhem Justice here. One of the three Mayhem teams competing out of Cookville, Tennessee. That head position, really important. The quicker you get your head position right underneath your torso, the easier this movement is going to be. Once fatigue kicks in, that neck and that head position just seems to stick out just that little bit more. Now, arm position, an important thing to talk about as well. Athletes can put their hands wherever they want to. Normally, we've got a box for our hands to go inside, but at this stage, we can go wherever we want. Where do you put them? For me, I'm going probably a little bit wider than I'd normally do a handstand push-up, but maybe grip the side of the block to be able to propel myself up the wall. I, I like to go nodding. corners. I like to go, I'd probably go corners just to be able to have more torque in my shoulders as well when I come up. Not to state the obvious, these are clearly more strenuous than a typical handstand push-up. And I think we saw them maybe a little bit more devastating in heat one than you might have thought or maybe than the athletes expected. Well, and what's so challenging is when you are touching your head to the ground, you have that feedback, you know where you are, but just the first couple reps with the adrenaline kicking in of the event is really hard for these athletes probably to know exactly where you are. You don't want to go lower than you need to, but it's really hard. No, you don't want a, a no rep either. And I think you made the, the point of when you touch your head to the ground, typically in a handstand push-up, even a deficit handstand push-up, you cannot do that here. That is a no rep. So you are suspended in the air throughout the entirety of your handstand push-ups. That puts an incredible amount of strain and strength in your shoulders. This event is presented by Monster Energy Hydro. That is the official energy drink of the 2022 No Ball CrossFit Games. The routes doing a magnificent job right now and getting stacked. Now we talk about stack position. We go back to our level one for our nine foundational movements. We've got our shoulder press, then we go into our push press, push jerk, and then we move on to our position upside down where we can support our body weight in a safe position. And then we progress, and the progression for the handstand push-up has got harder. The difficulty even more, the more years we get into the CrossFit Games. Can't see what Adrian Bosman has in store next for these teams, but that is just magnificent. Solid body position. He's keeping his legs together. He has complete control of his body. It's Alexander Sagasti. Just good for him to get to the games. In 2019, he had some visa issues. The nerves gave him an ulcer. He had a hip injury that he aggravated right before he got to the games. He was not in a great physical shape. Still made it through first cut, but he said event two wrecked him. So to get a chance to come back here, he was hyped. Well, he definitely won't need his hips in this one if he keeps going like that. <laughs> hey, what you, what, what one giveth, taketh away, or, or, or vice versa, like right? That. The shoulders are stronger. <laughs> done with the handstand push-ups before their female counterparts are done on the bike. And Zarout's now advancing to the rowing and the handstand hold. Both athletes rowing linked on these sliders. It'll mimic just like rowing on water, just like you're in a crew boat. You must stop rowing and re-rack the paddle if the feet come down from one of your female partners. Communication key on the left side of your screen. Someone must be in the air at all times. Already some early no reps. And the hard part, if you aren't used to maintaining yourself within that box, is that you're, sometimes your partner has their legs kicked over and you don't want to kick them and knock them over. You've got a handstand walk, and people are, are used to doing a position of support, but you're going to a target. Now you're sitting on one spot and you've got a box, you've got restrictions, and no reps now really starting to creep in. So getting that position and being able to communicate with your partner at the same time, proving very difficult for a number of these teams. Good transition there on the left side of your screen with Yona Tenta kicking down. Ninki Van Overveld kicking back up. Same thing, you just saw it again right there. Zarouts has this locked in. They are looking really sharp. 
Ninka Van Overveld was an addition to that team late. Boy, Hanamoya was actually competing with them in the offseason. They needed an, a, a replacement. They DM'd everyone in Europe. They found Ninka Van Overveld. She came with them to the Madrid CrossFit Championship. They loved the chemistry. Only one on the team that doesn't speak Spanish. So Alexander Sagasti does the translation for them. That's a lot of DMs. Everyone in Europe. <laughs> wow. They're expanding in Europe. They're loving CrossFit in Europe. <laughs> the only requirement was you cannot have your hands down on the floor waiting to do a kick up. So while they're kind of watching and listening, they're able to be in a hinge position, but they cannot be touching the floor. You talk about communication within the teams. The judges working just as hard with their communication. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Telling the athletes to stop rowing once the athletes aren't getting that transition nailed. Smooth that time. A little bit of a bend in the elbow and shoulder. So whatever the support you need to do. Now balance on your hands important. We know that the fingers playing an important role in gripping the floor and keeping that arm well and truly planted. But if handstand push-ups and this is your if this is your weaker movement, then obviously they're gonna be it's gonna be taxed coming into this hold. And you can stay within that box. So for some people, that static hold is so demand the isometric. And for some people, they'll dance a little bit. Oh, had a little bobble here off screen. It is close, like you said, though, Jeremy. It's not as much when they're upside down as when they come down in which direction they fall. And a number of shoulder taps that you can do in that position, whether or not you're supporting on the wall, your feet are on a box. This is mimicking that perfectly. Just trying to get those hands into position, judges working overtime. And you're looking at Kilo 2 on the right side of your screen, Zarouts on the left side of your screen. Zarouts has actually fallen from the ranks of the top three at the moment. Mayhem Justice very yeomanly working their way up here into a tie in first place. 43 reps on each side. We spoke about this before with the slider, Tanya and you and I jumping on. You were up the front, I was at the back. So you setting the pace, but at the back, I was having to work my stroke length and power off yours. And I'll tell you what, when we did get out of sync deliberately, it was all over the place. As soon as you stop, it's so hard to get yourself back in that position and under the pressure of needing to push or want to go a little faster together, we had to communicate that. And at 45 calories, you are released, or 45 reps, you have hit the appropriate number of meters on the roll to run back to the bike and start the second round through. So the male athletes will now begin another 40 cows on the echo bike while the females tackle these 15 deficit block handstand push-ups. A much faster heat already than heat one. About 20 seconds difference. We're approaching that halfway mark for the time cap of 18 minutes. Nordic on the left side of your screen, Kilo 2 on the right side of your screen. Nordic is a repeat team from these games last season. Began today's competition in 22nd place. Finished ninth last year. They do have some returning athletes from that team, including Antonia Falt-Kolinski, who was the team's captain. The two men are Alex Alebro and Eric Bjork Rubio. Mayhem Justice now in first place for the first time. Second time through here. We're at the top of the list with the 40 cows and the 15 push-ups. Event number six for the team's hand stand machine. You're not kidding. So one round complete already, but 40 echo bike cows for the men. 15 block handstand push-ups, the new standard for the females. And they will go back and swap. The females will do 30 echo by calories, the men 20 block handstand push-ups, and then head on to the Concept 2 slide rowers, while your other 
gender pairing is doing a handstand hold. So 500 metres required from both pairs. And it's also 40 cows, so those don't necessarily happen in sync. But our time to beat is that cap plus one set by CrossFit Trondheim. And the way the cap works is for the, if you get time cap, every 50 meters completed on the rower by the pair equals one rep. I know the sliders are linked together. Can you imagine the echo bikes linked together? So if you're struggling, your partner has to take over and do more work. I'm trying to figure out how that would work. I, I would love that. Sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't like them when they're separate. Yeah. <laughs> I said this again in the first heat. I still think the hardest part of this movement, watch as Seth Stovall moves into this position, that trust to pull that second hand up onto the block. Having the shoulder strength, having your body awareness. I like the fact how they're not rushing to get into position. The demo team in the briefing earlier and on the floor here, taking plenty of time. So hopefully these teams have taken notice. And as that fatigue kicks in, oh, that's a great position. Ben Davidson there. That one not so good, just because that head started to tilt down towards the end of the arena and away from his body. The quicker you can get that position of your head or your face close to that plexiglass. Beautiful position now. Mayhem Justice doing very well, getting that head below that line three and a half inches. It's smart. He did, uh, Seth Stowell did a six rep the first time there, about three. And all he needs is Ben Davidson to come in and just give a little breather. Did you see the save? Ben Davidson's left leg came off the plexiglass. <laughs> and he did a great job to recover. He's a great individual athlete. His teammates joked, they said if you looked at him, he, he didn't look like he would be here, but he is sneaky fit. He actually competed in the individual quarterfinals and would have been a backfill to individual semifinals had he chosen to go that route. We're, the men are holding strong right here, and I'm really proud because it's really their ladies, and it's their ladies' ability, Aniston Sudoff, the gymnast, she has been known to do 50 unbroken handstand push-ups. This is her ability to shine and just help the team out. So if the men can kind of hang on here and do their part, they're looking great. Think about if you're known to do 50 unbroken handstand push-ups. Not that you did it once, but it's like, oh yeah, Aniston, the one who does the 50 unbroken handstand push-ups. Nordic on the move, all by the lonesome. Top of the screen. Oslo Purple Red for the first time in this heat we'll talk about. They've joined in lane three. May have just as bottom of screen. They are now on to their second round of rowing. This is 500 meters for the men. They can only row while one of their women has their feet up in the air for a freestanding handstand hold. Nordic, top of your screen, holding tight. Aniston, suit off the bottom of your screen, orange shoes for Mayhem Justice. Here they are. This is the communication. This is the awareness. Teammates need to take over before it's too late. Good job by Jessica Kalasian nice there. Nice transition there. Time cap's coming up in about four minutes' time. We're gonna get some finishers here in Heat 2. We sure are, and synchronization of this row. Nordic doing a wonderful job. And a position that you couldn't see, Tanya, when we were on the slide rower, if you watch the scapulas, back of the shoulders of the athlete in front, you can actually pace the strength of your pull and your timing of your row. Greg Hammond said if you can watch the scapulas there and you can see when they stay tight and they start to engage, that's when the back athlete needs to start their pool. And really, Jeremy, you and I, we were able to get that together. It wasn't that hard. It really was just the startup. And so that's why it's punishing if they have any stops in this one. So otherwise, rowing together wasn't as bad as what it may appear. The start is, though. The length of the stroke as well is really important. And we get our first switch. The men now to the handstand hold for Nordic. 
the women onto their 500 meter row. And they have three minutes to do it. Nordic is going to finish. The question is going to be how quickly. Michaela Norman rowing in the back and Twania Felt Kotolinski rowing in front. You say two minutes for a rough 500 meter row. Nordic have got so much time and they can really push this row. I wasn't rowing it that hard, Tanya, on yours. I was rowing at about a 146 and it was a fairly comfortable pace to be rowing at. But the ladies here will be looking at roughly 145 to 150 to finish this out with a little bit of fatigue. Mayhem Justice also now rowing with their women. So too is Oslo Purple Red. So three teams right now are on their final set of movements. Collision in the front, Sudhoff in the back there. And they're able to unrack those paddles and row again with Ben Davidson having kicked up into a handstand. And you can see the check of the clock and the check of the leaderboard by Collision. Veteran move for the most veteran member of the youngest team in the field. That's Mayhem Justice. 23 years on average. Purple Red technically is the lead right now. There's a costly kick down by Stovall at the bottom of the screen. Davidson drops out, Stovall up into the sky. 90 seconds, 80 seconds now left before the time cap. You can see Ben Davidson's shirt tucked into his pants. It's not because he doesn't want to show his abs off. It's to keep his shirt out of his eyes. There's the claustrophobia. Two Mayhem athletes nearly kicked into each other. Nordic's display, 143, exactly where I was expecting it and to be. And they've got 20 cows left here, Jeremy, so they've got plenty of time. They're gonna jump right off. Those cows flew. And with almost a minute of time left, CrossFit Nordic. That's their first heat win of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. And the first team to finish this event. It came down to those handstand holds. They were great. Nice little race there, little run to the finish. Oslo Purple Red came out of nowhere on the back half of that second round. They left enough in the tank. Now, can Mayhem Justice finish? 20 seconds left to go. Davidson and Stovall struggling on the handstand. Stovall's got to kick up, then kicks down. You've got to re rack. 10 seconds left. Mayhem Justice is not going to be able to finish. They finish the work, they don't get across the line. Same that happened with Zarouts. Zarouts, yeah. And I think they're going to give Zarouts the finish. At least they did on the scoreboard on screen. We'll see what the official call is. Nope, they capped him on the spot. Zarouts and Mayhem Justice. Zarouts and Mayhem Justice. Right there. <laughs> Move the camera to the side. <laughs> ben knows a thing or two about camera work. It's, it's what he does for a living. This is my good side. <laughs> Four teams complete the work. Two teams finish the heat. Overall standings on the team side coming into event number six. Kind of where you thought they'd be, right? Mayhem Freedom, the defending champions. 2021, 2019, 2018, 2016, 2015. Rich Froning looking for his 10th career championship. Invictus not far off pace. Only problem is that this event falls right into the wheelhouse of Mayhem Freedom. They will be in the next heat still. This is heat three on handstand machine. Two rounds of time, 40 echo by calories for the men, 15 block handstand push-ups, the new standard for the women. Women will go back to the Echo Bike for 30 calories. The men back to the handstands for 20 handstand push-ups. They will split 500 meter row while the other gender pairing do the handstand hold, freestanding handstand hold. And then they will switch back. And two rounds for time and we've got 18 minutes on our time cap. And the recipe for success for these Movement is going to be cautiously confident on those handstand push-ups. Commit to your attempts, but make sure that if you're feeling the fatigue, get off your hands and let your partner do some work. And awareness and timing goes a long way on the handstand holds so that your, your other partners don't have to be stopping on those rowers. Nine teams in this field. OBA had a good morning. Tremendous job on the muscle pig out at North Park. Bumped them back into heat three from 
having fallen into the first half of heats. Greater Heights strength team. We'll see if that translates onto the gymnastics side today. But in lane one, it is EXF, one of the teams from down in Oceana who, Jeremy, you think are gonna crush this thing. Well, Christy and Brian, we know how good they are, but Moses on screen, his gymnastics ability is absolutely outstanding. The big unit, Henry Carlisle to the left of the screen. Got some work to do. And there's CrossFit Density. overtake Team Density, who just came flying late in the event. Muscle pig this morning at the North Park. Marco Coppola has been to the games before. He's the captain of that team. Finished a spot out All from right. the games in qualification last year. Rededicated themselves. Here they are in 22. Overtake did have a great Muscle Pig event. They took seventh in that one. And they also took fifth in strong. This event starts on the Echo Bike for the men. 40 cows here and the 15 block handstand push-ups. Kelsey Gill just took a no rep. And you can see just the crank of the neck to check with the judge. Was I good there? I'm sure the judge is going to tell you straight out if you're not meeting requirements, but that head position sitting way out until the very last second, that's a lot of strain to deal with. So we're going to try and get that face as close as you can to the plexiglass just to make this movement even more efficient and effective. Ashley Wozni is the youngest of this crew. She's only 24 years of age. Everyone else for OBA is 31. Pushes the tempo for them. Now requirement just for the toes to be able to hit the plexiglass once the movement has finished. So no feet on the wall per se. So no walking up the wall and the strain already. And I'd be surprised if she does another one. And the girls from EXF already right of screen. They're already done. Christy Bishop would have taken most of that brunt and they are waiting for the guys to finish. Blistering speed waiting for their men. Just letting them get a little recovery in the shoulders. Harry Carlisle left. Moses Patello has the mullet on the right. Moses is the owner of the gym. And now they'll switch it out. The guys will have 20 of these block deficit handstand push-ups. It'll be 30 cows for the women on the bike. At the Torian Pro, the EXF guys would have probably stayed at home because most of them are very close <laughs> to Brisbane. So one of the benefits, but way on the other side of the world now. And proving just why they were one of the qualifiers. This event presented by Monster Energy Hydro, the official energy drink of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Greater Heights is your leader right now. I'll give you another look at OBA with Nicholas Hecht on the push-ups. Team from Philadelphia is a rep off pace. Strong team, looking to make a name out here. A lot of experience on their team. Nick's first time in the games, though. And for Joey Tortora, he's back at the games. He actually quit CrossFit doing this movement in the middle of 20.3 in the open. He was just burned out. He kicked down off the wall. As Judge said, you can keep going. He said, I'm done. She said, with the workout, he said, with CrossFit. Back at it, back at the games, pushing EXF here in Event 6. Henry Carlisle struggling a little to get that big frame upside down. He has got a good lookout, lockout position, that head sticking out just a little bit too far. And that pause at the top, crucial seconds ticking away. That some of that form you're gonna give up a little bit, Jeremy. Just like we said, we don't want you don't want to come down and do singles here. Too much effort to come down after one rep, but you want to hold on a little bit longer, you're gonna sacrifice some of that form, unfortunately, and efficiency. Moses Patello getting through his sets pretty easily. He's getting way more depth than he needs to. And that's what we spoke about. They're not able to see where they're, they really are coming down. So if you're a good teammate, you can be there telling them you don't need to come down so far. But there are different spots within a movement when you go through a range of motion that just are easier to kind of stop and get some of that re uh, muscle reflex. Greater Heights onto their second grouping of movements here. Head to the rower and the handstand hold. They'll be joined by EXF. Seven, 
Kolesnikov team has also moved on to their second grouping of movements. So too has OBA. So four teams are on to the rowing and the handstand hold. Greater Heights doing very well in the lift event, event number two yesterday. And the power and strength required, not just to pull this rower, but be able to hold a handstand position. Jordan Cook in the back, Duncan Mulady in the front. So much strength, so much power. And just a quick look over the shoulder. And the transitions for the ladies has been very good so far. Just ensuring that one of your team members has got hands on the floor and feet are in the air before the other one kicks down another great transition. I would hope that's the case for Greater Heights. Emily Tanner was a collegiate acro. The row very strong, so he may be doing a little bit more work and easing it off for Moses at the front. Moses getting through those reps of the handstands a lot easier. How much harder is the work if you're linked to another rower and you're really doing the pulling for both machines? Well, 500 required on both rowers anyway. But, but just in terms of the effort, if I've got to if I've got to pull for you a little bit. Well, Tanya, I were on it. I was like carrying her the entire way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was the opposite. Tanya was carrying me the whole way. No, it, but it's not like you're pulling the entire weight. It just pulls you back from your stroke, so it affects more of your stroke and it just makes you. It causes you to use a little more effort than what you normally would to get your. 12 minutes to go. 18 minute time cap on this event. Had two teams finish and cross the finish line in the last team. Four teams finished. They've got to go through all of this work twice. So once these teams are done rowing and handstand holding, they'll go all the way back to the beginning. Kolesnikov team. And look at that communication. A lot of communication. Yeah, good work that by was nice. They were great in the lift event as well yesterday. Getting a ninth position. That's Adam Mancy and Johan Van Ziel, CrossFit Urban. Ivan Kukartsev, hands on knees. Lyushkin is the one trying to hold the handstand, and now they'll have to rack their paddles on the rower back of screen. Joel, that's a big frame to be holding up to. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Greater Heights still setting the tempo. Kolesnikov has come from behind here in second. Open box still lurking. Remember, this is only round one. They do have to go through this again. There already looks to be, though, some fatigue from this, some of these guys. Uh, there, this is a much faster pace than the other heats as well. So uh, they're, they're rushing, but I hope they're not going too fast that they get caught up when they go come back to the handstand push-up. You mentioned it in the previous couple of heats. It's important to get that road done as quick as you can so the handstand hold isn't as fatiguing on your other partners. That's almost a minute faster than the previous heat, which was 30 seconds faster than the first heat. That at least one team has gotten back to the bikes here to begin their second round. It's Greater Heights Ascend, the first ones to keep going. They're also joined by EXF, lanes one and two. Quite prophetic there. Open box all the way at the bottom of the screen. They're back at it. Kelsey Keel will hit the handstand push-ups off the block. OBA is right now to one, two, and three. Urban hand. Easy position for EXF. Girls doing exceptionally well and resting just a little bit longer. Such great control. Christy Hollard. Now Bryony Chalice. Bryony Chalice, her prowess with a barbell is exceptional, but her gymnastics almost as good. You know what's interesting is you guys talked earlier about you would want wider hand positioning, and it's really up to the athletes here. But both Bryony and Christy have gone with a much more narrow stance than we've seen from many of the athletes. Well, if you think about one of the 10 general physical skills of CrossFit, is that flexibility. If you've got that flexibility in your shoulders to get closer to a stronger position of support, you're going to go to it every time. Look do, how narrow that is. I do not have that amount of flexibility. 
Christy looking great upside down. And again, finishing early. Just waiting for the guys to finish their 40 cows. Same thing for greater heights on the right. What's that split, Jeremy? 122 for Bryony and Christy from EXF. Fastest handstand push-up split the first round was in a minute three for EXF. That's not a bad split at all for round two. Absolutely not. Handstand Machine is team event number six. Into the second round of our 40 Echo Bike calories for the men, 15 block handstand push-ups for the women. The swap, women back to the Echo Bike for 30 cals, the men for 20 handstand push-up, and then back for the final 500 metre row each while the other gender pairing is holding a handstand position and freestanding at that. And it was Nordic from the uh, from the previous heat, heat two, that set this time to beat at 17 minutes and nine seconds. The guys have 20 of these block handstand push-ups. Head must break the entirety of the white line. The women just had to break the top of it. The guys have to break the bottom line. It's a three and a half inch deficit. Henry going way deeper than he needs to. If I was Moses, I'd be yelling at him going, buddy, calm your farm a little. Not too deep. I would have said the same thing. Calm your farm. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. You can be talking with your female athletes on the bikes because you don't need to be crushing it. You don't need to do more reps than you have to for time-wise. Some of these men were waiting for their ladies the last time. Doesn't look like the ladies are going that much faster. On those bikes, you're not going to make up all this ground time-wise. So they really should keep that communication up. Check in and see where they're at. I'm so excited for you to go back to CrossFit Apex and coach a class and tell the entire group to calm their form. <laughs> in that accent. <laughs> EXF Greater Heights still going to town here. OBA has fallen off pace. We showed you overtake team density earlier. They're now in third. Here's what happened. There's no rep here. Ashley Wadney was struggling there and coming out of that, it's not going to look pretty, but that was the no rep that kind of set her back. Interesting did, dismount. Yeah, she did the worm after the team qualified at the Granite Games and kind of did it again there, but not quite as intentionally. The ballistic block left a little bit less room for her. Now they're checking in and seeing. What time they have, there's five to go for EXF. Hands in the air. Keeping in mind that the first rows for most of these teams in the two minute ballpark. So you're gonna have to row twice. And that's typical, you figure for a 500 meter row, typically that would be a little bit faster in competition, but those sliders are just causing a little bit more uh, pacing. You're gonna slow down just a little bit to keep yourself together. The fastest row was 151 from OBA, the slowest was 242 from KT. EXF is the first to advance back to their round of rowing in round two. And they've got zero company. EXF began the day in 15th place. Look at these ladies. Beautiful communication, great control and strength, inverted. The men are grinding it out. And it's almost calculated. It's the walk back and forth so that you're not just trying to stay in position statically. There's some movement there to stay active. Well, Chrissy's very good gymnastically, and she knows exactly what she has to do. Two different techniques, the bent leg versus the briny chalice straight leg position. Almost like an inverted star jump. What do you call them over here? Jumping jacks or something? Star jump? Uh, star, uh, star jumps and farm. What was it? Hold the farm. farm. Calm the farm. <laughs> but two completely different techniques, and both are very effective. This is a great hold from Briny. And looking straight at that three point position you spoke about earlier, Tanya. EXF really just tackling this so nice. 
and the men really are grinding through, keeping their strokes short. They're driving through their legs. It's a great example of how to row. If you're back at your affiliate, everybody likes to do the full oh, lean back and the mess. pull the paddle is high. Yes. Nice short right to your sternum. Keeping your hips back, being in a really good catch position is huge. That's efficient, that's strong. Moses taking a short break, but he's done. So is Henry. He's taking a longer break, actually. And the girls now swapping in, and they've got a little bit of time, but not much to that time gap. 17.09, our time to beat. I mean, you've got to... Well, the girls have got to go. You're at the end of an event here, but you can hold a 2.05 pace here and get yourself across that line and have the new time to beat. And with EXF, the girls are much better handstand hold than Moses and Henry, so they want to be rowing a lot faster to minimize the fatigue on the arms. Henry getting those steps with those hands a little bit bigger, and they just don't want to come down. And you have to stay not only in the box, but off the blue tape. So a couple of really good saves in that hold. Jeremy, I thought where the women were fantastic as well as the time to beat again is 17.09, was kicking down before they needed to. The transition points of before you hit that failure, kick up so that you can maintain the rowing pace going on the other side. The quick transitions now, fatigue really starting to kick in for EXF. And Henry, as you mentioned, Joel, Another couple of saves, and he's got a big frame. 151. We're going to 500 ah, on that counter. It looked like they came down there. The ladies had to. That just stopped momentarily on the row. But then changes now between Moses and Henry are very quick and not really, really what. Now his feet came down. That should have been a stop again there. It should have been. There have been a couple. I don't. That should, the ladies should have been re-racking, hooking in their handles right and there pausing. Too. And there. Time to beat is 17.09 though. EXF still in front. We get the switch for greater heights as EXF finishes 17.09, the time to beat. It has been beaten. Chip timers on the women. So 17.03 for EXF now out in front. It's been beaten. They worked hard, but I don't know about that standard there. That was not how it was supposed to be for the penalty for the row. We'll have to see what happens with that. Now we still have time before the cap comes in. 32 seconds remain. We're going to get another finish. Overtake, Team Density, great Friday. I'm sure they're the two teams we highlighted coming into this too. I think we're doing pretty well with that today. <laughs> Overtake really did, just like we saw earlier today, calm, composed. They know how to execute these workouts, these events. Only four teams, four teams cross the finish line through the first three heats of event number six inside the Coliseum. What a great test they've had. A lot of moving parts in this one again in the Coliseum. But teamwork and communication, absolute key. Relying on your strengths. If you have some people that can take some more of the brunt of the calorie or of the, of the handstand push-ups or the holds, you just do where you can, what you can, and work together. Very proud to see that Aussie flag as a heat winner as well. Two of them in that heat. Urban Energy finishes eighth. Not to be confused with eighth day CrossFit, they finished ninth. OBA did run into some struggles. They wind up because of tiebreakers in fifth, but completing the third most work of the event. Overall standings in the team event, right where Mayhem Freedom would have told you they'd be. CrossFit Mayhem Freedom, first place, 452 points, and for the second time in this competition, Froning and Friends will be wearing the white leader's jersey with the red bottoms. Invictus, 
We've said it once, we'll say it again. The only affiliate with a team in every team competition, just off pace by six points. Mayhem earlier today. Boy, this was domination. I tell you what, we spoke about this earlier with poking the bear. And Froning had that look in his eye coming into today. And they left no doubt. And that walk to the finish, the struts. Mayhem, freedom, they are back and back with a vengeance. It was their first event wick win so far. And they're going to roll in with that momentum. Handstand Machine, team event number six. Two rounds for time, 40 echo bike calories for the men, 15 block handstand push-ups for the women. 34, the women back on the echo bike, and the men will move to 20 handstand push-ups. Then 500 meters each on the row, while the other gender pairing holds a handstand hold. We have two rounds for time and an 18-minute time cap. Cows on the bike, and for the ladies, 15 of these block handstand push-ups. The new element that we've seen, these athletes have all had a chance to watch three previous heats to kind of get an idea. They play with these ballistic blocks back in the warm-up area. And so now it's just executing your strategy. How many are you going to do? How many am I going to do? You'll have about two minutes to do that while the men are working on their calories on the Echo Bike. We spoke about Invictus just before, but coming into this event number six with a fifth, second, fifth, seventh, fourth, what a great start to competition, even though there is a fair bit of work to go over the next couple of days. Well, for all of Freedom's dominance, it's really been Invictus who have had the most consistency so far at this part and this point into the, the games second place they actually won the crossfit games back in 2014 that was the last time they took the affiliate cup and so no strangers they have been here every single year the only affiliate to send a team every single year actually if you look at the guys jerseys you can see it really distinctly against joshua alshama's black jersey top that little gold number above crossfit that is the winning tag from that championship there aren't a whole lot of teams that have that on their jersey. Mayhem's is littered with it, but it's that stark reminder of, hey, we're Invictus, don't forget about us. Absolutely not. And I remember back a couple of years ago, Joel 2018, when we are both commentating in the team division, and Devin Kim was in that division as well. Great to see the progression. And Kim is just one of two teams to compete in all four of those games as a teenager. So a lot of competition experience on Invictus's side. CJ Martin, the owner and their coach, he has trained many teams to get here. Oh, by the way, look who's in first place. The bear was poked in event five. Mayhem Freedom woke up, but let's not count out Oslo Navy Blue. They are in first place. They would like that white shirt back from Rich Foner. Well, are they the polar bears? <laughs> Back and forth, it's been a great battle. Oslo Navy Blue and Mayhem Freedom swapping the white jersey in and out. Well, don't leave out CrossFit Reykjavik. Coming into this event in fifth place, we wondered how Lauren's shoulder was going to hold up with the handstand push-ups, knowing Annie's strength, knowing another teammate's strength. That'll be the question here once we switch. Lauren Fisher on the right does not have any kinetic tape on her shoulder, which she did wear during the ring muscle-ups this morning. If they're in first place right now, they were able to make it quickly through there. And now look at... Tola. Tola Moore and Kenya would, would wow. like more weight on the deficit handstand push-ups. Why don't you slap a weight vest on him to just even things out for the rest of the field? This event is presented by Monster Energy Hydro, the official energy drink of the No Bull CrossFit game. I was excited to see Khan and Tola hit the Echo Bike, but how about those handstands from Tola? That was dumb. <laughs> you gotta got be so stupid. strong. <laughs> oh. Make the transition. Don Porter, Tullamore, Kenya rowing center of screen. You've got Oslo Navy Blue right of screen. Now, if you want two guys on a rower that are going to chew through meters quickly, these are two of the athletes you want. Khan Porter, you legend. 
So many years of experience across at regional, sanctional and semi-finals in the Oceania region. And in great shape after spending so much time in Iceland training with these three other absolute weapons. So in sync on this row. Con Porter with the wandering eyes trying to check where everybody else is in the field. So with Tolomora Keno. Reykjavik entered in fifth place overall, trying to hunt down a podium spot. The questions we talked about already with Lauren Fisher's shoulder, how would it hold up? She and Annie Thoris' daughter doing the handstand holds, and Lauren Fisher just did a very, very quick one to give Annie Thoris' daughter a brief respite, but you can see three lanes from the top, Iceland Annie is back holding a handstand again. This is going to be a very, you would have to imagine, work, uh, work, workload heavy workout for Annie Thor's daughter. And again, Lauren Fisher kicks up. Annie's shaking out her arms, but is immediately ready to go again. But if you're coming into an event like this and you want to protect someone with a shoulder niggle, that's exactly how you're going to communicate and swap in and out. Taylor Williamson up. Spells Andrea Nistler for Mayhem Freedom. And Reykjavik switches. Annie Thoris' daughter's team took a 30th place finish in the Coliseum on Wednesday night. And they have bounced back with fury. Now they might be out of it for a first place hunt at this point. Maybe some 70 points out of first place contention. It's a lot of points to make up, but they are gonna fight for a podium spot with still a lot of work to do this weekend. If you're just joining us, these rowers are connected on sliders, so it mimics what it would be like to row on water, just like you were on a crew team. And they've been around for about 20 years. We talked to some of the guys down at Concept 2. And this is a great way to train so that you, when you get back on water, are in sync and your timing is perfect so they can work with some of their crew members that may not be doing as well and trying to kind of get that timing together with your teammates. Really interesting there. Khan Porter, the far right of your screen. Now Tola Marqueño is up on his hands, but Khan was sideways to kind of watch each other and kind of see where they were at. I think you might have wound up May turning. May have just sideways. turned accidentally. Thought it was a strategy. <laughs> Could Sam Cornoyer be any stoic, more stoic? Freedom is now back out in front. Rich Froning will kick up, Cornoyer down. Well, it is very um, common to see Freedom come back. Maybe sometimes, look, we saw him smash and just demolish today's event, but sometimes we see their pacing pay off in later rounds. We have another round of this to go. Reykjavik. But Reykjavik is just smashing this one. And Oslo's right behind them. Here comes Freedom. You wanted to fight, you got to fight. Well, this one is a race. And when we talked to Adrian Bosman earlier, he said the skilled and the fit were going to be fast through this. The not skilled, the not fit, they're going to get stuck. Well, these are three of the fittest teams here, and they're moving fast. Coming into the second round, of handstand machine, two rounds. This is the second of those. 40 echo by calories. And Khan and Tola on the far left of the screen are the ones starting things off in the 15 block handstand push-ups for the females then. They will switch 30 echo by calories for the females and 20 block handstands for the men. 500 meters on the row to finish off and are we going to see another fast time and more teams finishing this event? I think so at this rate. No luxury of time now. You have to push the pace, push the envelope here. You know what it felt like the first half and now we just got to do it again. But this is the games. This is the top three teams. Actually, we have to check where Invictus is. They're the only one of sixth place right now in the heat. This heat here that we're missing out of the top teams in this race.
Oslo Navy Blue is in third overall, but it leads the Heat. Mayhem on your screen is in first overall. It's second in the Heat. Invictus is dead center in the black tops. The women in the black bottoms. The women for Mayhem Freedom on the left of screen hitting the bike. 30 cows for both Andrea Nistler and Taylor Williamson. The round of applause was for Reykjavik now also making the switch. At this juncture, guys, you're tired, you're on round two. What's the pace that these men and women are pushing on this bike? I mean, they, if you're giving it all that you have, you are crushing it. The Echo Bike is really it's, it's a very common element for all of the athletes. They know how to push and how to grind on this. They have to just close their eyes and know this is like the training. This is the training they train for and just dig in. I think that's what Ingrid Hodemir is doing. She was just looking down, putting her head down for Oslo, gritting it out. If this one, Joel, is more about making sure you're with your partner. You have to get done at the same time. You don't want to be the one holding up your team. Lane three is Reykjavik. Lane four is Oslo. Lane five is Mayhem Freedom. Lane two is Selwyn. And we did expect to do a really good job on the handstand push-ups, especially Luke Fowler, who is about to kick up on that wall. He's just changing out with his brother, Ben. Jeremy, he did 90 handstand push-ups all by his lonesome semifinals, is that right? Look at him. Torian Pro, yes, but they were all strict. So you could do a kipping handstand push-up. He decided he was going to go 90 strict. Yeah, why not? So Ben Fowler did zero handstand push-ups in the team event. I will say this, they have merch spot on. Best fan base out there. The whole crew supporting, cheering him on. Richest family, his kids. Well, four events in, CrossFit Mayhem hadn't won. They won running away in the fifth event. By almost three minutes, they've got company from Reykjavik, but they're out in front. Real calm roll from Froning and Cornoyer. And now here comes Oslo. Oslo Navy Blue rounding up your top three. It goes one. Oslo Navy Blue now on the roller. Second to Mayhem Freedom last year here in Madison. Coming up on the 12 minute mark, six minutes left to go. Only four teams have finished through three heats. We're going to get four teams at least that finish in this seat. Love the curious eyes of Froning. <laughs> Trying to read <laughs> the always next to him. Goping, always looking. What's everyone else doing? Composure. It's almost effortless for Rich Froning. So many years of it, so much experience. And that's what you get when you're led by him. The whole team gets to think through the process of where to stay composed. He would talk through him. It's a two-round event where you make your moves. You don't want to go too early. You just have to be clean. You have to be smart in this whole thing. Execution is where they just excel. We have only showed you Froning and Kono yet. They have not stopped rowing. 141, that's quick. Keep in the back of your mind that that means that Nistler and Williamson have been beautiful in their communication. For a minute and 48 minute seconds, 48. somebody had a handstand for Mayhem Freedom. Flawless execution. And the ladies wasted no time. They got right on. Great transition there. Two women that used to compete against Mayhem Freedom. Adrian Nistler, Taylor Williamson were on OC3 out of Iowa. Couldn't get over the hump. Couldn't beat Mayhem Freedom. Nistler joked last year she felt like she was joining the dark side. They won their first affiliate cup and CrossFit Games championship between the two of them. 136, now 137. Is that is a ridiculous speed to be going for this 500. They are trashing this final row. When you are Rich Froning, you go get the best. He found it here. He said it earlier this season, I have the best two women in the field. I have the best on my team. They are showing it right here. This is also another thing that you can replicate in your affiliate. 
80% effort for 80% of the workout. We are in the last 20%. All out. Expectation from Rich Froning. He sets the standard, but his expectations are so high from his teammates, and they are absolutely delivering right now. Oh, look at the handstand hold position. Rich wanting a little bit of love, too, and he's getting it. The time to beat is 17.03. You gotta be kidding me. 50 meters away. Mayhem is gonna smash the field by two whole minutes. Now they'll get company in this heat. But for the second event in a row, Mayhem Freedom, hear them roar. Leaders jerseys going into the weekend. And now the smiles, now their teammates, their community can smile that sigh of relief, and they crushed that time. Now we've got a race, Reykjavik, Oslo, the women have the chip timers. Oslo got ahead first. I believe Porter and Morikino were the first to the finish line, but Hodenmir and Richter got across first for Oslo. A female had to have the chip timer, and Oslo with critical points in this race for the podium. So three points in that split second finish. Oslo Navy Blue and Reykjavik. Great results for Reykjavik. They'll move up again. That's a 25 second window for Mayhem. That's been outstanding. Their last two events have been out of control. They are on a mission on Friday. By the way, there's still two minutes left, so <laughs> feel free to continue working if you're out there. Look at this race again. A little replay here just to show you the foot chip. Looks like Liana Richter has it for Oslo, and Thora's daughter had it for Reykjavik. She reached, and he made the, the reach as far as she could. She tried, she just couldn't get it in. And that's one of those little no! things, right? Be aware of where the chip timer is on your closest competition. And he did the best she could there. Mayhem Independence. Independence. Flying under the radar. <laughs> Look at these guys. Selwyn, Independence. Independence has been there, right there, right on the heels where Freedom finishes. They're right behind them. Shall we say mustache mayhem? <laughs> we could say that. Not Between surprised. Parker and the Chico. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for another finisher here. Selwyn also across, so five teams have come to a close. Invictus is still out there on the floor, and these are critical points that are now going past because we have now passed teams from prior heats. Remember, Invictus was in second place overall coming in. You mentioned Selwyn, and they made a few mistakes at the Torian Pro into that qualifying position in second spot, but only just they said they weren't going to make mistakes again, and they are going very well. The New Zealand team from Christchurch has been absolutely outstanding in the first couple of days of competition. Really good work by Al Shama. He's got a dance background, very elegant in his gymnastics. Invictus is done, and Invictus has time to finish. So the sea of green comes across, 17.53, 10th in the event. That will drop them out of second place overall, but they do finish the work here in event number six. The teams are done until Saturday. Rich Froning, he's just getting started. Rich Froning Friday. Mayhem, what a statement in events five and six. And is that a glint of a smile, or is he still... They Head have, down. They, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Mayhem, Freedom's patience, their confidence and their abilities, while the rest of the field was just smashing. Tola Marquinho just hammering his hands to Reykjavik speed in their transitions through the first round of this event. It didn't fluster Freedom. Freedom made their move on the back half of this event in round two. Once the guys got to the rower, Mayhem was the first to get there. They didn't look back. They had nobody with them through that final row. They knew it. 
They had a perfect row, perfect handstand hold. Never had to stop on those rowers. Those ladies did their job on the rower. Perfect day three for Mayhem Freedom. Stop me if you've heard this before. Jamie is with Mayhem. You were briefed on this event this morning when they announced that the handstand pushes would be wall facing, strict deficit, and a handstand hold during that row. What were your initial thoughts? I mean, yeah, confusion. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone was surprised, but it uh, turns out pretty well for us. Uh, it was a nice workout, actually, even if the handstand sucked a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. The rowing is something we're not typically used to seeing. How is that different being on slides versus a static rower? Uh, we both kind of had to change our cadences to match each other, so that was a little weird. Uh, basically, we just gripped it and ripped it. In such a close race, does that change your strategy at all when you see how tight of a race it is between the other teams? Yeah, absolutely. You just think, man, I can't mess up. <laughs> There's no room for error. No room for error. And Rich, a perfect day, 200 points, two event wins. We saw how pumped you guys were crossing that line. What does that say about this team? Oh, this team's awesome. It's fun. Um, they all like to hurt and they all like to win. So what more could you want? Congratulations. Well, Rich Froning literally couldn't have done any better here on Friday. Mayhem Freedom wins both events, five and six. Navy Blue did the best it could. Finishes second, it beats Reykjavik by two tenths, right, tenths? That's the first decimal? First decimal. Reykjavik comes in third. <laughs> Those are the overall team standings now. The lead grows for Mayhem Freedom. They were up by six. We'll go down onto the floor now for the introduction of our next event. All right, everybody, if you could please turn your attention to the Jumbotron, we have an announcement regarding tomorrow's first event for our teams and individuals. It's time to get wet. Go. The all division test for the 2022 CrossFit Games is rinse and repeat. All athletes will start on the pool deck and swim 25 yards out and 25 yards back. Then on the first round, you'll ski eight calories. On the second round, you'll swim and then ski 10 calories. On the third round, 12 calories. On the fourth round, 14 calories. On the fifth round, 16 calories. On the sixth round, 18 calories. And if you make it that far, on the seventh round, it's a max calorie opportunity, followed by an eighth round of another max effort opportunity. Each round has a two minute time cap. If you do not complete the work inside the two minute time cap, you do not advance to the next round. Max Calories wins.
day number three of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games coming to a close here. One event remains for the men and the women. We are inside the Coliseum at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Worland with Chase Ingram, five-time individual games competitor and the 2011 Open champion, Dan Bailey in the booth. And Mike Arsenault is down on the competition floor. Chase, for this event, we're going to get inverted because Adrian Bosman has decided that the data on the handstand push-up is inaccurate. Pause while hurt feelings are loading because we are getting inverted, as you said. We are facing the wall instead of having our back to the wall. Don't worry about the bike. You got 30 reps of block deficit handstand push-ups in between all of those. But at the end, if it comes down to a race, it's going to be a nasty finish. Back to basics. If you look at the old school journal, there is a two-part series by Carl Paoli, and it inverted is the way you should have started when you learned this back in the day. And if you got it, great. If not, you're gonna be standing looking at that plexiglass wall for quite a while. And for more on that wall-facing handstand push-up, let's go down to Mike Arsenault. Well, this is the latest iteration of the handstand push-up to appear in CrossFit Games programming. And according to Adrian Bosman, this is the pinnacle of the movement because it basically forces the athletes into an upside down reverse strict, uh, strict press position. And the athletes are unable to rest their head on the ground at the bottom of each rep. He first saw this version, uh, learned it from an instructor at an acrobat school who would do this version of the movement daily off the edge of a set of bleachers. That was back in 2003. So this test for the athletes is literally two decades in the making. First of four heats for the men. Lane number four, rookie Cole Greasaber comes in in 33rd place overall. And he had a decent showing night one in Elizabeth Plus Plus. And we had the traverse dips on the parallel bar. Now something that can tie into today's movement is every time you get up to the wall, you have to do a wall walk essentially in that position. So every set you do has its own inverted traverse. And that was one of the most underestimated parts that disrupted everybody in Elizabeth. And there is Colton Mertens, 32nd overall after six events. I think of the two different movements we have, the Echo Bike, as far as Merton's size, definitely not his friend, but his ability to do high volume, high skill gymnastics. This is one of those athletes that can benefit from actually having success on the wall relative to some of the other athletes. We are underway, we start with the 30 calories on the Echo Press, on the Echo Bike here in Echo Press. Dan, this is a, an event you got to test extensively. When you first kicked up into that wall facing handstand, what kind of adjustments did you have to make to make sure that you could get that movement done? A handstand push-ups have always been one of my best movements in any competition. So, I mean, I was excited to see this come out, but also a little nervous in how it was going to affect it. And so I was kind of paying attention to how wide did I want to put my hands? Where was I comfortable? And you nailed it with that wall walk getting up into the handstand push-up. It takes a lot out of you. So if you get up there and you're like, oh my goodness, like I'm already too tired to even do one, you might have to pause and wait. And that definitely played a factor into the latter rounds of 10. But as soon as I kind of figured out, what worked out for me was keeping my hands a little bit narrower. And it almost felt like bouncing out of the bottom of a squat. So my arms would, my bicep would basically touch off my forearm and give me a little extra push out the bottom. So I stayed more narrow. I'll be interested to see what the athletes choose to do in terms of where their hand placement is. Lawrence Fiebix judges hand is in the air as he is done with his first 30 calories. And now there's 10 wall facing handstand push ups. And as you said, one of the hardest parts is just getting into position before the hardest part <laughs> of the entire movement. You almost have to take a little jump with your hands and kind of push yourself off the floor to get that big step up. Andre Uday is also on to the wall. Now, one thing to note, these athletes did have an opportunity to practice this in the back, unlike some other implements we've seen so far, the parallel bars with the dips during Elizabeth, the strict pegboards for the skills test. They didn't have an opportunity to do that. They had to set up with these specific blocks to allow them an opportunity to work on this. And Colton Mearns and Andre Uday will be the first two men back to the bike. Now 20 calories and Tudor Magda 
On the bottom of your screen in the black shorts is in third. I don't want to say that the Echo Bike calories are inconsequential, but you could definitely ruin your workout on the Echo Bike here. If you press too hard on these calories and it costs you on the handstand push-ups, you're going to end up wasting a lot more time staring at that wall if you tire yourself out on the bike. Andre Uday at the 60 rep mark will be able to move on. And this is where we were talking to Adrian Bosman. He said, you know, the bigger athletes who don't like the handstand push-up are going to be able to make up some ground on the smaller guys like Colt Mertens who do like that movement. I think in the, the middle part to your point, Sean, is really where Mertens can, can make his move with the smaller sets of canals on the echo bike, but his proficiency in these handstand push-ups. Correct. If you're doing the handstand push-ups unbroken, it's going to be hard for a bigger athlete to come in behind you and waste himself on the echo bike to catch up with you. Because you can make up a lot of time by not making any breaks on the handstand push-ups. Andre Uday is the first man back to the wall for his second set of 10 hands and push-ups. And here comes Colton Mertens. The 70 rep mark is when the two of them will move on. And Uday right now with a three rep lead on Mertens. I mean, look at this range of motion, Sean. Five on the right. Watch him come down. The bottom of the tape line is where he has to get past. He didn't crest that. On the second rep, the top of the head gets clearly below. So for the standard for the men, that thickness of the line. Men have to get below the tape line, where women have to just get to the tape line. There's Colt Mertens, as Tudor Magda has now passed Uday for the lead, and Mertens and Magda off the wall at the same time. Magda going right to the bike. Mertens actually has a couple to go. So Tudor Magda all by himself in first place. And here comes Andre Uday on the left side of your screen to join Magda on the bike. You can see Magda there at the first couple calories. He didn't even put his hands on the handles. He's just trying to save his arms, save his triceps from that fatigue because he knows he's got that last set of handstand push-ups coming up. Dan, I love that you pointed that out because when you look at an echo bike, different than, say, a Concept 2 bike or a road bike we saw earlier, that it's all lower body. Maybe resting your arms there gets tiring, but with an echo bike, a key element of moving that well is using your arms, which you need for the last set of 10. Correct. When I was on the bike, if I used my arms at all, I was thinking pull back. Very little anything for the push, and obviously a lot with the legs. The, the tricky part, especially if the athletes aren't used to the volume of these reps for the inverted handstand push-ups, is, like we said, the wall walk itself, taking away really from your lockout getting through the top and, and messing with that shoulder stability and stamina. And then you have to decide, it's like, is it worth me breaking, maybe with two or three left to go and having to traverse up or toughing it out for a full set of 10? Well, the one thing that the larger athletes definitely have to think about is, I want to choose how I'm going to break these reps up. I don't want my body to choose it for me in failing. Because once you fail that rep, again, that rep doesn't count. All of the time that you're taking to wait to recover, and then all the time it takes you to get back on the wall is the amount of time that that rep costs you. It's incredibly costly in a workout like this when you're with the top 1% of the 1% athletes in the world. Andre Uday and Tudor Magda are your leaders. Colton Mertens is on. His final set of 10, and it's 30 final calories on the bike to close this thing out. And you think about coming down to a bike race between Uday, Magda, and Mertens. Mertens almost doesn't really have a choice to put himself into a red line to get off the wall ahead of these athletes. Yeah, he's got to get ahead because 30 calories is going to go very, very quick here for these athletes at the finish. There's nothing after that, so there's no excuse to pace. I want to see it. I want to see all these guys get on that bike at about the same time. It's a super exciting finish. Programming in your affiliate or even just doing normal training, when you see a monostructural element at the end with the machine, you know it's just going to be a brutal event. It's agony. If you have any experience at the gym and you see that pop up ending on a 200 meter run, 400 meter run, 20 cal echo, you know you're in for it. We just saw Tudor Magda fail a rep as Andre Uday is trying to get through this set of 10. And he is done. And he will move on. Actually, he has a couple left now. He has a handful of reps left. Let's go down to Mike Arsenault. 
I have a question for Chase and Dan. As we take a look at Tudor Magda in lane number eight, he has his hands wrapped on the edge of the box, of the block. So I'm curious, what? Uh, why would he use that technique, having the hands on the edge of the block instead of right on the right on the flat? He's using the corner. We'll answer that in one second, but this is a race now for first between Andre Uday and Colton Mertens. Mertens was pedaling for his life before Andre Uday got on that thing, and Uday has got to get to 130. And Mertens did exactly what we said he had to do. He had to get off the wall first with any opportunity to not get caught by Andre Uday. Right, put himself in the right spot. Let's see if he can finish it off. The 10 calories remaining, seven now for Andre Uday. Hand in the air for Mertens, and it's going to be Andre Uday who wins heat number one. 744.44 seconds. Mertens getting set to finish up. And here's Colton Mertens across. Now, if you want to deal with Mike Arsenault's question. <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of it just comes down to comfort. What are you most comfortable with, uh, with putting your hands over the edge? And also, I, I know that I had my hands kind of over the edge, and it felt like a more stable position for my wrist. I don't know really how to explain that. I just know as an athlete, that's where I wanted him to go. And once I was there, I was like, yes, this is where I need to be. And when you think about that, if you have your hands flat, you're going to get a bit more flexion in the wrist. And Correct. fingers over the, the edge mimics really kind of what a barbell press should feel like. Correct. Tudor Magda slides across. 828.21 seconds for Magda. Magnus and Raquel May is your leader on the floor. Ten minute time cap for the men. And Raquel May is going to get in no problem. Georges Karabas has four handstand push-ups remaining in those 30 calories. Well, Dan, that, that finish at the end, we're talking about how nasty it is to end on an, a movement such as this, but I think it's even worse to finish next to somebody. Yep. I would really like to run this last 400 alone. <laughs> alone, at I, my own pace. Yeah, I don't want to run away from someone to just make it that much more stressful. Correct. The agony here, too, is if you're running, you can kind of tell. You can gauge the distance. On the bike, you don't know. You don't know where someone's at. There's no excuse to slow down or no chance you have of knowing where your competitor is. Yoris Karabas has 23 calories to go and probably going to run out of time, but a great effort from Karabas here in the final seconds of the opening heat. And event number seven for the men, the final event that they will face here on Friday. But Andre Uday, 744.44 seconds. Colton Mertens got to the bike first. So Mertens hit the final stretch on these last set of handstand push-ups was doing exactly what he needed to do. He didn't even have a choice, and he just tried to max it out with the potential of getting that one more. He did get on the bike before Andre Uday, but Uday's power output outmatched Mertens at the end to give him the win. Andre Uday has the top time, 744.44 seconds. Colton Mertens will finish second, and Tudor Magda takes third. Back in a bit with Heat number two for the men.
Echo Press, the seventh event of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games underway here in the Coliseum of the Alliant Energy Center. Keys to success, the recipe for success for this event. And when we say back to the basics, we harken back to what the basic principles of an inverted handstand push-up is, and that's body position. Being in the right body position with midline stability is the secret to any style of handstand push-ups. And you either got it or you don't. This is a hard thing to learn on the fly because of the difficulty of this movement. Second of four heats. Enrico Zanoni is coming off a great performance and a heat win earlier today in up and over, and now sits in 25th place coming into this event. Uh, we heard that he, he's practiced deficit handstand push-ups from a freestanding hat position without having his head touch the ground. There's one of those little tricks in this movement that I think people are, are underestimating, not having that below them. Yeah, there's no support there at the bottom. If you have the bottom out, maybe take a little bit of a rest. You don't have that option here. So once you go down and you're not coming back up, that's kind of it. You got to kick off the wall and get ready for your next rep. Brent Fikowski currently sits in 22nd overall. He started the day in 30th. He's slowly climbing up the standings. We are underway, 30 calories on the Echo Bike to start. Andre Uday, the time to beat 7 minutes, 44.44 seconds, as four men out of nine in that opening heat were able to finish this event in its entirety inside the 10 minute time cap. And unfortunately for Brent, he can't dream the handstand push-ups away even if he closes his eyes that long on the bike. But for Brent Fikowski, he actually has a unique skill set based off what we said is back to basics. This is a guy that is a student of the game. He is a student of the methodology. And what Brent Fikowski's biggest weapon is sometimes, adverse to his size, is his ability to get in good positions. We see that no more apparent in his wall walk ability. He is one of the best wall walkers in the game, men or women. And that being one of the things that disrupts the front-facing deficit handstand push-up, I think his attention to detail may be actually a huge asset for Brent Fikowski in this event. The first thing I think of when I think of Brent as an athlete is meticulous. He doesn't leave any stone unturned. And like you mentioned in the wall walk, that's an event that I should be able to handle him pretty well, especially in the open. It was only paired with double unders. Okay, this is something I can still get one of the elite athletes with. And he bested me in it by a lot. That is Jay Crouch, who's on to the wall first, and Crouch with a no rep there. And the top of the head must go below the bottom of the tape line. See, Fikowski on the right, a little shallow, and you can't really see it. That's the other thing. And we talk a lot, is like, you can't really see the depth of your air squat either, so you have to really understand how that feels. So he got the first one. And then on the third one, from this angle, his forehead is leaning up. We talk about good body position. Lifting your forehead is breaking the midline. Back to basics. Being in a nice, stacked torso position is the secret to success on these handstand push-ups. That's another thing we didn't talk about before. When you can't touch your head to the ground, you actually don't know where you've completed the rep or not here. Unless you get those good reps, okay, now I have some memory, some body position memory of where I need to get back to in the bottom. Jake Crouch is back on the bike along with Enrico Zanoni, who got there first. Zanoni got through his handstand push-ups in 35 seconds. Tim Paulson onto the bike. Now here's Heinrich Hapalainen. Dimajero's coming to the bike as well now. You know, Dan, we talk about midline stability, core strength, all that stacking on top of each other. It's really easy to say if this was the only event you were going to do for the day. But if you look at the totality of things that have happened already, the capital, you 20 pig flips, three and a half mile run, the carry, the Husafel bag. And then we look at the 90 GHD sit-ups, the front rack walking lunge. It's not like you haven't been taxed in pretty much everything you need for these handstand push-ups. Right, add on top of that the uh, P-bars and all of the <laughs> tricep burn, and now we're going to turn you inverted and ask you to do a different kind of handstand push-up. So this is a big challenge for these guys, like you mentioned, based on all the volume they've done so far this week. Jay Crouch onto the wall for his second set of 10 handstand push-ups. He's just ahead of Enrico Zanoni, who is just now walking to the wall for the second time. Crouch in his 
fifth career crossing games appearance. His third as an individual. He's a team competitor twice in 2018 and then again in 2019. The rebound cross with Frankson's team. And last year at the games, he was 22nd overall. I mean, Zanoni is really impressing me on the left. And not, some of that, too, is just his arm length, but his arm width position to be that strong in that position is very impressive. When I'm watching these guys do this, I'm actually looking for the speed they're coming out of the bottom. That's very indicative of how well they're handling these handstand push-ups. And he's coming out of the bottom of those handstand push-ups very, very fast. And Zanoni got through those handstand push-ups in less than 40 seconds. So he, by far, has had the fastest pace on that movement we have seen. And Crouch trying to get through these. You know, when you get in that inverted position, if you tip the scales a little bit out to the side, you, know, you got to make sure you keep that stable position. Sometimes when we get fatigued, especially in a regular handstand, we tend to arch at the back, throw that head back a little bit. That's that's the old school way of doing handstand push-ups. No option here for that, really. <laughs> <laughs> You're limited for sure. Jay Crouch is now done, and he'll join Zanoni on the bike. The 90 rep mark is when Zanoni will move back to the wall for the final time. So he's halfway through his 20 calorie ride as Dima Hieros has moved into third. Jake Crouch had his best event finish in event number four. That was Elizabeth elevated when he took 14. This second to last bike here, all I'm thinking about is, hey, manage the fatigue. Get yourself geared up for these last set of handstand push-ups. Zanoni is now done, and he has just 10 handstand push-ups remaining. And so far, he's been able to go unbroken on the prior two sets. Oh, he looks good in these first couple. for Enrico Zanoni and now 30 calories left on the echo bike. 744.44 seconds is the time to beat Zanoni. Looks like he's going to smash that. Zanoni's handstand push-up times, 35 seconds, 39 seconds, 42 seconds. I mean, just think about that time inverted alone without doing handstand push-ups. That's a feat in and of itself for most people. Aguima Heros and Jay Crouch are fighting for second place in this heat. They're towards the bottom of your screen. Mahieros really arching to get himself that's pushing him that rep. Having to go way deeper, too. But the more he arches, like Chase mentioned before, the further down he's got to go to make that standard. And if you want to think of how that feels, if you guys are watching at home, just think of a strict press with a barbell. If you arch your back and lean back to press that up, it's a much more difficult press to do. It's just so strong overhead. Final calories for Enrico Zanoni. And Enrico Zanoni is having a day here on Friday at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. 707.08 seconds. And now, I have to over to second place. Aguima Heros is now on the bike. He is ahead of Jay Crouch, who's still on the wall there in lane five. Heinrich Hoppelein is in lane four. He's on his final set. And Tim Paulson is down in lane one. Andre Uday's time is going to be good enough for second place right now with two heats remaining. The next best time is 755.89 seconds from Colton Mertens, and Mayeros is getting close to that. I don't know about you, Chase, but that's usually where I'm at when I'm feeling it on the Echo Bike. <laughs> Head down, I'm not looking at the monitor. I know I'm not there yet. Just keep grinding. The judge will tell me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might know, can slide into fourth place now in the event, second place in the heat. 810.56 seconds. I 
at least Jay Crouch, Heinrich Apollina, and Tim Paulson fighting for the lead. All three of them have three reps remaining on their handstand push-ups. Hapalainen is on the left, and Jake Crouch is on the right. He has just one left remaining. One left, I should say, does Jake Crouch. Tim Paulson on the left. Talked to him uh, before we came out. He said he was feeling good. And looking forward to executing here. And Paulson has a minute left to go before we hit the time gap. Meanwhile, Brent Fakowski is still on his final 20 calories on the bike. But Brent Fakowski, who's been slowly climbing up the leaderboard, is Tim Paulson oh, is riding oh, that thing. Yes! Send it to him! arms are going to fall off. And Paulson's got a shot. Tim Paulson yes. is in. Heppel Leiden is in. Look up max effort in the dictionary. <laughs> that guy screamed, witness me, before he jumped on the bike. <laughs> and he is awaited. All that's missing is some chrome spray paint on his grill. My goodness. That was unbelievable. I'd like to get that split, actually. <laughs> what was that 30 cows in? Let's take a look. Tim. Oh, I saw. All I saw was Will Ferrell and other guys just screaming America and putting the pedal down to the ground <laughs> oh, in the press. But Enrico Zanoni at 707.08 seconds is your heat winner. And he did it with unbroken sets on the wall for those handstand push ups. He had a look. Almost like you had to look back, it's like, we're good, right? Nobody else? What a day for Enrico Zanoni. Two heat wins. Once again, four men are able to finish inside the 10 minute time cap. Tim Paul's a 946.46 seconds. They might want to replace that echo bike out there because Tim Paulson may have just tested the structural integrity of that thing. Heinrich Hapalainen finishes in 948.98 seconds. Heat three coming up next. Halfway through event number seven for the men, the final event that they will face here on Friday at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Glad you're with us, everyone. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram, and five-time individual CrossFit Games competitor and 2011 Open champion Dan Bailey joining us in the booth. Event seven has been exciting so far. It is the Echo Press presented by Monster Hydro. Echo Press is we like to call the press, 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 because that is the crux of this event. New movement as far as standard and body position as they have to face the wall. We've gotten so good at handstand walks, holds, handstand push-ups with deficits on parallettes. It's time to go back to basics for body position and strict shoulder strength. Heat number three of four. Ten men on the floor for this. Uldis Upniks out of Latvia in lane number six. 
former gymnastics background. In fact, we were talking earlier about things he worked on, and parallel bar traverses was one of those challenges that they had when he was a, a, a younger gentleman. And when you think about the traverses in Wednesday night and the handstand walks interfering with those two moves between the dips and the handstand push-ups. Stand by. Heat three underway, 707.08 seven seconds. And when we last talked to you, we were trying to figure out what Tim Paulson's time on the Echo Bike was. 29.9 seconds for those last 30 calories. Sparks were flying. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Paulson testing the structural integrity of the Echo Bike. I thought he was going to rip a hole in the space time continuum. Well, they have safety factors for everything, and usually it's in the engineering. And now we've decided that the safety factor of how many Tim Paulsons can this sustain <laughs> as far as stress tests on the Echo Bike. Thank you for your efforts, Tim Paulson. 30 calories to start here, then those 10 wall facing handstand push ups. There is Uldis Upniks. You know, one of the things I'm looking at, Chase, when these guys get off the Echo Bike is when they go over to the wall, how long do they take before they do their first wall walk into it? And I always kind of ask the question if you came over to the wall and you stood and you took like 10 breaths, why did you bike so hard? <laughs> Uldis Upniks, if you take a look at Nick Matthew Ucknicks is the next lane over. He has an event win in the running portion of event number two. One he thing was that, ninth and up and over. And one thing I'm thinking about with Nick Matthew is that he won the skills event for the gymnastics on day number one. Yeah, is this something that he's played around with as well? Jason Hopper was the first man off the bike. We talked about body position as far as going back to basics, midline stability, keeping that spine intact, not hyperextending at the midline as you press through. This isn't a basic movement. It's far from it. But to be successful at it, going back to the basics of body positions, hollow bodies, stacked midline, stacked vertebrae to maximize your strength is the secret to this movement. That's some of the wrinkles that I love that have been thrown into the programming so far. Will Morad to the bike first for his 20 calories. Jason Hopper was right behind him. Travis Mayer got there third, and then Yona Kosi between Mayer and Morad. Morad's best finish coming in the third event. Finished sixth in the Speed Skills medley. Just the, the story of Morad just getting here with the greatest comeback in a final event to get to the games by one point. So no strangers to some high pressure situations. Now, he's been competing for a long time. I competed against Will in 2014, as far back as 2014. So he's been in the game for a very long time. He's definitely a veteran in the sport. Following the 2021 games, he found out that his wife Cass had breast cancer. And she's currently doing well and recently announced that she was cancer free. That was back in March. So. Will Morad has had a stressful last year. With Jason Hopper we talk back about, to the wall for the second time. You touch on strength and weaknesses. Boz was telling us this in the meeting briefing to this, is that if this isn't the best movement for you, you can at least put some effort in on the bike. But on the flip side, you could be great at this and maybe not so much. Hopper just getting a no rep. Again, crest of that head needs to go below the tape line. And this is something that rewards the best of both, which is everything that we've been the methodology lays out to begin with. We're very greedy demographic <laughs> of athletes. Would you like to be strong or fast? Is like I want it all. Yes, both, please. That middle lever between the vanilla and chocolate. I'll have the swirl fitness, please. But Will Morad is off the wall behind Jason Hopper. And Morad has had the fastest splits on the handstand push-ups in this heat. Less than 30 seconds on his first set of 10, about 34 seconds on his second set. And that's where he is keeping even with Jason Hopper. I'm very impressed with Jason Hopper right now. As a bigger gentleman, I wouldn't have picked him to be in the front of the pack or in the lead of the pack with some of these other guys. What's benefiting him is the speed he has on the machines to get himself at least ahead of Morad, who's having the faster pace on the handstand push-ups. And he's even been no repped a couple times on the handstand push-ups, and he's still staying on the wall and getting them done. Great result for Hopper in event number two. Two finishes inside the top eight. 
And then event five, the capital, he finished fifth, but followed up with a 30th in the last event. Hopper looking over to see the judge's hand for Will Morad, trying to guess maybe how much time he can afford to either slow down a little bit on the bike or maybe take one break on the handstand push-ups. Hopper to his final set of 10 handstand push-ups and then 30 calories on the bike. As we pass the five minute mark, 707.08 seconds from Enrico Zanoni in Heat 2 is your time to beat. And Morad is done on the bike and he is getting onto the wall. Hopper has five to go. And Will Morad is moving well on his third and final set of 10. Now for Morad, he's got to get off the wall before Hopper. There is, other than maybe what we saw from Tim Paulson, not many better on the bike than Jason Hopper. Morad with one more rep. See, Hopper brought his stance in on his hands to help that overhead position. Morad is through onto the bike. Hopper is done. Oh, he's got one more. He has one more, pardon me. Will Morad. Hopper's going to have to take a chance if he wants to catch Morad. Hopper's got a couple more. Will Morad inching closer to that 130 rep mark. Now Morad has company on the bike as Jason Hopper gets to work. I would be very impressed if Hopper caught him. I don't Morad is almost done. His score is behind. His judge's hand is in the air. Morad is done. Morad is in. And Morad is our new leader. Six thirty point one five seconds for Will Morad. We were talking before we came out with Adrian Bosman about the best time in testing with Street Horner, who did it in 7.30. And Boss thought that was a pretty solid time that we might not see go down. Well, Morad just blasted it by a minute. Hopper is in. Super impressed with his ability to do these handstand push-ups. Yes. That was amazing. Right now, second place in the event as he edges out Zanoni by 10 seconds. Here's Spencer Panchik. Spencer Panting gets across, 738.91 seconds. Leona Koski is your leader on the floor. Only man on his final 30 calorie fight. Ten minute time cap. Now Cole Sager is off the wall on the far side and he's on the bike. <laughs> and Cole Sager going full Paulson here. Kolsky trying to hold off Sager here. And Coach Sager, judge's hand is in the air. Kolsky's judge's hand is in the air. Sager is in. And Yoda Kolsky is across. I think about Pat Sherwood when he says, who wants to dance with the devil? <laughs> and Cole Sager put up his hand. Dan, it's one of those where when it's over, it's not over. Oh, no. It's not to get much worse over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, that's one of the beauties about this kind of calorie count and that kind of max effort. In the moment, it hurts, but you go a little numb. You just kind of can't feel it anymore. But then once everything ends, the rush of pain that surges into the legs is excruciating. And Nick Matthew and Ulus Utnix are onto the bike as Alexander Carone is onto the bike for the final time. Less than 30 seconds to go. 
Perot is off. He will finish. 20 seconds. Matthew's got a chance. And Matthew does it. And it doesn't look like Uldas Uthings is going to get across the finish line, but he does complete all the reps. And there is the Nick Matthew cheering section. All rocking the crop top. Most of them rocking the crop top. But Will Morad. And we this on the handstand push up. This is the second kind of tale of two athlete battle we've seen in the last two heats. And for Will Morad, his benefit was his ability to do the handstand push ups. And, but the guy has a lot of power packed into that body. And he was able to hold off Jason Hopper at the end. And Will Morad sets the time to beat six minutes, 30.15 seconds. Jason Hopper will take second in the heat right now, second best time in the event. Spencer Panchik at 738.91 seconds, followed by Cole Sager, Yonikoski, Alexander Corona, the Nick Matthews sneaking in with just a couple of seconds to spare. Final heat for the men. Coming up next here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Glad you're with us, everybody. That's where we started this morning in that great capital event. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram, five-time individual CrossFit Games competitor Dan Bailey joins us in the booth, and Mike Arsenault is down on the competition floor. Overall standings. After six events, it's Ricky Garrard, who is still in first place. He has an 87-point lead over Justin Medeiros. Roman Krennikov now sits in third. Jeff Adler and Sam Clutt rounding out the top five. Echo Press is event number seven, and it has been a lot of fun so far. What's been great is we put so much emphasis on the difficulty of the handstand pushes, potentially, but the caliber of athletes as we go from heat to heat is starting to make it an Echo Bike event. And we're looking for the, where can you succeed? We've mastered the handstand push-up as we traditionally know it in the sport of CrossFit. Going back to basics and going into body positions, strict press, maximizing your strength potential with those body positions. That is all needed for these handstand push-ups. Ten men in this fourth and final heat. They're all trying to chase down Will Morad's time of six minutes, 30.15 seconds. Ricky Garrard has worn the leader's jersey from the get-go. And he looks to hang on to it here. Ricky Garrard in the Coliseum Friday night. What a day for Ricky. What a couple of days for Ricky Garrard. Takes the capital event and then hangs in the top for the previous one that we've had today. Top to bottom, Ricky Garrard has had himself a heck of a day. Let's go down to Mike Arsenault on the competition floor. Making a move toward the podium with the 6th and 13th place finish so far today. Unfortunately, that also included a 38th on elevated Elizabeth. That was very taxing on shoulders and triceps, uh, similar to what will be impacted uh, here in event number 7 with the handstand push-ups. However, that was the first time he was ever on parallel bars. So it was a technique issue, not a strength issue. He regularly does while facing handstand push-ups in his everyday programming. So. For today, he will have a much better chance here in event number seven. There is Justin Medeiros who sits in second place. Jeff Adler is currently in fourth. So Medeiros is now in a position that we saw Pat Vellner last year. He's got to start finding a way to beat Ricky Garrard and get some help in the process to cut into that 87-point lead. And here we go, 30 calories to start on the Echo Bike. Take you to the year 2005, Sean, when a little affiliate opened in San Francisco with some box containers in a back parking lot called San Francisco CrossFit. Four main coaches there, Kelly Starrett, Carl Paoli, Diane Fu, and one Mr. Adrian Bosman. When you think of some of the greats that have come from that affiliate, 
to now. One of the basics of gymnastics training, you go to the journal and just look up handstand push-up progression, you will not see one single handstand push-up as we traditionally know with our back to the wall. They said you have to earn that position by doing push-ups in a hollow body, walking halfway up the wall with a hollow body, facing the wall vertically with a hollow body, and then doing a handstand push-up from that facing position. It's not that this necessarily was the RX Plus version of a handstand push-up, but you had to earn your right to put your back to the wall. That's where we are nearly 15, 18 years later. And if you're not using the very things that you're talking about, it may not cost you a lot on the first set of 10. It may start to wear on you in the second set of 10. But by the third, if you're not doing all those cues that you just mentioned, you're going to be taking a lot of breaks in between reps. Roman Krennikov, the first man to his initial set of 10 handstand push-ups. Ricky Garrard's judge's hand is in the air. Here comes Jeff Adler and Lazar Jukic to join Krennikov on the wall. Sam Watt as well. Noah Olson and Justin Medeiros. And now Ricky Garrard is on the wall. Oh, host man getting to the wall at the same time here. Krennikov with one more to go. And he's done. Back to the plate goes Roman Krennikov trying to overtake Justin Medeiros. Roman for second place overall. I tell you what, Sean, I am so impressed by the way Roman Krennikov has built himself over the last four years. Traditionally known as a work capacity athlete, a grinder, somebody who loves the pain cave and the machines. Decent at gymnastics, his weakness, weightlifting. And what he did was he put 20 pounds on his body to, able to, to be able to handle a barbell. Usually that comes at a cost of things like work capacity, conditioning, and gymnastics. It hasn't come at a cost for Roman Krennikov, which I think is incredible. He's, he's a guy I competed against in 2019 at the Filthy 150 event, and I saw him succeed at some of the very events you're talking about, work capacity things. When the barbell rolled out, I thought, okay, this guy's gonna fall to the bottom of the leaderboard, and he did it. It was a max snatch, he was right there with the other best competitors, and I'm like, man, if this guy can never get to the games, he's gonna do a lot of damage. Roman Krennikov is your leader, and he has now closed out his set of 20 calories back to the wall. Noah Olsen and Justin Medeiros were the next two men to the plate. Ricky Garrard was towards the back here. Krennikov to his second set of 10. Dan, we're talking about what you do in the bike. Look at Ricky on the left side. It almost looks, he's resting a bit more in his arms, but earlier, it looked like it was actually pretty heavy on the upper body and not using, a, utilizing the legs that you think you should if you're gonna go back upside down. Yeah, I mean, it could be just part of his strategy. You really see he's cruising now, but if you know that you're gonna come off that bike and it's gonna cost you on that first rep, there's no sense in pushing yourself there. If you can get these handstand push-ups unbroken, it's gonna be the best result for you in this event. Noah Olson is in second in place as Saxon Pantic has moved into third. Jeff Adler and Justin Medeiros tied for fourth as Roman Krennikov is back to the bike and Ricky Garrard is still pedaling on his first set of 20. A Pat Felder on the left side of your screen getting to his set of 10 handstand pushes for the second time as Roman Krennikov is all by himself in front. Time to beat is Will Morad's 6.30.15 seconds. Saxon Pantic is creeping up on Noah Olsen. Roman Krennikov has got to hit the 90 rep mark. He's got five calories to go before it's back to the wall one final time. Now here comes Saxon Pantic. Take a look at what Roman Krennikov has done so far here. Worst finish was in the last event when he took 15th. And Krennikov is done. Ricky Garrard is falling back here. Ricky Garrard is taking his second break. You can see him in the very back on his second set of handstand push-ups. Krennikov with a break. He has six remaining. Pat oh. Felder is done with his second set of ten. He's on to the bike. Ricky just failed a rep and failed it deep in that handstand push-up. You can see when he starts pushing out of the bottom, he has no speed and his arms are literally shaking. Four, 
having trouble getting up onto the wall even. And you see that midline, that real big hyperextension for Ricky. Another no rep, he did not get to depth there. And when you arch your back and you go immediately into that lean back position, the amount of power you can recruit from your body is nearly cut in half. Saxon Pantic and Judson Medeiros down to the wall at the same time. So Medeiros came in 87 points back of Roman Krennikov and looking to shave a significant amount off of that deficit. As Gerard is now done and he'll get to the bike. He and Sam Clark, two of the last three men on the wall. Lazar Jukic is still on his second set of 10. Krennikov has one rep to go and he's to the bike. Start your clock. Looks like Will Morad is going to win the event, but Roman Krennikov is looking to really put a stranglehold on one of the top three spots in the overall standings. Jason Hopper has the next best time at 657.82 seconds. If Krennikov gets in inside that, he's going to earn 97 points. Here comes Justin Medeiros. And Roman is kicking it into another gear as Medeiros is starting to put the pressure on him. Krennikov is done and he is in second place for Roman Krennikov. The Justin Medeiros now. Correct that. Krennikov is going to finish third, 702.22. So Medeiros. Now looking at a fifth place finish. So Medeiros is in. Fifth place in the event, that'll give him 88 points. And Ricky Garrard is still on his final set of 10 handstand push-ups. He is really just staring straight down at the floor every time he goes to bottom those out, where he wants his head is tucked back looking at the wall behind him. And he look at those positionings, it's just, Max fatigue. He's reaching for anything that he can to try to get the next rep. The Saxon Pantic is on the bike. He's on the far right side of your screen. And Pat Velner is across. The Velner coming in in ninth place in the event. Saxon Pantic is across. He'll take 11th. The Ricky Garrard came in with an 87 point lead, and that is going to get much smaller heading into the weekend. This is a super frustrating place to be as an athlete because at some point there's just nothing else you can do. You weren't completely prepared for this movement, you're not going to gain a whole lot of technical skill in it in the event. You just have to get on there, send it, and do your best. Another fail for Ricky Garrard. Less than a minute to go. Gumanson is done. That's going to be 16th in the event for Bjorn and Carl Gumanson. Olsen is in. As is Jeff Adler, leaving Sam Quant, Ricky Gerard, and Lazar Jukic still on the floor. Sam Quant cranking away and trying to get it inside that 10 minute time cap. Judge's hand in the air for Quant. Three seconds to go. Quant looks like he did it. Sam Quant did not get across the finish line. Oh, he did by two one hundredths of a second. <laughs> oh, I love it. He makes it. Now, Ricky Garrard unofficially is going to finish 28th. Which now, means that. Justin Medeiros 
shaved 62 points off that deficit. That's why we keep playing the game, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are about to see what Ricky Garrard is really made of. He's what? had a nice, great weekend up to this point. Just took one on the head. We got two more days to find out what that is. Ricky Garrard not nearly as happy as Roman Krennikov was. Krennikov in his first in-person appearance at the CrossFit Games, and he is having a heck of a weekend so far. Roman Krennikov, he's one of the best on the machines. And he proved that, but Ricky Garrard showed where the weakness was. And this is what we said is body position, going back to the basics. It's not that you should have known it's inverted, but knowing what a good body position should feel like under fatigue. Good technique will always trump absolute strength when it comes down to fatigue elements out here on the field. Especially with all these other competitors who are so amazing. Ricky Garrard with his worst event finish so far. He does look like he's going to hang on to the overall lead, but Justin Madera's just got a lot closer. Will Morad is going to wind up winning the event. Six minutes, 30.15 seconds. Jason Hopper with his best finish of the competition takes second place. And it's Roman Krennikov in third. Let's go down to Mike Arsenault, who's with Will Morad. Will, you made your first appearance at the CrossFit Games back in 2014. It took you until 2022 to get your first event win, and you did it on Friday night in the Coliseum. What was that experience like? Yeah, it's amazing. Competing in front of this amazing group of fans is always a privilege. Thank you, guys. Um, and really, it was just trusting my abilities on that workout and uh, just doing what I do every day in training. So pretty happy about that. You're a veteran in this sport, and you've seen a lot of iterations of handstand push-ups. Where does this one rank? I think it's my favorite, right? I won the event. <laughs> so, yeah. And what does it mean to you to still be able to qualify and compete on this floor in front of all these fans this far along, almost a decade into your CrossFit Games career? Man, it never gets old. Like I said, these people are amazing. Um, the communities that we work out with every day are amazing, so it means the world. Congratulations, 100 points here in event number seven. Thank you. Ricky Garrard is still your leader, but now Justin Medeiros only 25 points back. Roman Krennikov stays in third, and he's only 21 back of Justin Medeiros. And Jeff Adler and Pat Vellner rounding out the top five. Saxon Panjic moves into sixth, and Sam Blunt in seventh. We will catch our breath and set up for the women's version of Echo Press. Don't go away, everybody. CrossFit Games are sponsored by U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Noble. No excuses, no shortcuts, no gimmicks, no tomorrows. Noble. Monster Hydro, the official energy drink of the Noble CrossFit Games. Thor, the official supplement partner of CrossFit. And Halo the official ring of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. fun under the lights here in the Coliseum at the Alliant Energy Center as day number three for the individuals comes to a close. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Sean Worthland with Chase Ingram and the Sticky Brazer down on the competition floor. Event number seven, if you watch the men, 
It's a blast. Man, I think the floor is still on fire after what we just saw in that last heap. And here we go for the women. Echo Bike Cows dropping every number by five for the bike, changing nothing for the handstand push-ups. Looking at the wall, you got to get inverted, you got to face the wall. Back to the basics for body positions and maximizing the power with good positioning. And you either got it or you don't. We've seen this play out on the men's side. We've seen a lot of people get stopped in their tracks on these blocks. That's your recipe for success presented by Trifecta. Let's go down to the competition floor with Nikki Brazier. A couple different standards here for the ladies from the men that you just saw. First, the time cap has increased. It's 12 minutes instead of 10. And the second difference is the standard on the handstand push-ups. Fisa Gothi from the demo team is going to demonstrate for us so that we can see. It has to do with the line down here that shows when the rep is complete. Now, the ladies will do their deficit handstand push-ups just so that their head passes into the plane of this white line. The men, when you watched them previously, had to pass all the way through the line. Thank you, Fee. Think of it like a wall ball. Oftentimes, that line is thick on the wall. The men have to go all the way above it, and the women just have to enter it. That's the main difference. Nine women in this first of four heats. We'll see how they handle this new movement. A lot of rookies here. In heat number one, Sola Sigur daughter, Elena Caratala Salahuya, Christine Kohlenbrander, Freya Moosbrugger, and Julia Cato. That is Elena Caratala Salahuya. Has had a decent run so far. 35th place overall, but has had, like you said, some solid performances. Yeah, she's, she's had some moments. This definitely being another unique test for these athletes. And we, one thing we saw Wednesday night with Elizabeth elevated, the traversing across the parallel bars di disrupting the lockout for the dip. And we'll see the same thing here for the wall as they'll have to wall walk their way into position, step up onto the block. That's going to be another task for these athletes to take on before they can even get into their handstand push-ups. Ladies and 25 calories to start here for the women on the echo bike. Depending on an athlete's skill set or even ability to do these, even this opening 25 cows is that we've seen that it's not necessarily one on the bike here. If you have comp competency in both, you can use that to your advantage, but the first set of 25 is just a buy-in. You want to stay relaxed on your arms, make sure you're breathing freely. You know, you don't want to trigger any type of response as far as like muscular fatigue too soon because, listen, it's been a heck of a day. We had the capital run. We've had the previous event with the muscle-ups, the jump-overs, the 90 GG sit-ups, and a challenging front rack lunge. These athletes have been through a lot, and that's just today. That's not to mention the four other events that they had previous to this. So managing that fatigue here in the beginning and not tipping the scales too much in the red on the first bike is imperative because getting inverted is going to be the biggest challenge for these athletes. Sola Sigurdotter is your leader right now through 20 of those initial 25 calories. Freya Moosberg is right on her heels, though, as is Michelle Marin. And Freya Moosbrugger will be first off to the Echo Bike, followed closely by Sung Young Choi and Sola Sugar Daughter. The 10 reps, and as you heard Nikki at the beginning, their head needs to break the plane of that white. Right, it's not to the white, it's through the white. In the top part of that white line where the men had to pass below. There's Caroline Spencer. Looking to go unbroken possibly on here. 
has one remaining, and Caroline Spencer's going to get all 10 done and take the lead and head back to the echo bike now for 15 calories. Good. Putting yourself in good body positions, not making the movement harder than it needs to be. That awareness position, it helps maximize the strength potential in these athletes as opposed to breaking at the midline and losing that power. Caroline Spencer at the 50 rep mark will move on to the wall for the second time. So Young Choi's judge's hand is in the air. Christine Kohlenbrander is the other athlete on the echo bike right now. Colin Brander making her first individual appearance at the CrossFit Games. She's a two-time team competitor with CrossFit 417 in 2017 and again in 2018 as both Sung Young Choi and Caroline Spencer head to the wall. Sola Sigurdotter is moving to the bike. Nice tight midline for Choi. Look at her especially at the top of that rep. Nice and vertical and stacked, a little shallow on that last rep where she got a no rep. Again, you got to make sure that head passes into the white line. The challenge for the judges is the hair blocking that white line. Now, Sigurd daughter got a no rep for that. You can see she is definitely short of the white line. So definitely something judges have been briefed on and looking for as far as the range of motion standards for this event. Caroline Spencer, as Sola Sigurdana works on her 15 calories, Spencer has moved on to the bike for another 15 calories. She's on the bottom left-hand part of your screen. Spencer got ahead on the handstand push-ups after the first round. Choi caught her on the bike going into the second set of handstand push-ups. And you just look at the bike. One of the troubles that smaller athletes have is those handlebars are almost at her face. And that is not a very powerful position if you think the ability of the arms to help the legs. Choi being a, a little bit taller has the ability to put a bit more power into the bike, which allows her to catch up. Here comes Sun Young Choi joining Caroline Spencer on the bike for those 15 calories. After this, it's another 10 handstand push-ups and then those final 25 calories to close things out. 110 total scored repetitions here. Spencer has five calories to go. Spencer, final set of 10 deficit handstand push-ups. Sung Young Choi's judge's hand is in the air. Spencer now with Five remaining as Sung Young Choi gets set for her final set of ten. I think a lot about stabilizing the midline that we spoke of is that, you know, what should that feel like in a gymnastics movement, especially upside down? No different than, say, a max lift. Bracing for a back squat with the midline, both anterior and posterior, just meaning the abs and those back erectors. It's the same brace. It's the same retraction of all those muscle groups to stabilize the spine. It's no different than a gymnastics movement as it does in a weightlifting one. Spencer with two reps remaining here. 12 minute time cap for the women. And that'll get it done for Caroline Spencer. 25 calories remain on the echo bike. And Sung Young Choi still has three reps remaining. And the way she's handled these handstand push-ups from start to finish, that she has an, has an opportunity to have a decent score even from heat number one. So she's got to be sure, as even though she's well ahead of everybody in this heat, three more heats to go. So you just got to sell it here. There's nothing left. It's the last event of the night. You could give yourself an opportunity to pick up some decent points. Sung Young Choi is starting to struggle now with those handstand push-ups with Caroline Spencer. 
needs to get to 110 on her rep counter. Final five for Caroline Spencer. Christine Kohlenbrander is onto the wall for the final time. She's another level 10 gymnast who's competing in this heat. And Spencer is done and she is in. 836.64 seconds for Caroline Spencer. Sung Young Choi is on the bike. Sola Sigur daughter is also on the wall. She's in the background there. Now just getting set to get back up into position to work on her handstand push-ups. Christine Kohlenbrander and Sung Young Choi also working on their final sets. Oh, pardon me, Julia Kato is working on her final set. Sung Young Choi is on the bike for the final time. Sun Young Choi is done. 931.93 seconds. Christine Kohlenbrander, as we approach the 10 minute mark, getting back to work on her final set of handstand push ups. Sigurd daughter still a few reps to go before she'll get back to the bike. There's Julia Cato. And this is that compounding effect we're talking about, about the wall walks taking its toll. Usually, with handstand push-ups with your back to the wall, quick singles is a go-to when we can no longer string together reps. It's not an advantage with this particular move because you have to do the entire walk up the wall and step up to do a movement you're already failing to begin with. It is a tough thing to get reduced to singles on this particular movement. Less than a minute to go before we hit the time cap. And a no rep for Christine Colin Bradley. Sola Superdaughter right now is your leader on the floor. She just has to complete one more rep to get to the bike. She will do it. With 15 seconds to go, Sigurd is just going to try to amass as many calories as she can now. Heat number one is done. Caroline Spencer, 836.64 seconds, takes the heat. Mark that time. That time is going to matter in the later heats for sure. We talked about going back to good body positions and Spencer leaning into that old gymnastics background of hers, and it paid off. The bikes weren't the best thing for her, but the, the way she handled those handstand push-ups definitely offset that as far as the bike is concerned. And doing multiple sets unbroken or one break alone, that's a great time for Caroline Spencer. Only Spencer and Sung Young Choi are able to complete that event in its entirety before the 12 minute time cap. Choi comes in at 931.93 seconds. Three heats remain, heat number two coming up next.
three heats remain here for the women in Echo Press, the seventh event of the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. 25 cals on the bike to start things off, and then it gets real when we get to the wall. 10 reps at each set, three total sets of 10. And we've seen the brakes get slammed on some athletes, and we've seen some athletes succeed because of simple things like body position and maximizing your strength potential in those positions. Easier said than done. This is something that a lot of athletes have done over the years, maybe done for the first time as far as getting in those good positions. And sometimes you got it, sometimes you don't. Recipe for success presented by Trifecta. Your heat to startless. Ten women on the floor here. Elisa Fuliano will be in lane number eight. Eight months ago, diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, realized that her window for making the CrossFit Games was going to be not open for very long. She poured all she had into it this year, and here she is, 26 overall after six events. A lot of driving forces for athletes is you centered around a why. And usually that why needs to be something a bit more personal and concrete. It's not about, I want to make the games. It's not about, I want to lose weight. Those are great goals. But why do you want to do that such thing? And to have that driving force of a why is the reason how she got herself in the first place. And that's a very powerful thing to utilize when you get into events like this. Top time from heat number one belongs to Caroline Spencer, 836.64 seconds. We start with the 25 calories on the Echo Bike. Bailey Rail, who had a great finish in the previous event, one of a handful of athletes to go end to end on that front rack walking lunge towards the finish. Finished eighth in up and over earlier in the day, courtesy of that effort on that 125 pound axle bar, lunging at 84 feet unbroken. And that moved her up to 21st overall. This is a curious test for Danny Spiegel. She's got great power output, one of the stronger athletes in the field, and is fantastic inverted on her hands when you talk about handstand walking. Well, how can that all translate to this inverted forward-facing handstand push-up? I'm curious to see how her strengths can be utilized for a new movement such as this. Judge's hand in the air for Danny Spiegel. She has just a calorie left here. And then she will move to the wall for her first 10 handstand push-ups. So Spiegel off the bike first. Okay, so being that good handstand walker that she is, this wall walk should be no problem. But here's where the challenging part, that step up. Look at that vertical position. Now, foot almost came off the wall, and there comes a balance component of this movement. And sometimes it just takes finding a rhythm and a feel for the movement. And once you dial that in, and you can start replicating that, that's where you start to succeed in this movement. Danny Spiegel. First to the wall, but now she has some company. Ellie Turner, Ellie Turner, Victoria Campos, Karen Freova, Paige Powers, and Alice Gazan. Now the entire field here in heat number two. On to their first set of 10 handstand push-ups. Spiegel is to eight of the 10. Alice Gazan is gonna be done first. Bottom of your screen, she moves back to the bike. We're now 15 calories. Now the one thing for Alex Gazan is that she has one of the heaviest, if not heaviest, bench press in the women's field. Now I alluded to good body positions. Sometimes leaning on brute strength can also be a positive. And for Alex Gazan, I'm looking forward to what her body position looks on this next set of handstand push-ups because just arching at your back, is that the best position? No. But for her strength, having a 248-pound bench press that she did in the quarterfinals, recruiting the chest and front part of the shoulders in any possible form that you can, as well as the triceps, maybe is worth her, her personal benefit to utilize one of her best strengths, which is that brute pressing strength. Danny Spiegel's judge's hand is in the air. She has 
three calories to go, and Alex Gazan's judge's hand is in the air as well. Gazan is a member of that crew out of Las Vegas. The underdogs crew, headed by Justin Potter, as Danny Spiegel makes her way to the wall. That's Sarah Kaya going through her set of 15 calories as Alex Gazan will join Danny Spiegel and now Victoria Campos to the wall, right next to Alex Gazan. Gazan, a former high school lacrosse player in Oregon and told me that she didn't like the fact that she didn't get to play full contact. <laughs> Not someone I want to tassel with in maybe a dark alley if that's your attitude about contact sports. But Gazan on the right side of your screen on the left did three reps to start. Now she, she looks very good. Nice, strong, smooth tempo, but she's breaking on purpose. And we've seen a lot of athletes almost scared away from breaks because of the handstand walk element of making the handstand push-up harder. But for her, since she has such good strength in her upper body pressing, deliberate breaks might be the best thing for her to not go into that red line position that we've seen some athletes get to. Danny Spiegel and Alex Gazan continue to lead here in heat number two. The time to beat belongs to Caroline Spencer, 836.64 seconds to be first to five minute mark. And Danny Spiegel is through set number two. Danny Spiegel's done. Gazan has done two sets of three, followed by a set of two of deliberate breaks. And it's all going to set her up going into this final 10 handstand push ups. Anything can happen. Like I said, you tip that toe into the point of no return at all for this movement. Not only can you lose some time, but you might not be able to get another rep. So it's going to come down to this race between Spiegel and Gazan. Gazan on the bottom of your screen, second woman to the bike for the final set of 15 calories. And Paige Powers up at the top of your screen now in third place. Spiegel the top, lane number three. Started on the bike pretty quick, and she's just trying to get the fan going so you don't have that slow start. But what's unique to the Echo bike, different than other air bikes, is that it doesn't reward you on a curve based off the intensity or the speed that you go. It's pretty linear. You can go faster by going faster, but you don't really get bonus cows by going fast. So getting the fan going really quick and then settling into a pace, it's a much more consistent calorie counter than other air bikes. Danny Spiegel with one calorie to go, and she is done. Now her final set of 10 handstand push-ups. Alice Gazan's judge's hand is in the air. Paige Powers is overtaking Gazan on the bike. Now Spiegel has been breaking really off by feel on the handstand push-ups, not really a consistent rep scheme. Gazan on the last one did two sets of three, two sets of two, but looked very strong while doing it. So the question is, is she going to maybe take a chance here to take one less break off the table and give her an opportunity to match up with Danny Spiegel on the bike? Paige Powers on the left has moved ahead of Alice Gazan for second place. Danny Spiegel has to get six more reps here on the handstand push-ups before she can go back to the bike for her final 25 calories. As Danny's taking a break, Paige Powers is staying on the walls, moving ahead of Spiegel. Powers out with five to go. Powers got to be careful. Make sure we get to that line clearly because you don't want to waste a rep here. Spiegel just got a no rep on the right. Powers with three to go ahead of Spiegel, who has four left. Kazan has five remaining. So hand in the air for Kazan. So like I said, if that's five, that means she took a chance. That's not two sets to three how you get there. Depending on how she feels, this might be an opportunity for get all set and get to the bike. Powers on the far left side of your screen. Short set for Kazan on the right. Paige Powers, I think, has one more rep remaining here. As does Danny Spiegel. Alice Gazan is through seven of her ten, and Victoria Campos is now through two as Spiegel gets to the bike right in front of Paige Powers. 8.36.64 seconds from Caroline Spencer is your top time. 25 calories here need to be completed before you can cross the finish line, and then Spiegel taking on Paige Powers.
110 reps is what they need to complete here, and Spiegel has 12 to go. Caroline Spencer's time is going to survive. Now it's a question. Can anybody slide it inside of Sung Young Choi's second best time of 931.93 seconds? And Danny Spiegel is definitely going to do that. Spiegel is done, and Danny Spiegel comes across to win the Heat second place right now in the event, 857.34 seconds. Nice, consistent race for Spiegel. Kept a good pace and good tempo and timing across all three sets. We talk a lot about Mal O'Brien and Lawson as those teenagers in the field, but Paige Powers has been one of those knocking on the door for a couple of years, and she's also one of those teen phenoms that we have here on the individual women's side. Well, Alex Kazan is on to the bike, and she is across the finish line. Kazan now with the fifth best time at 939.33 seconds. And Victoria Campos trying to close out her event here. 12 minute time gap for the women. Zan had a good last spike. She went for it on that final set of 10. She tried to deviate from the plan. And look, you got to give respect to any athlete that's trying to go out there and win it, not just sit back and just hope it comes to them. seconds to go. Victoria Campos is through 15 of her 25 calories here. Three remaining for Campos. Now one minute remaining. That post is done and she will get across the finish line. 11.06.86 seconds. There's Bailey Rail onto the bike. Sayer Kaya is on the bike as well. Twenty seconds remaining, and Rail has ten calories left. Ten seconds. Three, two, one. Four women in this heat finish the event inside the 12 minute time cap. Danny Spiegel right now, the second best time that we've seen, 8.57.34 seconds. Danny Spiegel, we said at the start, has the skill set based off her strengths to have a successful attempt at this event. And she showed that even though Paige Powers closed pretty hard at the end, Danny Spiegel did what exactly what she needed to get done giving an opportunity to get ahead of Paige Powers on that final 25 Cal Echo bike. Danny Spiegel was able to hold off Paige Powers and comes across the finish line and gets rewarded for her efforts. 8.57.34 seconds, the second best time that we have seen is Caroline Spencer's mark of 8.36.64 is still the top time heading into heat number three. Action continues when we return.
Halfway through the final event of the day for the women here inside the Coliseum at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. It's the Echo Press. We've had a few cracks at this so far. As we look at the balance between the bike and the high skill gymnastics. But we're facing the wall this time for these deficit handstand push-ups. Back to the basics, body positions. Putting yourself in a mechanical advantage of utilizing the strength in your shoulders. Not going at the midline, con getting compressed in the shoulders. It's all coming back to good positions as well as your fitness. And sometimes you, can, you got it, sometimes you don't. That's your recipe for success, presented by Trifecta. Ten women in this third of four heats. Jacqueline Dahlstrom out of Norway will be in lane number six. Currently 12th place overall, and she has two top ten finishes so far in this competition. She's one of those athletes that, again, we talk about skill sets and utilizing the, and maximizing her potential as an athlete. She is one of those athletes that has the ability to do well in these inverted handstand push-ups. As we've seen so far, it's, it's one thing to predict it, it's another thing to do it in person. Caroline Spencer from heat number one still has your top time. Eight minutes, 36.64 seconds as we start with those 25 Echo Bike calories. Big buying at the front, you can see Cara Saunders nice and relaxed, and that's what these 25 cals should look like. You see a lot of athletes get a little amped up. We're in the Coliseum, it's packed to the gills. It's Friday night, this is something all athletes wish to do, but in your 10th year at the CrossFit Games, someone like Cara Saunders knows how to manage the moment. You saw Matilda Garns at the start there really laying into the the bike, and she is already through 15 of those 25 calories. She is by far the leader right now. And Matilda Garns in the right side and the black top is definitely pushing the pace here. And for me, it, that's either a sign of you don't know what you're doing or you do know what you're doing. And if it's the latter, I can't wait to see what's next for Matilda Garns. Garns is done with those 25 calories, and she will be first to the wall for her Opening set of 10 handstand push-ups. Talking to Dan Bailey earlier, and he was saying, it's like, if you get off the bike and take a big break, what was the benefit of doing it that fast that you have to see how these first couple of reps look like? Garns is taking her time getting to the wall. Jacqueline Dahlstrom, Carolyn Brevo, and Paige Semenza will be the next ones to finish. Garns, one of the rookies here. Early says in 14th place overall. And here comes Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Amanda Barnhart. Barnhart at the bottom of your screen getting right to work. They see Dahlstrom can barely even get down to that bottom position. And the idea is probably just trying to get her enough time to just even get one rep. But Amanda Barnhart, one of the stronger overhead that you'll have in the field. And there is Laura Horvath. Look, we know the scouting report on Laura Horvath. It's always been handstand push-ups in any variety other than, say, traditional kipping. The thing is, is like we know it's something she works on. She knows what the challenge is. And this is one of those moments of, okay, wh where can I unlock more potential to get me better at this movement? This might be one of those things that Boz throws out there for the athletes to think about in the offseason. Another do, no rep for Horvath. We got presses. You can do accessory work by strengthening your triceps and shoulders. There is other ways to unlock that potential and get better, and this type of position is. I talked to him during the men's heat. If you go to the CrossFit Journal and just type handstand push-up progression, there's two videos. They're both about 15 minutes long. Never at one time did they have an athlete do a handstand push-up with their back facing the wall. They went to the basics. Body position from a push-up off the floor. Keeping that body position with your feet on the wall. Walking your hands to the wall in an inverted position and doing a handstand push-up from there. It's not a matter of that's the easy way to do it, but that's the best way to teach 
proper body position and mechanics to make a traditional handstand push-up, as far as the games are concerned, easier to do. Emma McQuaid is your leader right now. Next to her is Turi Helgadotter. They were the first two women back to the bike for the second time. Laurel Horvath continues to receive no reps for not hitting depth on the descent on those handstand push-ups. Now Emma McQuaid is done, and she will move back to the wall for her second set of 10. And one of the things we haven't touched on much is that athletes are not touching their head to the floor. Traditionally with deficit handstand push-ups, it's on some blocks, but the head still makes contact with the ground. And that gives you almost a little bit of a, a fulcrum to launch yourself off of. Now you just have to find depth in a dead stop freestanding position it's a lot more challenging than if they were allowed to touch their head to an object at the bottom. Emma McQuaid moving very well here on the second set of 10. And on the women's side, he said the, the head just needs to make it to the white line at the top where the men had to pass below. Emma McQuaid onto the bike for another 15 calories. Turi Helgadotter and Lucy Campbell are in second and third. Now Kara Saunders is working her way back to the wall for her second set of 10. McQuaid's got to get to the 75 rep mark before she can move on. She's the only woman on the bike right now. McQuaid is done. Turi Helgadot are just now getting to the bike for her 15 calories. So Emma McQuaid with 10 handstand push-ups in the final 25 calories to close things out. And there is Sam Briggs, who has trained with Emma McQuaid and earlier was trying to get the crowd behind McQuaid as she was working her way to the bike for the second time. 2013 fittest woman on earth. And a fan favorite here. The McQuaid is through and now has two minutes to catch Caroline Spencer. Turi Helgadotter and Lucy Campbell are still on the bike, and they will move to the handstand -hand push-up wall for the third and final time next. <laughs> the plate is through nine of the final 25 calories here. Turi Helgadotter is back on the wall for the third and final time behind McQuaid. This is all for Caroline in the previous heat. It's really hard to hit the gas when you need to when you're all by yourself. But she's got to do the best she can. The crowd's waiting for it. They're Final call for McQuaid, and she has the new top time. 801.72 seconds for Emma McQuaid. Turi Helgadotter is your leader on the floor right now. She's halfway through her final set of 10. Lucy Campbell sits in third. She is tied with Helgadotter right now. But Helgadotter 
is about a half rep ahead of Lucy Campbell at this point. Helga Dodder taking a break. 12 minute time cap here as Cara Saunders is now to the wall for the final time. Now nine of the ten, Campbell has done the seven, and Carl Saunders has two down. So how difficult that get up portion was for Campbell. She almost did an entire handstand push up, just getting up onto the wall. And you see that failure creeping in. Helga Daughter's done, and she'll get to the bike for 25 calories. It's two minutes and 40 seconds to complete that. There's competition director Adrian Bosman. Way down there to help out Turi Helga daughter. Carolyn Prevo has moved to the handstand push up wall for the final time. And now Lucy Campbell is onto the bike on the bottom of your screen. Amanda Barnhart, she's closing out her second set of 15 calories. Daughter with now 10 calories remaining. Lucy Campbell has now passed Turi Helgadotter. She's through now 20 calories. Lucy Campbell at the bottom of your screen. And that's that frantic pace you want to see from an athlete trying to close this event out. And Lucy Campbell overtakes Turi Helgadotter and comes in in second place in the heat with a time of 10 minutes, 40.04 seconds. Helga Dotter cutting through the final calorie and she is in. Carolyn Prevo and Cara Saunders are your next two athletes on the floor. Cara Saunders is onto the bike for the final time. Less than a minute to knock out 25 calories and she's through five. Seconds to go, 12 calories remain. I don't think people really understand how hard it is to dig that deep on this implement. Three calories left for Carl Saunders. And Saunders is going to make it with 10 seconds to spare. Just getting underneath the time cap in this event is a huge success. One more time. Emma McQuaid at 8.01.72 seconds now has the top time with one heat remaining. As four women finish that event inside the time cap. And Emma McQuaid, that was a impressive performance. Start to finish. And so tough to do that, isolated on your own. As Sam Briggs might have the coolest coaching shirt I've ever seen, Nacho, average coach. And Emma McQuaid, with the crowd behind her, says a new time to beat here Friday night. 801.72 seconds for Emma McQuaid, Lucy Campbell, Turi Helgadotter, and Cara Saunders, the other women to finish that event. Laura Horvath and Matilda Garns both get capped with 84 reps remaining, and they will both finish towards the bottom of this event when it is all said and done. Final heat coming up next.
We started the day at the Capitol. We finish inside the Coliseum at the Alliant Energy Center in Madison, Wisconsin. And we are glad you are with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. Nikki Brazier is down on the competition floor. Overall standings coming into event number seven. Tia Toomey by five points over Mal O'Brien as the youngsters are hanging tough here. Emma Lawson, the 17-year-old rookie, sits in third. Haley Adams and Danielle Brandon rounding out the top five. Sean, let me know if you've heard this phrase before. Constantly varied functional movements executed at high intensity. We're looking at that functional movement out there, folks, based on real-world situational biomechanics which place a high demand on the body's core musculature and innervation. That is the test that we have here. What is CrossFit? You're gonna find out. Back to the basics, baby. Functional mechanics, that's what we wanna see. A press is a press is a press, but we're switching things up. We should see some transferability here. And if you got it or you don't, 10 athletes on the board, we're about to see who has it. 10 women in this fourth and final heat, and overall leader Tia Toomey is back in the familiar leader's jersey, but only clinging to a five-point lead over Mal O'Brien. Tia Toomey starting things off at the Capitol, chipped away at that overall lead, but it was out here at North Park where Tia Toomey was back to doing Tia Toomey things, dominating this event from start to finish. But even with that domination, only three points added to that lead against Mal O'Brien, only leading by five. Well, here we go, 25 calories to start. Now think back to last year, inside the Coliseum, opening night, we had a handstand wall. Mal O'Brien was able to outduel Tia Toomey for her first career win at the CrossFit Games. And with that handstand walk, that is the initial portion of this handstand push-up at that forward-facing position. Mal O'Brien is probably the best female athlete when it comes to wall walks. And so in order to get in that position, that's what she's going to need to lean on to make sure that's not as taxing for her inverted. Mark back to Wednesday night. The parallel bar transfers into the dip, ended up biting Tia at the end of that event. We have a similar pattern here where you have to walk yourself into position before you can start the rep. What are we gonna see? Are we gonna see that wall walk be advantageous to Mal or detrimental to Tia like we saw on Wednesday night? Hand in the air for Mal O'Brien. She is through 20 calories. She's got about a five calorie lead on Tia Toomey. So Toomey is towards the back here on this initial 25 calorie ride. So Mal O'Brien is done. She will move to the wall first. Now, Alexis Raptus is done at the top of your screen. She and O'Brien getting to work at the same time. And here comes Haley Adams and Gabby Magawa. Top in lane one, Raptus in lane one is just repping those out. And Mal O'Brien, that was a tough first rep. You gotta get that forehead into the line. You don't have to pass it, just into it. Raptus made a huge splash in quarterfinals. Here comes Toomey as Raptus has already threw her first set of 10. And nobody panic. This is not the first time we've seen Toomey slowest off the first portion of a bike or a row, and that's on purpose. And Tia Toomey. Has yet to break here on this first set of 10. She has two reps remaining and Toomey got through unbroken. Toomey and Lawson to the bike at the same time. Alexis Raptus on the bottom left is your leader. Lawson's in the gray top towards the top of your screen. And Mal O'Brien is having trouble here. Tia Toomey very slow off the first bike on purpose. We've seen this before. Raptus is still your leader. She's almost done with her 15 calorie ride. Now she is done. She's heading to the wall. 
for her second set of 10 handstand push-ups. And Raptus has gotten right to work. Now Mal O'Brien is on the bike. Raptus has six reps remaining on her set of 10. She's on the upper left hand part of your screen, just got hit with a no rep for not meeting depth. Hand in the air for Tia Toomey. There's Raptus. And you think of an air squat. You don't squat to a med ball when you're showing virtuosity in the movement. You know where depth is and you can bounce out of that bottom position. For Raptus, she needs to feel that bottom position instead of search for the bottom position. That'll help her out a lot. Raptus is on the bike in the upper left-hand part of your screen. Second set of 15. Tia Toomey and Emma Lawson are to the wall for the second time. Toomey went unbroken on her last set. Here comes Mal O'Brien. And Toomey looking to go unbroken yet again as Alexis Raptus is just shaking out her arms, not even using them on the echo bike. Savvy move, no need. The bike portion at this moment in the event is basically irrelevant if you can handle the handstand push-ups like Raptus has. Toomey back to the bike. Tia's bike pace has increased every time she's gotten to the bike. Slowest off round one, faster round two, and pushing the pace a little bit here in round three. Raptus back to the wall, bottom left-hand part of your screen, final 10 reps on the handstand push-ups for her. Toomey's now through four of those 15 calories. Raptus more confident than she was previously. When I say get to the bottom, not search for it. When you're searching for it, you start to slow down. You don't get enough little stretch reflex at the bottom part of that press. She's moving a lot faster than she did on that second set. Raptus now with a no rep. Her judge explaining it to her. Raptus right back to work. Emma Lassa on the right side of the black pants is to the bike for the second set of 15. And Tia Toomey is set to close out her round of 15 on the bike. And Raptus is done, and Raptus will go back for the final 25 calories here. 801.72 seconds is the time to beat. Belongs to Emma McQuaid, but maybe not for much longer. Now here comes Tia Toomey to the wall for her final set of 10. It's not a lot of times you get an opportunity to win an event at the CrossFit Games. There's been less opportunities to win an event at the CrossFit Games by being that athlete to the right of your screen. One hundred ten. That's the mark the Raptors has got to get to. She's through now. Fourteen of those twenty-five calories. Tia Toomey went unbroken on her first two sets of ten. Toomey is done. Raptus with three calories remaining. Alexis Raptus, the rookie for the second straight year, outdueling Tia Toomey under the lights. 641.18 for Raptus, 100 points for her. Now Tia Toomey is trying to put a little more breathing room between herself and Emma Lawson and Mal O'Brien. Lawson is on to her final set of handstand push-ups. Toomey is through seven of her 25 calories, now eight. Second best time is Emma McQuaid right now, 801.72 seconds. So Toomey can still add 97 points to her total if she can get in inside that time. And what's good for her is Mal O'Brien is on the bike behind her. She still has 10 handstand push-ups to go, so this is a great opportunity for Tia to extend that lead. Tia Toomey's family on the left, the first time they have all been here to watch her compete in person. Final calories for Tia Toomey. Second place and 97 more points. And embracing her family across the finish line. Now we have to see what Emma Lawson is able to do. Lawson is still on her final set of handstand push-ups. 
Emma McQuaid is going to lock up third place in the event. Next best time, Caroline Spencer at 836.64. That would be good for fourth. No rep for Emma Lawson. She still has two remaining. Mal O'Brien is back to the wall for the final time as well. O'Brien is through four of her final ten reps. Now Lawson onto the plate. That's great for Lawson in the position she was. And look for her is just, I mean, we thought just getting in the top ten was great for a rookie. We saw that with Mal O'Brien last year, getting seventh, eighth overall. For Emma Lawson, she's knocking on the door of holding on to a podium position. I mean, if you're not excited about the future of the women's division, I do not know what to tell you at this point. Ariel Lowen is on to the Echo Bike as well. Lowen is now through three of those 25 calories, and she is creeping up on Emma Lawson. She's within three right now. Lowen is closing the gap. Lawson is through 16. Lowen is through 13. And Brooke Wells is on the bike as well. Emma Lawson across the finish line. So she holds off Ariel Lowe and 943.37 is going to be good for ninth in the event. Huge for Lawson, who needs to get closer to Mal O'Brien. There's also a battle between fourth and fifth as Lowen's trying to close out. Lowen's sitting at seventh overall. And now she is in. Haley Lowen, 1004.54. Haley Adams is trying to get away from Danielle Brandon. That's a race for the top five. She's only separated by six points. There's Brooke Wells, who has 13, now 12 calories left. She's the only woman on the bike for the final time. Now Mal O'Brien hops on. And this is great for Mal O'Brien, or for Emma Lawson is if more athletes can sneak between her and Mal O'Brien as Mal's getting to the bike, as he said. Mal's got to do everything she can to close that gap. Brooke Wells is across. We saw Matt Fraser cheering on Mal O'Brien. Mal O'Brien had a 21-point lead on Emma Lawson coming into this event. If you look at the top 10, that's about seven places on the leaderboard. O'Brien and O'Connell are on the screen. O'Brien's at the top, O'Connell's at the bottom, and there's Fraser. O'Connell is through 21 over 25 calories. He's going to hop off soon. O'Brien, her judge's hand is in the air. Haley Adams is to the bike as well. That's good for Haley to try to keep herself in the top five. O'Brien is done, and she is across. Tia Toomey cheering on Chrissy O'Connell. Now O'Connell is done. So O'Brien's going to take 15th in the event. Now O'Brien got past O'Connell. And talk about working on a weakness. Impressive bike at the end for O'Brien. Now Haley Adams, she's still in a position of knocking on the door for the podium, but she again, she has to get away from Daniel Brandon, who's six points behind her. Daniel Brandon is still stuck on the wall for the last set of handstand push-ups. Haley Adams not going to be able to make it, but a great effort from her. Alexis Raptus is going to win the event. Her first career event win as an individual at the CrossFit Games. Tia Toomey will finish in second, and she will widen her lead over Mal O'Brien by 39 points unofficially. We've seen in years past going into Saturday, that number looked like 239 points. So Medeiros, Medeiros has gotten closer to Garrard, dropped that to 25. Tia has extended that lead to 30 plus unofficially. But Alex Raptis. Coming out hot from the beginning. Tia, that slow start on purpose in the front. But for Raptis, what's huge for her is that Listen, she had a great early campaign of qualifying, but it's a big 
stage here at the CrossFit Games and to get a win and solidifying a top 10 place going into the Saturday competition, huge for Raptus. 641.18 seconds. Beats Toomey by more than a minute. Emma McQuaid's top time will slide down for third place overall. Caroline Spencer, who set that time in heat number one, finishes fourth. As Danny Spiegel taking fifth. Let's go down to Nikki Brazier with Alexis Raptus. Alexis, this was such a unique twist on a basic movement, the press, and you seem to handle it like a pro, like you've done this a million times before. How did you approach it? Um, I love handstand push-ups, so I just went into it knowing that I could handle it however it went. And um, if I got a no rep, just shake it off and come down and then get right back up. We saw a really great combination of power on the bike and gymnastics. How do you balance those two in your training? Um, I mean, the gymnastics side of it is my favorite part. And so the bike, I just tried to relax my arms as much as I could. and. Uh, push it, but not redline it until the last bike. And when you're in the final heat of women and you know you've got the reigning and defending champ right behind you, how motivating is it for you to keep going? Uh, it's so motivating. I mean, also the people here screaming, yeah. Has, yeah. it helps so much. So thank you guys. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alexis Raptor's first career event win as an individual here at the CrossFit Games. Overall standings going into the final two days. Tia Toomey now with a 44-point lead over Mal O'Brien. Emma Lawson is only three points back. That's going to be a great battle to watch over the next two days. And Haley Adams only 45 back. On the men's side, Ricky Garrard at 681, followed by Justin Medeiros. Roman Krennikov sitting there in third place, and Jeffrey Adler needs to get some work done over the next couple of days if he wants to have a chance of getting inside the top three. Fantastic crowd here in Madison, and it's only Friday on what was a memorable day. Tia Toomey, back where we're used to seeing her, but it is much closer. Thanks so much, everybody, for spending the day with us. We really appreciate it. For Chase Ingram, Nikki Brazier, Mike Arsenault, I'm Sean Woodland. Thanks so much. We will see you tomorrow. At it. We're going to get you there. Great job. And we're going to start with these ring rows. Nutrition has become more in the forefront of my preparation and getting ready for the CrossFit Games. Trifecta makes my life easier by taking the guesswork out. I think at the Games there's a lot of things that are thrown at us. Having your nutrition dialed in gives you peace of mind. It's something that you don't have to think about. Trifecta is a great tool to help people chase their goals. My goal is to win the CrossFit Games. 
Landing Surface Co. as the official flooring provider of the Wadapalooza was an absolute game changer this year. The most important thing was creating a safe playing surface and Surface Co.'s force mitigation and force absorption characteristics provided just that. Its interlocking ability made install a breeze, but also kept all of our flooring in the exact same location from the start of the weekend to the end. It looked awesome. After experiencing Surface Co. this year, we'll never go back. Whether your goal is to chase records, write history, or become the best version of yourself, the intention put into the process is the same. To push your body to give its best every single day. For your body to give you what you want, you have to give it what it needs. Consistency you apply in every detail around your training is key. It allows you to perform one more rep in the last second. It's that rep that makes all the difference to make you better tomorrow. has brought tools into the equation for us, which allows for us to do exactly that, to give our athletes more, to give them something new to learn. It's easy to make it more fun because you just get to do that, just to be yourself and coach and have a blast. I do feel like CAP has made me a better coach and affiliate owner. It has allowed us to streamline uh, how we do lesson planning and gives us more tools in the toolbox to better our coaches and myself.
Day three has come to a close as we are past the halfway point here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games. Welcome to our day at the games post game wrap presented by the U.S. Army. I'm Tommy Marquez joined by Adrian Conway and Adrian we just saw individual event seven wrap up the day. What stood out to you? What stood out to me was new event, new standards, new problems. It's crazy how you see a movement that can so commonly be mastered, put a little tweak on it, and it completely shifts what we would assume would be the guaranteed standings. Yeah, and at the end of that event, we got a nice little bike race at the end, and it was good enough for our Monster Hydro hard charging moment of the day. Yeah, this is going to go to Tim Full Send Paulson. <laughs> where we talked about him having a couple speeds, and the truth is that I think both speeds are full and send, and we really love this in our community. Yeah, Tim only has two speeds, on and off, and that was an epic moment. The crowd going nuts. You can see him just pouring it all in in a tremendous performance from Tim Paulson to close out his third day of competition. Always great to see him get underneath the time cap. And there's been some tremendous calls throughout the day. But in team event number five, Mayhem threw down the gauntlet. And the dulcet tones of Joel Gaudet, our play-by-play -play commentator, bring you the broadcast call of the day. No team has finished yet. Not a single one for three heats. And with four and a half minutes to go, CrossFit Mayhem Freedom is absolutely reannouncing their presence here. You wanted Mayhem Freedom, you got Mayhem Freedom. The bear is poked, Froning is back, and an absolute statement from the four from Cookville, Tennessee. Walk to the finish line. It's yours. Stroll right across that line, boys and girls. Oh, what a statement. I think it's safe to say that Mayhem wasn't happy taking the floor in a colored jersey other than white. No, no, and, and what Joel said there, you poked the bear, <laughs> and he's here, and now he's awake. I, I think about seizing the moment like that with making that type of call like Joel did. It just literally fires me up to hear his voice, to watch it unfold. It makes me want to go flip a pig, man. Oh, man, it was an epic moment. We had tons of epic moments across the Masters divisions as they took part in two events today on Friday, but we're going to send it over for one moment that stood tall above them all, going over to Caleb Banfield. Thanks, Tommy. I'm with Nunu Costa, who is a 10 times CrossFit Games athlete. Nunu, what's your top Masters moment of the day? Yeah, so I had the pleasure of watching Jen Ryan compete this morning for CrossFit Invictus, and uh, she took first place in the Parallel Elizabeth. And uh, she was a team, um, teammate of mine in 2017 on CrossFit Invictus team. And uh, to watch her attack the workout was just amazing. It was heavy. the cleans followed by the Parallel Traverse and uh, the 21, 15, and 9, 7, 5, 3. It wasn't just a pleasure to watch, but is how she spoke about how she attacked the workout. Her goal this year was to not have any fear going into workouts and really just like go for it. And she like attacked us, she went into the workout first, she took first, and then like you could just see the confidence exuberating out of her. So it was just awesome to see her this, to this morning. Attitude really matters. Thanks for your time, Nunu. Back to you, Tommy. Thanks, Kayla. Taking a look at your overall standings for the team after a full day of workouts on Friday. And surprise, surprise, your overall leaders going into the weekend. Once again, CrossFit Mayhem Freedom. Oslo Navy Blue moves back into second. They're jockeying for that runner-up spot behind CrossFit Invictus and then Mayhem Independence and CrossFit Reykjavik round out the top five. But after a dominant performance from Mayhem Freedom, they caught up with Jamie Hagia. Oh, shut up. You were briefed on this event this morning when they announced that the Hanson pushes would be wall facing, strict deficit, and a Hanson hold during that row. What were your initial thoughts? I mean, yeah, confusion. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone was surprised, but it uh, turns out pretty well for us. Uh, it was a nice workout, actually, even if the Hanson suck a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. The rowing is something we're not typically used to seeing. How is that different being on slides versus a static rower? Uh, we both kind of had to change our cadences to match each other, so that was a little weird. Uh, basically, we just gripped it and ripped it. In such a close race, does that change your strategy at all when you see how tight of a race it is between the other teams? Yeah, absolutely. You just think, man, I can't mess up. <laughs> There's no room for error. No room for error. 
And Rich, a perfect day, 200 points, two event wins. We saw how pumped you guys were crossing that line. What does that say about this team? Oh, this team's awesome. It's fun. Um, they all like to hurt and they all like to win. So what more could you want? Congratulations. Man, what an amazing performance from Mayhem, closing with another event win and then back-to-back -back event wins to close this day. Seems like they've found their rhythm. They found the rhythm and they found a groove with how the programming is coming together. We saw a lot of non-traditional tests where you're testing strength, then you're testing endurance perhaps, and today was all CrossFit. Mixed mold, couplets, triplets, and Mayhem thrives in exactly those types of events. And I'll be honest, Tommy, I think what we can expect for the next day and a half is a lot of more of the same. Not gonna lie, it just looks like things are kind of back in order with them in the, the red shorts and the white tops. They, they just fit the leader's jerseys oh so well. Switching gears now to the men's division and your overall standings after seven events. And Ricky Gourard is still on top, but things have tightened up a bit. Medeiros, Krenikov in the second and third position. And then the two Canadians, Jeffrey Adler and Patrick Vellner, holding it down for the top five. Saxon Panchik and Samuel Quant have made a nice charge up here on day number three. But Adrian, man, the points race for that top spot overall got a lot more interesting after that last event. A lot more interesting. If you are on site, if you're following on YouTube or wherever you're watching, you're getting your money's worth, right? I, I think about how the, the gap has closed. We've got 25 points now between second and first and only 21 between third and second. And there's a bit of a cushion. How tight this race is is going to make me even more excited as workouts can, or, or events specifically continue to get announced because it's anyone's game at this point. I think this is the race everyone was hoping to see heading into the weekend. Moving over to the women's competition now in your overall standings after seven events. Tia Claire Toomey is back in front. She made a hard charge on the three scored events today. Mallory O'Brien still clinging to a second place position, just three points ahead of Emma Lawson, but some distance separating between Lawson in third and Haley Adams in fourth. Your big story for today has to be Tia Toomey chart. Tia Toomey back on top, back where we expected her to be all along. And more importantly, she's doing it with a swagger. She said she's here for a fight and a fight is what she's getting. And it's from the next gen, Tommy. This is what has really provoked my thought and wonderment for the future is that they're not waiting their turn. They're pushing all the way through to the front and they're giving Tia all she wants for that title. Amazing uh, fight between the present and the future in the women's division. Switching over to the masters division now on the men's side of things, our top story from today coming from the 65 plus. Kyle Sherrington, 65 plus. This is one of those things that just inspires me all around. It doesn't even matter what the workout is. I'm watching those guys in the back and I'm like, goals, right? I think about that's what I want to be when I grow up one day. And what happened today with him going first and first is a pure statement because the test was completely diverse between the two events that took place. Ton of momentum going into Saturday, but over on the women's division, your top story, 45 to 49 again, but this time it's Allie Crawford. Yeah, Allie Crawford also handling business, going third, going first, and making sure that she's putting a statement out there that her fitness isn't something that's specialty based. It wasn't because of luck of the draw on the previous day. It's because she's been training and putting in the work to do so, which has got her sitting in first place. Yeah, tremendous performance from Crawford with one more day of competition remaining for these age groups. But switching to the teenage division and the top story after today, there is a close race developing in the 16 to 17 division. Three spots, Caleb McClure, Elijah, and also Ty Jenkins are sitting there. It's only 20 points that separate first to third. We know we've got a handful of events left. It's anyone's race. I can't wait to watch them throw down. Man, and with the age groups, remember 10 points are the difference between each placing. So it's even more close than it appears on the leaderboard. Switching gears to the adaptive divisions now and your overall leaders across every division heading into the final day of competition. Casey Ackrey, Valerie Cohen, we've talked about them all weekend long. Rogan Dean back on top. Morgan Johnson, we spoke early about her and her performance overall, but what really stands out to you for the top story from these adaptive divisions? Well, we've got Charles Pinar in the lower extremity division, went first and fourth today, and that has established essentially a 30-point lead going into the final day of competition. And it's gonna be close, but with that kind of momentum, it puts you in a place as an athlete where you think all I've gotta do is keep doing exactly what I have been. Yeah, we saw the points race for the men's division 
tighten up just a little bit after that last event and the charge made by Justin Medeiros. I know it's your Arosti recovery of the day. It is the recovery of the day. It goes to Mr. Maderos, who is closing that gap, and he did so by making moves in event six a day, where it was about the steadiness of his race. And what he put us on notice with was literally out lunging Mr. Ricky Garrard in the finish. One step at a time, he held him in that bar in the front rack position that looked almost flawless as he finished just ahead to close that gap. We're going to wrap things up here in just a moment, but before we do, we want to say thanks to the U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Discover the career for you and opportunities you never knew existed within the U.S. Army. Visit GoArmy.com forward slash CFG. We're going to get you caught up on what's in store for all of these athletes on Saturday as we kick the weekend off. Teams will start things, and then over on the age groups and adaptives, they'll be going from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. as we crown the fittest on earth in those divisions, and we'll close things out on Saturday night with the individuals. Thanks for joining us here at Day at the Games, presented by the U.S. Army. Man, we still have two days of competition left to go. We're going to wrap things up here. For Adrian Conway, I'm Tommy Marquez. We'll see you tomorrow bright and early as we kick off the weekend here at the 2022 Noble CrossFit Games.